Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I thank Senators. Before I make a statement, I'll call the clerk. Are there any documents to be tabled? I table documents pursuant to statute and return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll make a brief statement. Senators, unfortunately, I have to once again inform the Senate of revised arrangements for the Chamber and Parliament House due to the COVID-19 outbreaks across the country. The Speaker is making a similar statement to the House. As Senators would be aware, the Speaker and I issued a statement last Monday on temporary changes to building operations at Parliament House based on the COVID-19 situations in Queensland and New South Wales, travel restrictions and designated hotspot areas. I will not restate all the details but these are significant changes to the operation of parliament and requirements of those in the building, and I appreciate the understanding of senators and staff in implementing and respecting these. I urge all senators and staff to constantly refresh themselves with the measures we have instituted. They have been imposed for the safety of all, the ACT where we meet and our home communities when we return. They are designed to allow the parliament to meet and fulfil our essential role, but to do so safely. They also represent the first time we had gone substantially over and above the general requirements in place in the ACT. In particular, with the Delta variant of COVID-19 in the community, the use of masks is particularly important. Building occupants, including senators, should wear masks in all common areas and wherever else possible when doing so does not directly impede their work. I would also like to remind senators that to reduce the risk of the transmission of COVID-19, everyone is also requested to maintain appropriate hand and respiratory hygiene, minimise gatherings with other building occupants and ensure physical distancing is maintained throughout the building. In particular, all senators and staff must abide by ACT health directions. If any building occupant has spent time in a nominated Queensland local government area on or after 21 July, you must have isolated it until receiving a negative test and follow the ACT stay-at-home directions, including relating to mask wearing, work and movement. Physical distancing requirements in the chamber and other meeting rooms are again in place. Finally, I cannot stress enough how important it is that with the COVID-19 situation evolving so rapidly around Australia, those who have travelled here need to regularly check the exposure locations from their home jurisdictions or any areas you have been in at least over the last 14 days. Senators and staff will be informed of any change regarding arrangements at Parliament House and the Department of Parliamentary Services will continue to provide regular updates regarding appropriate health measures via information circulators. I thank senators for their understanding and I particularly thank Commonwealth and ACT health officials who we have worked very closely with over the last few weeks to bring this parliament together. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to inform the Senate of temporary arrangements for the Australian Greens this week. L leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, I inform the Chamber that this week I will represent the Australian Greens as acting whip and acting leader of business. Thank you, Senator McKim. There being nothing else, I will call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Tertiary Educa Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and an associated bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pratt. President, the legislation before the parliament today, Texas charges cost recovery bills, is legislation that the Labor Party does not support. 
This bill seeks to establish a new charge to recover the costs of Texas regulatory activities for higher education providers, moving Texas operations from partial to full cost recovery. As we have seen in this chamber, there have been a concerning number of laws passed through this place where the government leaves out considerable detail. And in this case, considerable detail of how the cost recovery framework will operate out of the actual legislation. This avoids the transparency that should be required uh, of governments. It avoids proper transparency and accountability and buries the detail of these charges in regulations. So in principle, Labor opposes this bill because now is not the appropriate time to move to full cost recovery for higher education providers. Providers who have been forced to bear the brunt of the COVID pandemic, and for most of them, and for the most part, without any government assistance at all. We found, that is Labor senators, that during the most uh, uh, recent round of estimates, we found that the agency has not done any modelling, any modelling on the impacts this shift will have on individual providers. For small to medium providers who have been heavily impacted by lockdowns, the lack of international students, increasing levies by up to 700 per cent. 700 per cent. And this represents an existential threat to these providers. That is a threat to their very existence and survival as businesses. This is not good enough. But it is just another in the laundry list of examples where Prime Minister Morrison and his government have attacked Australia's world-class higher education providers. Providers in our nation that have been crying out for assistance when they need it most. They've sought assistance from the government. They've received none. They've been abandoned. <clears throat> and now we see this legislation before us. Prime Minister Morrison's budget had not a dollar extra for Australia's universities. Instead, our universities got a big cut. Real funding for higher education will fall by some 10 per cent over the next three years. This is not uh, something our nation can afford. The budget papers confirmed that because of the Job Ready Graduates package, Commonwealth funding for universities will be lower and student debt levels will rise. All of this is taking place at a time when tens of thousands of Australian students started university this year facing fee hikes, with many having had their fees doubled. They've had their fees doubled, many of them, and many of them were offered places and accepted those places before the fee changes came into place. This is manifestly unfair. All of this at a time when our universities have faced revenue losses of around $3 billion, $3 billion in revenue. Um, because of uh, international student losses, etc., the Australian economy has lost some $9 billion uh, from decreased international student revenue. These impacts are profound right across our education sector, and yet the government has chosen not to help universities but to attack them yet again. This government, the Morrison government, changed the JobKeeper rules 
some three times, three times, so that they could make sure that universities could not get support. Right in the middle of the universities crisis, the government cut support, support that was meant to keep Australia's world-class research alive. And then in the 2020 budget, the government provided a billion dollars to partly cover the impact of falling international student revenue. But this year, the government cut that funding, despite the fact that the federal government has mismanaged the vaccine rollout. Our country still has no idea when international students will be able to safely return. No idea of when international students will be able to enrol again at Australian institutions, nor, frankly, any idea of where our international standing will be placed relative to other jurisdictions which international students will have started uh, to go to instead of Australia. As a result of all of this incompetence coming from this government, 17,000 Australians have lost their jobs, jobs that are needed to educate Australians in critical areas that we need in the future. So why does this government feel now's the time to levy further fees on our universities? We're talking about academics and tutors who've lost their jobs, but many other workers too, admin staff and everyone who keeps the university up and running. All of these people, all of these Australians, have bills to pay, mortgages, families, etc. Why has Mr Morrison stood by? Why is he happy to see these tens of thousands of livelihoods destroyed? If he really cared about keeping Australian jobs, he would be helping universities, not hurting them. Why does he not think that these Australian families deserve support? This budget provided no meaningful assistance for public universities and instead it has seen a 10 per cent real funding cut over the coming years, an emergency funding to keep researchers in their jobs was cut off, cut off while the crisis was and is very far from over. But I guess what else can we expect, can Australians expect from this out of touch and in crisis government? A government who thinks a university is good enough for their kids but not for yours. Not for the tens, hundreds of thousands of Australians who would like a place in Australian universities. A government happy to sign students in every electorate across the country into a lifetime of big debt. During the last parliamentary sitting period, the budget papers confirmed for the first time what the government has refused to admit, that this government, the Liberal government, is saving money by hijacking up fees. So here on this side of the chamber, that in the Labor Party, we do not want Australia to be like America, where Australian young people have to have a lifetime of debt in order to get an education. This is not the future that Australians deserve. Currently in our nation, we are talking about our children, our young people, graduating university with debts of around $60,000 just for a basic degree, all at the same time as they're trying to find work, save a deposit for a house or even start a family. Shame on this government. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And I believe uh, we have Senator Faruqi by remote. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
I speak to the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Tech Surcharges Bill 2021 and Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021. And I'll state at the outset that the Greens will not be supporting these bills that impose yet another charge on higher education providers. Since the coalition has been in power, they've been on a relentless mission and attack the higher education sector. The bills establish a new charge to make registered higher education providers bear the costs of Texas sector risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities. And these include concern management and resolution, stakeholder communications and engagement, risk assessment, inquiries, business support, and guidance notes. These activities do not currently attract a charge, and they should not attract a charge. TEXA has an important oversight role when it comes to monitoring the higher education sector and should absolutely be fully funded to perform its vital functions. But this funding should continue to come from the Commonwealth. The two proposed bills represent a really worrying continuation in this government's larger pattern of defunding the higher education sector and then shifting the costs of providing higher education away from the Commonwealth. Education is a public good, and it should be fully publicly funded. Universities and other higher education providers are still reeling from not just round after round of funding cuts, but also the huge impact the pandemic has had on the sector. The government refused to help the struggling higher education sector, deliberately changing the JobKeeper rules three times to exclude universities and denying them any further form of substantial support. And this has led to tens of thousands of university staff losing their jobs. And on top of that, they pushed through with their so-called job ready graduates legislation, which has condemned students, young people to decades of debt. And it has also condemned universities to less funding. It has condemned researchers to go without. This is what we, it has condemned people to exactly the opposite of what we need at the moment, which is to fully fund our universities and to look after and care for our young people, our academic staff and researchers. Shifting costs of Texas monitoring and regulatory functions to higher education providers is not only wrong in principle, it also overburdens a sector already in strife on so many fronts. And this is part of an ongoing pattern of Commonwealth shirking its responsibility to fund the delivery and administration of higher education. This is clearly the kind of self-defeating public policy that we should all be voting against. Shifting more costs to higher education providers has another worrying consequence because the charges will impact the quality of education that students receive. And this has been raised time and again by student groups who have provided submissions to other cost and charges bills. As the University of St Sydney stated in their submission to these charges and cost recovery proposals, and I quote, every dollar that Australia's public universities and other not-for-profit higher education providers must spend on regulation and compliance is a dollar that they cannot invest directly in their core education or research activities. It is our collective responsibility to fight back against every bit of funding taken away from higher education. And we should not stop at that, but also build a movement for free TAFE and university that would make higher education accessible to all without the heavy burden of years of debt. If the liberals have their way, universities will be funded only to the extent they are able to contribute to the profit-driven economy that benefits the elite, the billionaires and the corporations and contributes to obscene accumulation of wealth by the few. Although the Liberals being hell-bent on bleeding the higher education sector to death does not surprise me, it saddens me to say that both the Labour and Liberal parties have treated universities and TAFE, TAFEs as piggy banks that can be used at the whim to draw funds away. Pro-market neoliberal policies have treated universities and TAFEs as corporations and not as the social institutions they are that contribute immensely to our society. It is clearly impossible 
to defend public education without a fundamental break from this problematic view. It is a nice surprise today to see that Labour will not be supporting these bills that impose yet another levy on a sector that is already reeling from the pandemic and many other funding cuts. The Greens want to make university and TAFE fully funded and free for all. We have a vision for universities and TAFEs to be spaces of learning and creativity that serve a central role in communities across the country as forces of good. I will be asking my um, colleague, Senator Nick McKim, to move a second reading amendment, calling on the Morrison government to fully publicly fund higher education. Because what we should be looking at is how we can guarantee lifelong learning to all Australians in these challenging times. And that means free higher education for all, increasing funding per student so staff can provide the best learning and teaching environment, supporting students by guaranteeing livable income for each and every one, and providing job security to academics, researchers, and staff. Yet, sadly, here we are with the Liberals cutting much needed funds from universities at a time of such uncertainty where we are just emerging or I would say we're not even emerging at this point. I'm in New South Wales and peoples are suffering from the global pandemic. The nature and millions of others across Australia are suffering as well. The nature of work is changing and the future of many jobs is precarious at best. And at this time to cut further funding from higher education is truly disgraceful. The Greens will oppose these bills and as I said earlier, my colleague, Senator McKim, will be moving a second reading amendment, which highlights this worrying pattern of defunding higher education and reaffirming it as a public good, which should be publicly funded. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator McKim, you'll move that when you speak. Thank you. Um, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Treasury Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Cost Recovery Bill 2021. These bills they represent a, a minor but nonetheless important change to the system which regulates education providers. They, they give effect to the government's decision uh, to implement increased cost recovery for TEXA announced in the 2018-19 budget. Understandably, they've been delayed uh, uh, the, the, we've delayed the introduction of increased cost recovery on several occasions uh, due to external factors such as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, but at the moment, uh, TEXA cost recovery levels are very low, at around 15 per cent of the total costs that are borne ultimately by the taxpayer. The taxpayer uh, bears the burden of funding the vast majority of these regulatory activities, those activities which enable providers to operate in the Australian marketplace and they deliver uh, value to students. Recovering a greater level of uh, the true costs will involve increasing Texas application-based fees. This increase will enable, be enabled by new fees determination uh, to be issued by Texa. It will also mean introducing a new annual charge uh, on higher education providers to recover the costs of risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities. The new annual charge will be the subject of these bills. With the passage of these bills, the regulator will seek uh, stakeholder feedback on draft uh, cost recovery implementation statement, uh, consisting with existing Commonwealth practices. Very important. Any costs with these uh, will, will be phased in over a period of three years to help mitigate, importantly, the impact uh, to providers. So, firstly, with regards to the charges bill, the, the, this bill will enable a new annual charge to be collected from registered higher education providers to recover the cost of Texas risk monitoring, compliance monitoring and investigations, compliant uh, management, stakeholder engagement and other regulatory oversight activities. These costs are not uh, currently covered and are borne by the taxpayer. The annual charge will be phased in over three years, commencing on 1 January 2022. 20 uh, per cent of the related costs will be recovered in 2022 and 50 per cent in 2023 and 100 per cent by the time we get to 2024. 
The amount of the annual charge will be prescribed by the regulations setting out the formula for charge uh, to be made by the Governor-General through the Executive Council. Uh, now to the Cost Recovery Bill. Uh, this bill will amend the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency Act 2021 to enable TEXA to levy the annual charge created by the Charges Bill. The amendments will require a higher education provider to pay the annual charge as and when it falls due, including any penalties for late payment. And failure uh, uh, by a higher education provider to pay the charge will constitute a breach of its conditions of registration. As I said at the outset, in the grand scheme of things, the, the changes that are made in this bill are, are relatively minor, uh, but they are reasonable changes uh, to the regulatory framework around education. And I'm proud to be a part of a government that uh, is interested in making sure that we deal with the uh, minor things just as we are uh, focused on dealing with uh, major impacts. We have a strong uh, record on education at all levels. At all levels. Every Australian, I'm proud to say, and we all should be proud, uh, every Australian has a quality of access of education, whatever the level, whether uh, whatever their age or their ability. And our plan for education delivers for everybody, for every Australian. Our guaranteed funding commitment invests $315 billion in schools over the next decade to 2029. This increases average funding per student by 60 per cent over the decade. We have replaced Labor's multiple secret funding deals with a single needs-based national model of schools funding. Australian government funding for schools is now based on students' needs. Very important. Very important. Our agreement is fair and it provides, importantly, certainty. No matter where a student goes to school, they will get the funding and support that they need for the very best possible education. We are ensuring that our record funding commitment gets better results for Australian students, parents and teachers. We are backing the implementation of NAPLAN uh, to ensure parents and teachers get transparency on student progress. We are improving teacher quality by testing trainee teachers to ensure that they are in the top 30 per cent for literacy and numeracy before they can teach. Now, our government is also committed to uh, National Centre of Excellence and research for teaching. We have also secured the agreement of states and territories to work with us to improve results, and we have to see improved results. We have a lot of work to do in this regard. There is some serious work to do on the curriculum, and I have been quite vocal about that in recent months, but I am confident that we will get there. We will get there. The Morrison government is also backing parents who choose the school that best meets the needs of their child, including Catholic and independent schools. We back choice as a government as far as parents considering where they will send their children for their education. In total, an extra $4.8 billion of funding will be available to non-government schools over the next decade. Parents need to be able to decide on what is best for their own children, and we are empowering them to do that. This extra funding is not at the expense of government schools. From 2017 to 2029, Australian government funding for government schools will increase by 72.1 per cent per student on average. Non-government schools, non schools will increase by 53 per cent per student on average. Secure long-term funding is being provided for all students, all students based on need. We have also committed to the National Schools Chaplaincy Program on a permanent basis. And we hear from schools and school communities across the country just how important and vital this service is uh, in, in providing that support to students. Uh, and there will be a particular new focus on an anti-bullying program through that. This means that school chaplains can provide pastoral care, run programs like breakfast clubs and coordinate volunteer activities for over 3,000 schools. School chaplains will also be trained to combat cyberbullying so that they can better identify and support students who may be victims. This is important work, and we certainly value the role that chaplains play. We know the positive impact that they have on kids, and we're backing them as they do that important work. Now, after school, I went on to complete 
a trade in electronic servicing. And I know how valuable that was for me. That skill of troubleshooting a problem is a skill that uh, I apply even here in this job here today. That skill of going back to the very root of where an issue is is something that I've actually been able to carry right through my entire career. And there are no doubt uh, all of us bring into this place uh, experiences that we took and learned and gained uh, right at the very beginning of our career. And so, uh, I'm quite passionate about apprenticeships and seeing them uh, continue to be a great pathway for students as they embark on their careers. And this is why I'm proud of, to be part of this government that is committed to seeing 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships uh, with a 50 per cent wage subsidy for businesses who employ them. Now, this is fantastic. This is in addition to the 180,000 existing apprenticeships, apprenticeships and trainees that are already being protected. Now, the new job trainer fund. Now, this will create up to 320,000 free or low-cost training places for school leavers and job seekers. And we're supporting young Australians into work as well. We are supporting young Australians into work. The job maker hiring credit will encourage businesses to hire young Australians. This credit will be payable for up to 12 months and immediately available to employers who hire those on JobSeeker aged 16 to 35. It will be paid at a rate of $200 per week for those aged under 30 and $100 per week for those aged between 30 and 35. New hires must work for at least 20 hours uh, per week to be eligible. Uh, Treasury estimates that this will support, this will support 450,000 jobs for young people. The Youth Jobs Path Program, a great program, uh, further uh, pr further supports 15 to 24-year-olds uh, job seekers uh, that move from welfare into work, providing them with the necessary experience that they need to be able to progress through their careers. More than 110,000 young people have participated in at least one element of the Youth Jobs Path program, with 68,000, importantly, taking up a job placement. We're also backing those heading to university under the Job Ready Graduates Program of reforms to higher education. Government funding, university funding of $18 billion in 2020 will grow to $20 billion by 2024, a package that will create up to 30,000 new university places and 50,000 new short course places by 2021 and provide additional support for students in regional and remote Australia. Further, in uh, 2021, an additional $1 billion has been allocated to support the vital research activities of Australia's universities. Uh, record funding in education. This is something that uh, I am very proud of uh, as a coalition senator here in this place, uh, seeing the budget, seeing what the government has committed in this area, a commitment to education. It's the only way that we're going to be able to provide the very best opportunities for individuals, but importantly, collectively as a nation. If we are going to compete on a global scale, we need to have the very best opportunities the very best opportunities uh, for education, and that's what this government is committed to doing and providing that. Uh, an additional $1 billion has been allocated also to support vital research activities in universities. And we can be proud of the, the, the quality of the research that's occurring in our universities. I've spent time over this uh, recess uh, from being here uh, going and, and, and seeing uh, some of the work that's been done in our universities in Western Australia the, through the Cooperative Research Centre in uh, battery technology, in, uh, in new energies, uh, hydrogen. Uh, uh, th these are fantastic opportunities that, that exist. And that I'll tell you, as Australians, we can be very proud of the groundbreaking research that has been undertaken uh, in our universities uh, across this cooperative uh, setting where we've got industry working together with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the research institutions. Uh, and this cooperative uh, model is, is ensuring that we're able to get uh, that research in action. We're able to see uh, progress through to action and investment on the ground where we've got opportunities to uh, 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 you know, delve into new areas of development, to move into new 
uh, uh, possibilities for, for the energy space, for batteries, uh, in creating uh, new opportunities for energy that that, of course, will create. Uh, we, are, uh, we do, and I'm very proud to see uh, record levels of funding in education, and our achievements here are, are very, very clear. Uh, we'll always need to do more, and we accept that. And we always work and work collaboratively uh, with the sector to uh, work out how we can do more and how we can do better as a nation. And we all take up that challenge. And I know that the education, the university sector, and all sectors of education are rising to that challenge and working cooperatively across governments to ensure that we're providing the very best opportunity, uh, particularly for young people, particularly for young people, to be able to get ahead. Uh, every day we're listening and we're prepared to make the reforms which will deliver better outcomes. We're working very hard and we're listening every day and to uh, the, the feedback and we're responding to that and we're prepared to make the reforms, the necessary reforms that will deliver on better outcomes. And these bills that we've discussed here today and that are before the Senate are, uh, are, are very important. It's part of our plan. Uh, they are, are minor in their uh, the, the changes that they're making, but they are nonetheless important because it's important that uh, these stakeholders and the, the, the providers of education are, uh, are the ones that are actually bearing the costs uh, of the, de the delivery of these regulations and ensuring that that cost recovery is there and the charges are made. And importantly, those that are, have been sent a bill that they're going to be uh, required to pay it. And so this bill uh, ensures that uh, we have the capacity to be able to do that. And uh, that's why I indeed commend them to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Cost Recovery Bill 2021. Labor cannot support either of these bills. The bills, if passed, would enable the establishment of a new charge levied on higher education service providers aimed at recovering the cost of the regulator, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency. In doing so, these bills would alter the current arrangements for the agency in which only partial cost recovery is provided for, instead seeking to recover the full cost of the agency's regulatory activities. Unfortunately, Mr Acting Deputy President, the devil in this case is not in the detail because these bills provide a distinct lack of detail on just how the cost recovery framework proposed will operate. Sadly, this is increasingly becoming standard practice from this government. Provide a shell of a bill, delegating, regulation, uh, delegating powers to regulations, wait for the bill or bills to pass and then and only then reveal the specific set of rules, fees or enforcement mechanisms that will operate by regulation. This makes it difficult for the Senate, in particular, to do its important work and raise serious questions about transparency and accountability in this parliament. And so it goes that, once again, we are unable to properly consider these the specifics of these proposed changes. Nonetheless, Mr Acting Deputy President, the government has not been able to convince stakeholders of the merits of these bills, nor is the opposition satisfied of its necessity. Labor opposes these bills in part because now is absolutely not, to, not the time to be lever levering additional costs and fees on a sector that has suffered significantly from pandemic-induced border closures and lockdowns. It is certainly not the time to be levering additional costs on a sector that has not only seen many, many thousands of job losses, but been forced to make difficult decisions that have impacted on staff, students and research, but has absolutely been left out in the cold being left out in the cold by this government, high and dry, when it comes to government support and assistance. Disturbingly, it was revealed during the most recent round of Senate estimates that the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency has not done or sought any modelling on the impacts of this shift, 
this, that this shift will have on individual providers in the sector. And we are not talking about a small shift, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is not some sort of minor regulatory change that seeks to tinker around the edges. We know that, for example, for small and medium higher education providers, and remember these organisations have been significantly impacted and disrupted by both the lack of international students and the ever receiving horizon for a time frame for their return and, of course, lockdowns. For these providers, increasing regulatory levies and fees by up to 700 per cent represents a very real and present danger to their very existence. 700 per cent. It's not a rounding error, in case you thought it was, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's a substantive and potentially devastating increase. A fee change, indeed increase, of this nature and its impact should, should have been modelled by the government or their agency in advance of seeking to bring about this change. The fact that this hasn't occurred is simply not good enough. Unfortunately, it is in no way surprising. Because sadly, we can add these bills to the seemingly endless list of examples of the Morrison government seeking to undermine and attack this nation's world-leading higher education providers. These are institutions who have been repeatedly crying out for assistance and support for 18 months. And instead of offering a helping hand to bolster our nation's centres, centres of knowledge, research and development, all we see from Mr Morrison and this government is kick after kick, right in their time of need, abandoned yet again by the Liberal Morrison government. In this time of need, you'd think maybe, just maybe, the Australian government would deliver support in the budget for our universities. But did the budget have any extra dollars for our universities? No. Actually, they got a cut. In fact, Real funding for higher education will fall by a staggering 10 per cent over the next three years. Just think about that. At a time when it couldn't be clearer that investing in higher education, research, development and building our nation's collective knowledge would provide the best pathway for success in this global, globalised and challenging world, this government, the Morrison Liberal government, seeks not to invest in the people and places to provide this essential service, but rather to attack and gut them. Astonishing, short-sighted, damaging to our nation's future and future potential. Not only that, but this year's budget papers have also confirmed that due to job-ready graduates, funding provided by the Australian government to universities will be lower and student debt will rise. Remember this at the same time as many tens of thousands of students across Australia face fee increases at the start of this semester, and not small increases. For some students, this hike am amounted to a doubling, a doubling in their course fee. And what about the current state of play for the sector as a whole? Well, what we've seen is that universities collectively are suffering a loss in revenue of some $3 billion. The impact this is having on our economy as a whole has been quantified somewhere in the order of $9 billion lost due to the collapse in international student revenue. Faced with this stark, cold, harsh reality, one might be forgiven for thinking our government would seek to help our universities, our researchers, our teachers and our students to ride through this rough time. Well, you might think that, but sadly, unbelievably, it is not the case. Because instead, the Morrison Liberal government has sought not to help our universities, but to hinder them. To launch attack after attack, Mr Acting Deputy President. Cut after cut, dagger after dagger. Perhaps the most obvious example would be the fact that the government proactively changed JobKeeper rules on not one but three occasions in a very deliberate and targeted effort to guarantee that our Australian universities could not access much-needed support to retain critical jobs in the sector. Add to that 
right in the middle of our Australian universities' hour of need, Scott, Scott Morrison's Liberal government has cut support meant to ensure this nation's world-leading research was kept alive. Now, Labor acknowledges that in the 2020 budget the government did provide an extremely modest support of $1 billion, $1 billion across the entire sector, meant to partly ally the impact of falling revenue from international students. However, this year the government decided to cut that funding, presumably on the basis that the pandemic was over and international students would return. Well, that hasn't happened, has it? Instead, thanks to the Prime Minister's botched vaccination rollout, we are no closer to knowing when our full international student cohort will be able to return. What is the direct result of all this? The deliberate attacking of this most pivotal of sectors right when it, is, when it needs help the most? Well, the answer is more, more than 17,000 Australians have lost their job. And to really rub it in, the government thinks by prioritising these bills, by prioritising these bills, Mr Acting Deputy President, that now is the time to levy yet further fees and charges on our university and consequently on our students. Extraordinary. 17,000 jobs have already been thrown on the scrap heap. How many more will it take for the government to be satisfied that its cuts to our nation's knowledge capacity are enough? These jobs are academic jobs. They're tutors, teachers, lecturers and researchers. But the flow-on of consequences are vast. We've seen administrative staff and the many other virtual support roles that keep universities going impact it too. These are all people with families and bills to pay. Yet, these are people whose livelihoods and jobs our promise Prime Minister has proactively sought to throw on the scrap heap. If the Liberal Party, if this government really cared about protecting Australian jobs, we would, we would be debating in this place right now a bill to support this sector and every single Australian who works in it. Not these bills, not these bills designed to impose yet higher costs and rip more away from an already struggling yet essential component of this nation's economic fabric. What is it about our Australian universities and the people who work within them that Mr Morrison finds unworthy of providing the same sort of support and protection that has been afforded other workers? We've already seen that the budget provided no meaningful assistance for our pub Australian public universities. Not only, not only that, what it did provide was for a real cut in funding of some 10 per cent, over 10 per cent in the coming years. On top of that, the emergency funding meant to keep researchers in work was axed despite the fact that this crisis is far from over. In fact, the impact of this crisis has been felt ever more harshly and for ever increasing length of time due to this Prime Minister and this government's ineptitude when it comes to their failures on quarantine and the na nation's vaccination rollout. Students, workers and the entire sector dread what will, be, what will come next from this government. After eight long years of attack, first from Mr Abbott, then from Mr Turnbull and now relentlessly from Mr Morrison, a government who thinks the ability to obtain a university degree should be dependent on your ability to pay. A government a Liberal government happy to consign Australian students to a lifetime of debt. Indeed, this year's budget papers have confirmed for the first time in writing, mind you, something the government has refused to admit in public. That is that this Morrison Liberal government is saving money from, by dramatically hiking fees on students, transferring responsibility for the nation's debt from the Commonwealth to our Australian students. The Australian people don't want this country to become like the US of A. They don't want Australian kids to be saddled with a lifetime of debt just to have the ability to get an education. And Labor certainly doesn't want that either. That's why we've been calling for support for the sector, to support jobs, staff, students and our amazing world-class Australian higher education institutions. That's why we oppose these bills and everyone like them as, 
as this government has sought to drive the knife into the Australian universities and students over eight long years. Enough is enough. We are now at the point where we are talking about our kids graduating from university with debts of $60,000 just for a basic degree. This should, simply shouldn't be. How are young Australians supposed to save up a deposit for a home, let alone find a job and pay the bills with this lifetime of debt hanging over their heads? It's shameful and disgraceful that these bills will only make it worse, Mr Acting Deputy. Worse for students, worse for staff, worse for academics, worse for researchers. Further eroding and undermining one of Australia's greatest success stories. Our high quality, world leading Australian public universities and higher education providers. Something, Mr Acting Deputy President, something that we should be proud to support, we should be proud to encourage and we should grow, not attack. It is for these reasons that Labor does, does and will oppose these bills, and I urge the Senate to reject them. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I move the second reading amendment standing in the name of Senator Faruqi and for the assistance of colleagues this was circulated during the last sitting. And Senator McKim, did you wish to make a contribution? No. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Oh, I can take that off now. Um, and let's be clear in the chamber today, the only thing the Morrison government's cutting is the taxes of hard working Australians. Our legislated stage three personal income tax cuts put more money into the pockets of hard-working Australians. And each way Albo has been forced to execute something of a policy belly flop rather than a backflip. Senator Small, please resume your seat. Senator Brown. I would ask that the uh, senator uh, refer to members of in the other house with their appropriate name and Please. title. Uh, Senator Brown, you are correct. We should always refer to those in the other place by their correct title. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I will gladly reflect on the uh, well-executed policy belly flop that the Leader of the Opposition in the other place has executed uh, in rolling the uh, shadow Treasurer. Uh, in the Labor Party adopting now the fifth position when it comes to this government's uh, income tax cuts. Now, why do I focus on uh, the relevance, I guess, of these income tax cuts? The relevance here is that this is a government that, mean, that believes uh, that those services delivered in the Australian community should be funded, where appropriate, closest to the source of the cost being incurred. We're not going to take tax money off the tradies out there in suburban Australia building houses as quickly as they can on the back of this government's home builder stimulus and funnel it instead into the university sector, which, despite the, the hysteria and the claims of uh, incredible austerity and desperate times from those opposite and on the crossbench, is not supported by the statistics that we see in the media. For instance, in 2020, arguably, uh, one of the most economically dire periods for this nation and indeed the world, here's some cold, hard facts. The Monash University reported an operating surplus of $259 million. And they're not a standout performer, Mr Acting Deputy President, because the University of Melbourne reported an operating surplus of $178 million. And indeed, it spreads further because the University of Queensland, $83 million. In my own home state of Western Australia, UWA, a $58 million operating surplus. South Australia was right up there. University of Adelaide, $41 million. Flinders University, $35 million. And so it goes. So this is a government that unashamedly is on the side of those hardworking Australians rather than those taxpayer institutes pocketing millions of dollars when it comes to cost recovery and taxation arrangements. Now, you might think that that's somehow uh, blindingly obvious, but apparently to those opposite, 
This is an unprecedented crisis for the sector. We've heard complaints today that they were denied access to JobKeeper, and that's not a new, uh, a new narrative, but it is simply not supported by the data. Because even if we were to consider universities as entitled to the charitable exemption, uh, a charitable threshold uh, rather, of a 15 per cent revenue reduction, when you're reporting an operating surplus of $259 million, it stands to reason that you should not and were not given a penny. So what do these, uh, these bills before the chamber actually do? Well, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards, e Standards Agency bills give effect to the government's decision to increase the cost recovery for TEXA, which was announced in the 2018-19 budget. As my colleague Senator O'Sullivan uh, rightly pointed out, we delayed the onset of these increased cost recovery arrangements on several occasions due to external factors, not least of all COVID-19. The cold, hard reality is that the university sector can afford the gradually phased increase in cost recovery that these bills represent. And let's not forget we're starting from the incredibly low threshold of 15 per cent of Texas costs being recovered from the sector, with the taxpayer bearing the burden of funding, therefore, the other 85 per cent of Texas activities. Now, those pennies have to be earned here, Mr Acting Deputy President. They don't just rain down from the imaginary money tree that those opposite love to, love to shake. And we've seen it again with the proposal that they're going to give $300 now to every Australian who chooses to do the right thing, to act in the national interest, to protect the vulnerable in the community and get vaccinated. Well, we won't stand for it on this side of the House. And that's why these bills will increase the cost recovery of TEXA gradually to 90 per cent of the regulatory costs and some 75 per cent of funding that body overall. It is incumbent upon a responsible government, like the Morrison government, to find ways to reduce costs to the taxpayer. And it's that prudent approach that allows us to proceed with things like the stage three income tax, which will mean more of the money that hardworking Australians earn stays in their pockets. So what does cost recovery for Texas mean? It means increasing the application based fees to recover the true cost of those activities from the sector. That increase to the application based fee will be enabled by determination issued by Texa. Far from the cries that that's somehow negligence on the part of the government, I would contend that it is in fact the most prudent approach where TEXA works closely with the sector to develop a cost recovery model that achieves the outcomes that we seek to, uh, uh, to yield for the taxpayer without undue distortion to the sector. Increasing that new annual charge on higher education providers uh, in terms of risk monitoring and regulatory oversight is a new annual charge. However, as I say, that's also based on the draft cost recovery implementation statement, which is consistent with the Australian government's cost recovery guidelines. That's not negligence, Mr Acting Deputy President. That is prudence, and it is exactly the behaviour that Australians would come to expect of a responsible government. So no, no uh, constituent sector, body or organisation has ever welcomed the introduction of a government charge. So it stands to reason that the higher education providers uh, have criticised this, this new charge, which is being phased in, uh, as we've heard. But what we're not hearing is that it's estimated the vast majority of providers will pay an annual charge of between $25,000 and $35,000 a year once fully phased in in 2024. Now, when universities are running on an operating budget each year of billions of billions of dollars, the impost of a $25,000 to $35,000 fee uh, to reduce the burden on the taxpayer, those hard-working Australians who have to fork out to provide the services that we all enjoy, is not the end of the sector. It is not a drastic cut. It is not austerity. It is, in fact, responsible government. The charges bill 
which, uh, as I just mentioned, will uh, levy registered higher education providers to recover uh, the costs of the risk monitoring, compliance uh, monitoring and investigations aspects of Texas work is not unique. Many other statutory authorities and government agencies levy the sectors that they operate in to reduce the cost of that compliance and oversight activity on people who derive no benefit whatsoever from the sector. And arguably, just as uh, an earlier senator mentioned, in investment in higher education is a public good, there are many Australians who do not benefit from a tertiary education, who should therefore not be expected to fork out every year their hard-earned pennies to pay for this organisation. The amendments which do require this annual fee to be paid as and when it falls due also attracts penalties for late payment. Failure by a higher education provider to pay the charge will constitute a breach of its conditions of registration. That puts these organisations, put on a pedestal by some, but held to account by this government on a level playing field with everyone else that interacts with the Australian government. And make no mistake about it, this is a government that is committed to supporting higher education. We provided substantial financial support to higher education providers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Notwithstanding uh, the JobKeeper debate, these are organisations that did benefit from government stimulus spending, that have faced some challenges with our closed international border and uh, were rightly supported by this government through that period. However, on the back of that recovery, and we know that Australia's economic recovery has been stronger than anywhere else in the developed economic world, where we are a nation that has seen more people in work uh, uh, recently in July than at the start or the onset of the pandemic. So the claims of tens of thousands of job losses and bread lines because of uh, you know, austerity in the higher education sector simply is not borne out by the statistics that we see in this place. So this government will, as a responsible government, reduce the accreditation fees for small higher education providers with a sliding scale of reductions that allows providers with less than 500 equivalent full-time student load um, to receive a maximum reduction of some 70 per cent. And I think it's in keeping with the fact that this is a government consistently that goes and supports the little people. But where there is capacity to pay, as $259 million surpluses clearly demonstrate, we will, burden, we will reduce the burden on uh, smaller uh, Australia, those aspirational Australians who have to fork out for all of this, and instead charge those that can afford to pay. So, along with all this other additional expenditure, along with reducing the burden on, us, on Australians, this is a government that will also make additional investment in research and short courses, because we consider that these measures have already provided and continue to provide a significant, coherent, targeted and time-limited support to the Australian economy as we deal with the pandemic. That's why I support these bills as the actions that a responsible government takes, and I commend them to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Carr. Taken to your personal Senator Small made some Freudian slips in that remarks. He says that the Labor Party puts the tertiary institutions on a pedestal. He says, of course, that uh, some of these organisations will have to face the burden. Then, of course, has to correct himself that relieve the burden. Well, of course, it tells you everything about the way in which this government approaches higher education. The Labor Party will oppose these bills. And these bills, of course, go much beyond the question of funding. These bills go to the raise questions beyond the mere questions of raising additional fees for registration. And these are issues that are raised not just about the recovery of cost of TEXA. TEXA, the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency, regulates higher education. And just in February of this year, the government passed a higher education amendment bill, provider category standards and other measures uh, bill. Uh, it was a bill that provided additional powers for TESCA to set those standards. Now, I raise a number of cons concerns about the those new powers and, and 
they, uh, I think, have now, we look at the measures that have been taken over the last two months, we can see why it is that people have expressed concerns. Texas sets standards and has oversight of the minimum arrangements for higher education institutions that must be satisfied in this country. Whether they meet these standards determines whether they can call, a, call themselves uh, a, a university in this country. And if you change TEXA, you can change the higher education system. This government clearly is intent upon changing that system. The recent announcement by TEXA suggests that this uh, a regulatory agency is taking its cue from the government. The government's intentions are evident from the composition of the Higher Education Standards Panel, which advises TEXA. TEXA's willingness to fall into line can be guessed by its announcements last uh, month elevating the former Avondale University College to the status of a university. And I'll have more to say about that, uh, that roll call uh, in a moment. But first, as you look at the Higher Education Standards Panel, membership of the panel matters because it determines how the standards in this country are in fact interpreted. And if you look at the members of the panel, a pattern emerges. They include Mr David Perry, the Vice President of the Academic, of, of Academy of the um, Alpha Crucius College, Ms Adrian Neuenhausen, the Director of the Office of the Vice Chancellor of the University of South Australia, Ms Caddy Taylor, the head of strategic engagement uh, government relations at Navitas. Navitas, for all of those who are familiar with it, are this is the global company that operates several non-university higher education providers in Australia. Now, Alpha Crucia College is, a, in, is in Sydney and is another one of those non-university providers. And though it aspires to have, it, be, uh, have itself recognised as a university, its vision statement on its website proclaims its goal to be a global Christian university transforming neighbourhoods and nations. So the membership of the standards panel now includes three representatives of private providers, a representative of the Australian Technology Network, a representative of the regional universities network. But there's no representative of Australia's most research intensive universities, the Group of Eight. And I'm wondering how does this relate to the government's intentions, it says, to defend and advance research in Australia? How does this relate to the government's plans for TEXA as it's set out in this bill? TEXA's functions are guided by the 2015 Higher Education Threshold Standards Framework and those provider category standards legislation, which was introduced last year. Uh, which, uh, in conjunction with the various cuts to the university funding, sought to define higher education standards in this country. The government claimed that the legislation, uh, it's, uh, which was passed in February uh, in the Senate, made, made, was based on recommendations of the review of the higher education provider category standards by Professor Peter Coldrack, who is now the director of TEXA. The minister's recent statements, however, indicate that he is moving in a contrary direction to the government's own legislation. Under the new legislative criteria, from the 1st of January 2030, to be a registered as an Australian university and a higher education institution must conduct research that leads to the creation of new knowledge in at least three or 30 per cent of the broad fields in which they deliver courses of study. It pointed out at the time that some existing institutions might not meet that standard. The implication is that universities defined as the conduct of research, teaching and learning and civic engagement may no longer be recognised. The distinction between universities and private institutions would begin to be blurred. Private institutions like Alpha Crucius College, for example, it would be a creeping privatisation of the higher education system. And that's where the minister seems to be headed, not only with his appointment to the standards panel, but to the joint announcement of Texter on the creation of Avondale University. Now, what do we know about Avondale? Avondale, of course, has expanded beyond its origins as the Seventh-day Adventist Bible College. And it con conducts sufficient high-quality research to justify its new status, I, I presume. I presume, because why would uh, Professor Coldrake sign off on it? 
The creation of a new university is a rare event, and the public is entitled to know more about Texas' reasons for its decisions. Avondale has not yet been through a round of assessment under the Excellence for Research of Australia. Now, that's the metric that's applied by the Australian Research Council. Now, according to its website, Avondale offers PhD and, and, and uh, Masters of Philosophy degrees. Research specialisations are in education and arts and nursing and ministry and theology. Now, this tells us that some research is being done, but it doesn't tell us how much. And given the unease in this sector about long-term implications of changes to provider standards, Texas should set out explicitly the reasons for granting Avondale University status. And so I'm looking forward to Professor Coldrake's detailed answers as to how Texter reached its conclusions without undertaking a detailed era review, not only with regard to the breadth of the research being undertaken, but with regard to its quality. Australia has not been overwhelmed with stories of Avondale's cutting-edge contributions to new knowledge, yet its new status implies it is already operating at a level comparable to our universities. The government is presiding over the unravelling of the system. This goes beyond any arguments about the merits of having specialised institutions, such as research-only institutions or teaching-only institutions. While the government remains on its present path, we are likely to lose significant parts of the university system that we now have, without gaining either excellence in research at universities or excellence in teaching at universities. And this is all because of an ideological agenda to determine a high-quality university system based on public provision. The government has been wary of declaring its agenda explicitly. But the minister has started to come clean in a speech to the Universities Australia Conference in May. He acknowledged that the loss of international students during the pandemic has disrupted universities' revenues. And then he went on to announce his priorities for higher education. He spoke about commercialisation of research. He, said he spoke about student experience and he spoke about freedom of speech. This, of course, is government talks a lot about commercialising research and without showing much understanding of how research actually operates. And if we don't invest in basic, curiosity-driven research, there will be nothing to commercialise. And for the this minister calling on the student experience, that is the section in his speech was, on the face of it, a call for return to face-to-face -to -face learning on campuses. Now, face-to-face -face learning has taken a bit of a hit during the pandemic for obvious reasons. But the minister's real motive in drawing attention to the experience of domestic students was to take another swipe at vice-chancellors. Vice-chancellors who have reminded him there have been no permanent guaranteed funding for research. And there is a funding crisis created by the loss of international students. And the universities, we're being told uh, that there's no help will be forthcoming in the immediate crisis. Now, the bills before us, which add to the cost burden, are another reminder. The bills will increase the funding crisis facing universities by making Texas reliant on collecting fees for its activities. Finally, we have the minister's comments on freedom of speech. The minister and his allies, the right-wing think tanks and cultural warriors of the media, talk a lot about the supposed threat to freedom of speech on Australian campuses. This threat is confected, as the former Chief Justice Robert French found when he reviewed the matter. This has not deterred the minister. The complaints that universities are too slow to implement policies to uphold free speech and academic freedom, which are now a legal requirement. Yet he has no contradiction between this attitude and the way he allocates research grants through the Australian Research Council is used to smear the reputations of highly reputable academics highly decorated academics in this country. And I'll have more to say on that matter in another bill. So far as this bill before us is concerned, we can see that obviously there's the wrong time to move towards full cost recovery for Texas. 
Mr Tudge considered his speech, higher education has been one of the hardest hit sectors in the pandemic. Now we have another blow to the sector. The bills establish new charges for cost recovery for textures activity, and it's another move, a characteristic of this government, and an amount and a means of paying the charges will be left to regulation. Transparency and accountability have been shunted aside yet again. When the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee wrote to the minister asking why it considered necessary to leave key aspects of the new charges to delegated legislation, he replied in a now familiar manner. The charges, he said, were purely administrative in nature. Now, that's not the view of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, of which I'm a member. Significant matters relating to collection and administration of new charges should be set down in primary legislation. And we can't see that that will happen. What we have here are the costs are being borne by the lowest risk institution and, of course, the large public universities. The same institutions with the hardest hit by the loss of international students. In 2020, universities lost $3 billion in revenue and have had to lay off 17,000 staff. Higher revenue losses can be expected this year. And yet we've been told in debating these bills that we should be allowing the full cost of re recovery for Texta. Now, some, some of these agents, uh, these institutions here are being asked for up to a 700 per cent increase in the cost recovery mechanisms being proposed by these bills. These are charges that will do nothing to solve the real problems facing our universities. In fact, what we see with these measures is a government that is determined to make things worse, fundamentally a government that has no grasp of the real problems facing our tertiary sector and no solutions on how to deal with those problems. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I uh, rise to speak on the uh, Tertiary Edu Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill. And I, uh, I'll start off by expressing my concern, uh, that uh, clearly is shared by Senator Carr, that again the government brings to this chamber half law. Half law for us to consider. They don't put into the bill uh, some of the substantial or at least important elements of the laws that are being passed, and it is on that basis alone that I will not be supporting. Or sorry, it's not that basis alone, but that's one of the bases upon which I will not be supporting this bill. Do the job properly, departments. Bring your legislation to uh, your minister with the regulations attached, and ministers, see that your department does the proper job. Refer that your departments to section one of the constitution that says that it is the Parliament that makes the laws. It's, it's parliamentarians in full visibility of the public who make the laws, not people in, uh, in offices who are faceless and for which no one can peer in and look at what they're doing. That is not the way this system is supposed to work. And the government needs to up its game on this, and the parliament, the Senate, needs to stand firm. Uh, every time bills come to this chamber, which are half laws, uh, they ought to be rejected. Of course, the other problem with this bill is the fact that it raises charges. It raises charges which will ultimately be passed on to students. So here we have a government slogging students again. People who want to try and get ahead. People who are struggling, trying to get ahead, trying to get educated uh, so they can go off and contribute uh, to our economy, to our society. And what do you want to do? You want to increase the charges. And I get you know, you've got to manage money, but why don't you start with a submarine project? A project that went from $50 billion to $90 billion, and now we've added another $10 billion on because we won't get our submarines uh, in time uh, before, the Colin, uh, before the Collins class would otherwise exp uh, retire. They're due to retire starting 2026. We're not going to get our uh, future submarine until 2035. So we've had to pay an additional $10 billion to fill the gap. You've got these enormously risky projects that are draining the budget. How do we get into this situation? Go back to 2003 and read the Canard Review that says, buy off the shelf, build it here in Australia, that's fine, but buy products that you know work. 
And if you weren't, uh, if you didn't know about the Kinnaird review, go to the Mortimer, Mortimer review in 2008, because that will tell you the same thing. But every single time, what happens is we have um, admirals and uh, air marshals and generals who don't have project experience, who don't understand project risk, making recommendations to cabinets full of ministers who have even less idea about project risk and project management and the cost blowouts that occur when you take on extremely risky projects. So that's $50 billion. If you want to find some money for education, sort that project out. But you can't. No one on the other side will look at me while I'm talking about this because you don't know how to do that. You're incompetent and inca incapable of doing that. And the same thing for the Future Frigate Project. It went from $35 billion to $45 billion. Another blowout. Another blowout that could be paying for education services. And of course, we want tradespeople, we want people with engineering degrees to go and work to complete those projects, and they're going to struggle because they're going to get slugged by this new bill. Why don't you go to Jerry Harvey and ask him for the $22.5 million in JobKeeper that he took to make profit, to pay higher dividends and to pay executive bonuses? Right now he's spending that money on advertising for the Olympic Games. JobKeeper was for a good purpose. It was a wage subsidy for people who were trying to get through COVID-19. It was a good program, but it has been abused. And are you guys on the other side of the chamber? Are you are you going out there and saying, you know what? It's been used for a purpose it wasn't intended. We're going to take that taxpayers' money back because then we can spend that on education. No, you're not. And the irony of this is the very people that are going to have to dig us out of the, the, the deficit created by JobKeeper abuse are the people you're going to slug with these new charges. It's disgraceful. You know, the Liberal Party is normally characterised as being business people, good project managers. Well, you're falling way short in, in this regard. You've got no idea on how to deal with some of these projects. You know, let me give you a hint. When you see a, a naval officer or a general or an air marshal wander past, they're, they're good people. You know, I would go to, to, to war, and uh, I say this as a former serving member of the ADF, with, with almost all of them, because they're highly competent in what they do. But they're not project managers. I wouldn't take a project manager and say, go and be the commanding officer of a submarine. So why would I take a commanding officer of a submarine and say, I'm going to make you a project manager today? doesn't make any sense. And so we end up with these hugely risky programs, and it is completely out of control. It's out of control. Not only will it affect, unfortunately, the bottom line, which you're trying to claw back with these, these much, much smaller measures, but you slug the little guy, it endangers national security. I don't know if anyone's looked north of Australia on your side of the chamber for a little while, but there's tension brewing. And that tension will likely manifest itself not in 2035, if we're lucky to have our future submarines at that point in time, but much, much sooner. And the response we had last week is the Defence Minister announces that we've got a one and a half year delay in the future frigate program, going in the wrong direction. Actually, then he stands up and says, don't worry, we're going to recover that schedule. We're going to recover that schedule. That is one of the most naive statements I've ever heard a defence minister make. I can tell you, after being in the project management space for many, many years, in fact, watching defence for the last three, uh, three and a half decades, being a part of it, they never recover schedule. And that's consistent with what happens in the commercial world. So uh, it's clear that, uh, that uh, Minister Dutton has uh, now started drinking the department's Kool-Aid. If one thing I had hoped for was that uh, Minister Dutton would, would uh, t uh, look at things very objectively and not uh, end up swallowing all of, the, all, all of the rubbish that comes from defence when they're defending some of their poor projects. 
But the relevance to this, uh, this bill, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is the fact that we are taking money uh, uh, from the people, from students, through obviously tertiary uh, education bodies, to try and balance a budget that is so way out on the other side with, with uh, things like defence projects and, and, and JobKeeper that's not been recovered, that it's going to make almost no difference at all. Focus on the things that matter and stop, stop, stop trying to rip off students. Stop trying to, uh, to put uh, hurdles in the way of, of, of uh, people who want to get educated. It doesn't even fit in with any of your uh, standard marketing about a smart Australia. Because what you're, tr what you're actually doing is dumbing things down. And that's not good government. Senator Davey. Thank you. Uh, I've got to get the mask off and get everything working. Thank you very much. And, uh, I thank Senator Patrick for his very impassioned and um, interestingly uh, linked contribution where I did not realise that our um, submarine um, procurement strategy was so in integrally linked to uh, TEXA and, and agency cost recovery charges, but uh, it clearly is after that contribution. Um, I rise today to speak on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency charges and cost recovery bills, um, and I will stick to topic. Um, our higher education sector is a crucial industry for our economy. It services around 1.5 million students at any given time across the country, 31 per cent of which are usually attracted from international um, communities. That was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, the sector revenue was close to $40 billion. And I do note, despite what um, I have heard from some contributions from across the chamber today, um, that media is reporting um, that not all universities are in the negative. Um, we have seen some universities actually reporting better than expected results this year, which is a positive. And it just goes to show how agile our university sector has been in, in responding to the COVID crisis. In part, the attraction for our international students to study in Australia is the consistency of quality in our higher education sector. And that is also due to the establishment of TEXA. TEXA was established as a result of the Bradley Review conducted in 2008 that is examined the future direction of the sector, its fitness for purpose and options for reform. The agency that was established in 2011 now registers regulated entities and higher, as higher education providers and accredits their courses of study. It conducts compliance and quality assessments, re-accreditation of assessments and courses. Uh, it provides advice and makes recommendations to the Commonwealth Minister responsible for education on matters relating to the quality and regulation of higher education providers. It cooperates with similar agencies in other countries and it collects, analyses and interprets information relating to quality assurance and practice of quality improvement of our higher education sector. Um, TEXA is crucially focused on quality assurance and student outcomes. They ensure that our higher education providers meet minimum standards, promote best practice and improve the quality of our higher education sector. But this work comes at a cost, and currently the majority of that cost, around 85 per cent, is borne by our taxpayers. Now let us remember that not every Australian has either the opportunity nor necessarily the, the want to attend a tertiary education provider. Certainly I'm very grateful for those who choose, in other, uh, uh, instead of going to university, to undertake a trade and uh, help keep our economy going and keep our houses serviced by electricians and um, by other essential services. So I'm very grateful for those people. And I don't see why those people, through their taxes, should pay for the privileged few to attend 
our higher education providers over and above the vast quantities of money that our government provides. Uh, over $20.4 billion in the financial year 2021 is going to support our university sector from the taxpayers, and I thank them for that. But I don't see why our taxpayers should pay for every nut and bolt that goes through the university sector. And that's why it is crucial that we have some cost recovery opportunities. Senator Davey, time has elapsed for the debate at this point, and we will now proceed to two-minute statements. You'll be in continuation. Senator Lyon. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, what a mess Australia's in. We've got um, very uh, a sad occurrence of things happening in New South Wales, with New South Wales in an extensive lockdown. Uh, with the new Delta strain of COVID. Um, we've seen deaths in that state, and both in New South Wales and in Queensland, we've seen uh, the Delta strain now um, go to much younger people. We've got appalling vaccination rates in this country, absolutely appalling, and I think we're almost last at the bottom of the OECD countries. And yet, when you listen to the government, particularly the Prime Minister, who had two jobs, he had two jobs. One was hotel quarantine, and I think to date we're up to 27 leaks in hotel quarantine. That rests squarely with the Prime Minister of this country. And the second job was rolling out the vaccines, and he's absolutely failed at that, despite him standing up and coming up with plan A and plan B. And People will be vaccinated by Christmas and Australia will enter this fabulous new phase. None of that's true. We are languishing at the bottom of the queue and it's costing Australians lives. There's absolutely the responsibility for what's happening in New South Wales and in Queensland uh, right now is lands at the feet of the Prime Minister who failed to do those two jobs, vaccine rollout and uh, hotel quarantine. There's only two states now, or two, ACT and Tasmania, which are free of COVID. Every other state has uh, COVID, whether it's safely contained or it's in outbreak and free fall, like it is in New South Wales. The Prime Minister really seriously has to admit this is a race, and he needs to step up and to do the two jobs he was elected to do. It's time, Senator Lyons. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. In the national newspapers yesterday, the Prime Minister summed up the spirit of Australians, which comes in all forms in all our people. Our Olympians have inspired us in Tokyo. They have extraordinary talent, strength and fitness that is beyond most of us, but they are just regular Australians like all of us. The Olympians the Olympics has given us an insight into our Olympians like no other. All images of families and as images of families and supporters who would normally be in the stands uh, but are in their own homes are being back to us. We can see that they are just regular Australians achieving extraordinary feats. That's what Australians do. Whether you're an Olympian, work in healthcare, own a small business, are busy raising a family, volunteering in the community or working nine to five. The same basic qualities which drive and which have always driven our national success apply equally. Decency, determination, honesty, passion, grit, ingenuity, innovation have seen us through so far. And when it comes to dealing with the COVID pandemic, it's now time for the home stretch. We need to bring that same spirit which has served us faultlessly with every great national endeavour we've put our hand to and turn it toward the vaccine rollout. There have been setbacks, no doubt, and the Prime Minister has acknowledged and takes responsibility for them and has corrected them. And now our gold medal run to the end of the year has begun, and it's now up to you. There are vaccines available for everyone who is eligible. There is plenty of capacity and appointments available. The only thing left is for each and every Australian to make a booking to get vaccinated. I've had both of mine, and it's now time for you to do the same. Let's get back to normal life. Let's knock this on the head. Let's go for gold by Christmas. That would be something to celebrate. Thanks. Senator Wish Wilson. Communities right around this country have stood up and said no more oil and gas drilling, no more seismic testing off their coasts. In this time of climate emergency, 
when we need to be transitioning to clean energy at a time when we know that our oceans are broken and in need of significant repair and our care and attention, this is not the time to be exploring for oil and gas off our coasts. And right now, off King Island, off Tasmania, ConocoPhillips is preparing for a massive seismic survey in deep water 10 kilometres off the west of King Island. The King Island community, the King Island mayor, fishing stakeholders, the cray fishing stakeholders have all expressed their significant concern. And this chamber, when we had motions, passed a motion supporting the concerns of those in King Island and those in Braddon in the northwest of Tasmania. And you might think it's funny, uh, <coughs> Senator Dunningham, uh, this issue, but I can tell you in Braddon it's not. It's not a laughing matter. Uh, people in Braddon do not want to see more oil and gas exploration off their coasts. They do not want to see their fisheries put at risk at a very difficult time in history when they're struggling with regaining their markets in the rock lobster industry. We know from recent studies, the first of their kind, uh, off the coast of Victoria, not that far from King Island, that seismic testing has had a dramatic effect on those fisheries, on the flathead fishery. Over 99 per cent of that fishery disappeared following seismic testing, and it still hasn't recovered. There's significant uncertainties. This is a time to put a ban on all new seismic testing in this country. It's the time in history. It's what Australians want. There's better alternatives than oil and gas, and this That's chamber should time, show some Senator leadership. Wilson. Senator Sheldon on the remote access. Thank you very much. Uh, I rise to congratulate the 2,000 aviation workers and the Transport Workers Union who on Friday won a monumental case in the federal court against Qantas. Last year, while taking $2 billion from the federal government to keep their workers in jobs, Alan Joyce outsourced 2,000 ground staff. The federal court ruled that Qantas and Senator Alan Joyce— Sheldon, me, Senator Sheldon, we can't have visual for you. Can you just put your video back on, please? Oh, no. Sorry. Continue on. Thank you. Right. I just want to say, and of course, um, if Joyce does not, Alan Joyce has broken the law, and today I'm calling on Alan Joyce to do the honourable thing for the first time as a Qantas CEO and resign. And if Joyce does not go, then Qantas investors should be calling for him and his executive team to go. Now, while this is a massive relief for those 2,000 workers, one person who will be devastated by this triumph is Senator Stoker. Senator Stoker, who would act as a mouthpiece for Alan Joyce in this place and slandered those Qantas ground crew, many of whom built that company, worked for decades and raised families. So perhaps Senator Stoker can explain why the Morrison government has cut ground crew out of the last and the latest aviation support package. With a pretty, heady and vindictive act for a government as outsourced aviation policy to Alan Joyce. Now, Justice Lee, in handing down his decision, said that the key concerns in making the outsourcing decision, and I quote, at the time that it was made was because of the vanishing window of opportunity caused by the operational disruption of the pandemic. And there's a series of clear statements from the federal court judge that this matter was premeditated, pre-planned and instrumental on those workers um, being terminated. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The architect of our Parliament House, Romaldo Gergola, gave the Australian flag pride of place in his design. A flag the size of a double-decker bus atop an 80-metre pole which, with supports that bring together the House of Representatives and the Senate. The symbolism is clear. The Senate and the House of Representatives hold up our flag, not the other way around. Any person who comes into this place who does not then look up and feel awestruck with where we work and with the responsibility we have as senators has no place being here. The Australian flag flies above us for direction, not decoration. We're directed to remember those who were here first and the millions who have come since. Immigrants who have come to this beautiful country of ours to make a better life for themselves 
and to lift up all Australians in the process, including the Italian-born architect of Parliament House, which I imagine explains why all the marble. We are directed to remember that we represent people, not corporations. Yet the winners from 18 months of COVID crony government are not everyday Australians. The winners from crony government are foreign multinationals, big pharma. Never in the history of this beautiful country of ours has government policy so comprehensively abandoned those we represent in favour of those we do not. When government needs to deploy the military to con maintain control of our own people, to affect a social outcome rather than a medical one, there is only one description for that, martial law. How this government acts in the coming months will decide if a second description should be added, treason. Dividing Australians by any arbitrary measure, including vaccination status, flies in the face of everything our flag stands for, of everything this nation stands for. We will not be divided. We have one flag, we have one community, and we have one nation. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, two weeks of ISO was made considerably easier thanks to the Australian Oli the Olympics, Tokyo 2020 and 2021, but of course the outstanding performance of Emma McKeon. If Emma was a country as of today, she would currently be in front of Canada. She would be placed 14th in the world as an individual, but if Emma was playing as swimming as a country today. And all of this is packaged in this humble, hard-working, swimming superstar who achieves with minimal fanfare. But of course, we need to recognise her family, a proud swimming family. And with pedigree like this, how can she not have become our most decorated Olympian ever? Her dad, Ron, was an Olympian. Her mum, Susie, went to the Commonwealth Games. Her brother, David, was an Olympian and her uncle Rob Woodhouse was also an Olympian, all swimmers. And her sister Caitlin is an instructor at the McKeon Swim School in Wollongong. In fact, some Wollongong residents have suggested renaming her hometown McKeonville, uh, but definitely the placement of a pool or a statue, I think, is well and truly in order. But I also wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge the work of another great Australian, and that would be Mrs Gina Reinhart. It's through Mrs Reinhardt's uh, contribution to swimming through the Hancock Prospecting Swimmer Support Scheme that we have seen so many of our elite swimmers supported. But it's not just the swimming that Mrs, Hancock has, uh, Mrs. Reinhardt apologies, has supported. She supported the rowing. And how can we forget two new awesome foursomes, both in the males and the females? She supported the volleyball, both the beach volleyball and traditional volleyball as well as supporting artistic swimming, better known as synchronised swimming. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Sacconi by remote. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last month, delegates to the Victorian branch conference of the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association voted unanimously to bestow life membership to Arta Skibilia and Nola Jones. And it is them that I wish to acknowledge in the Australian Senate today. Arda and Nola have made significant contributions to not just the SDA, but to retail workers and the labour movement more broadly. Joining the union in 1984 at Maya Melbourne, Arda represented members as a delegate of her store. It was from these beginnings on the shop floor that she later came to work as an information officer, organiser, and later in the work cover team, where I got to know her, before she retired last year. She was elected president of the SDA Victorian branch in 2014. For a part, Nola joined the SDA in 1989 at Target Narry Warren. She became a delegate and continued to work at the same store until retiring in 2018. In that time, Nola was elected a branch conference delegate and to state council. Nola did a fantastic job advocating for members throughout her career. With almost 70 years membership between them, both Arda and Nola have selflessly contributed their time to improve the conditions of working people in retail. I want to congratulate them both on becoming life members of the union and thank them for their service. May their dedication be an example all workers can be inspired by and seek to faithfully emulate. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I just say, I think these two minutes are an absolute load of rubbish, honestly. 
Here you go. The major parties are squeezing the crossbench again because they know we're a threat and we're coming, and we're coming hard and fast in the ne next election. Because out there, apparently, the Australian people can't tell the difference on who's opposition and who's actually the government these days. So we have no problem in embarrassing you and calling you out. If you make decisions up here, then you should be called out. If you make those decisions, and those decisions are so good and you're so proud of them, then what is wrong with showing you on social media on the other side to what we think? What is wrong with doing that? Aren't those decisions supposed to be the best in the world? I thought you'd be out there like little marketeers, like your Prime Minister, selling yourselves like there's no tomorrow, saying, look what we've been able to achieve, but oh no. No, no, no. God help us if we ask for divisions these days. God forbid you wouldn't want to be sitting over there feeling ashamed of yourselves, which is exactly what happens, and that's why you do not want these divisions in here. That is why you do not want these divisions. It's got nothing to do except we are calling you out and making you stand on the other side and show us where you're standing and show the Australian public where you are standing. Show them that it's really not a democracy up in the, up in the Senate, is that you're all like little puppets, the lot of you, and what your leader says is what you do. And then you say, how high can I jump, mate? So if you want to do that because you're not independent enough to stand your own two feet, then at least own it. Own every little bit of it, which means when we call a division, which we should be entitled to over emotion or anything else, that that should be shown to the rest of the country, because I'm certainly not embarrassed about showing it. But yet when we do it, you don't like it. You don't like it because you're not all in sync. But you still do what your leader says. Welcome to democracy, Australians. This is what true democracy is. No divisions. Thank you. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And I'd just like to quote a speech from the father of modern superannuation, uh, Paul Keating. It's a speech he gave in 2007, and I'd like to quote. In other words, had employers not paid nine percentage points of wages as superannuation contributions to employee superannuation accounts, they would have paid it in cash as wages. In other words, the founder of superannuation has admitted that had that money not been paid into superannuation, they would have been paid as wages. And that is the problem with superannuation in this country. It takes money from the working class throughout their working life when they need it in order to subsidise the wealthy in their retirement. I hardly call that equitable. But it's not just wage theft that superannuation is, it's also infrastructure theft. Because what funded the sale of, uh, funded the privatisation of our infrastructure in this country? Superannuation funds in joint ventures with foreign owned organisations. You cannot support infrastructure in this uh, country and support superannuation at the same time. Because superannuation is the theft of infrastructure that belongs to our children. It should not be in the hands of unelected uh, industry funds and retail funds. I don't want to discriminate between the two. And furthermore, it's about time industry funds and unions in particular were seen for what they were, which is nothing more than financial brokers for the industry funds. And as such, like financial brokers, they are taxed. They are taxed. Unions should also be taxed. And furthermore, like any, we've got $3 trillion now under funds under management. That we need to democratise the board positions of superannuation. No more jobs for your mates on the boards. It's about time people got elected to boards and they were accountable Thank to their you, members. Senator Rennick. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. In the early days uh, with the Murray Darling, water extraction was pretty much a free for all. And it was around about the 1960s where water quality became an issue. We saw in uh, 1980 to 1983 the uh, River Murray mouth closed for the first time uh, in European settlement. Uh, then uh, we had the 2001 millennium drought. In 2006, John Howard uh, stood up and basically started a serious discussion about over-extraction in the Murray-Darling, and he announced a $10 billion plan. In 2007, a year later, we saw the Water Act being passed, which called on a, uh, the government to produce a basin plan, which was designed to work out how to, uh, to properly keep, have a sustained river. Um, as part of the work for that plan, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority produced a report 
in 2010 in October and said that we needed to, to, to uh, limit extraction by 3,900 gigalitres through to 7,600 gigalitres, depending on the level of confidence we wanted in, in sustainment. That was politically altered back to 2,750. That's all the recover, recovery we were going to get after. So South Australia stood up and said, no, that's not, uh, that's not OK. We need to look after the lower lakes and the Coorong uh, and the Murray Mouth, and we want an extra 450 gigalitres of uh, what are called efficiency measures. And that was baked into the plan. It was agreed by everybody. Um, in 2012, the basin plan was agreed to. Uh, nine years into the plan, however, uh, we've only seen two gigalitres of the 450 delivered, and unfortunately, it appears as though the government doesn't have a plan on how to get us the other 450. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Mariel Smith on video. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This past week, I participated in the independent review into workplaces of parliamentarians and their staff, otherwise known to those of us in this place as the Jenkins Review. And I wanted to put on, my record, on the record my gratitude to the women who conducted my interview for their professionalism and the sensitivity that they showed, and to acknowledge the work of everyone who is conducting this review and, importantly, who's contributing to this review in terms of their evidence. We know the broader and more inclusive the body of evidence of this review, the more effective its outcomes will be. So I wanted to use this opportunity to urge everyone who might be considering, considering participating in the review who's eligible to take part. There's still a small window in which you can do so. There's still a small opportunity to conduct an interview and put your experience on the record and to share your ideas for change. I know these can be really difficult conversations to be had, really hard conversations to be had. I do know that, but they are incredibly important if we are to see the change that we know this place so desperately needs. We all owe a huge debt of gratitude to those women whose bravery and courage in standing up and speaking out about their experiences in this building and these workplaces meant that we have this review in the first place. These women who came forward, who said enough is enough, and who did so at an extraordinary personal cost and with extraordinary sacrifices. It is past time to change the culture of this place, to undertake the critical work that we know is required to ensure it's a safe workplace, to ensure it's a just workplace for every single person who works here in every single role. It's absolutely critical work. I urge anyone who can take part to do so and thank everyone who's contributed. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Rice, remotely. Thank you. Today, I want to speak out about the terrible devastation that's occurring in a special patch of forest in Alberton West in South Gippsland, Victoria. And I want to shout out and salute the locals who are bravely protesting stopping destructive logging. Locals who are taking on Vic Forest, the Victorian-owned logging agency that once again is smashing up our forests, once again on unceded Gunai Kurnai country. Australia's got a horrific history of colonial exploitation, and we see that today. That devastation is continuing. Governments tearing down precious forests on sovereign, unceded Aboriginal land. There's someone currently in a tree sit stopping this logging. There are locals frantically trying to get a legal injunction against this destructive logging. They're out campaigning, protesting, doing everything they can to be protecting this special area of forest. Most of the forests in this region were cleared over 100 years ago. Every patch that is left is precious, particularly for the threatened birds and animals that live in these forests, including happy koalas, greater gliders, powerful owls and lace monitors. These species are recognised under our federal environment laws to be in need of protection. But where's our federal government cheering on the Andrews state government? Labor and Liberal joined at the hip, destroying our native forests. The Minister for the Environment, Susan Lee, is sitting on her hands. The Minister for Environmental Destruction rather than Protection. And this is logging that's occurring in the context of the climate crisis. It means forests are burning that have never burnt before. And it's not just the forests. 
we have melting ice caps, seas rising, and still the Liberal Party's intent on supporting their corporate mates rather than local people. We must end the devastating logging of our forests, including this special patch at Alberton West. So I call on the Minister for the Environment, Susan Lee, to step up and to act. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is time that we shook ourselves out of our deep, deep nuclear coma and consider adopting this technology here in Australia, particular modern small modular reactors. These are not a new concept. These have been in, used in submarines since the 1950s, but modern designs are incredibly safe, efficient and affordable. Why should we use them? Well, if we're not kidding ourselves and we actually do want to get to net zero at some stage in the future, and we want to do that without destroying our lives and our economy, then we must consider this as part of our energy mix. Countries with low emissions have either, either readily available large-scale hydro or nuclear as part of their mix. This is reliable and dispatchable and able to provide firming for our ballooning number of intermittent generators like solar and wind. Small modular reactors are becoming very affordable, currently down to around $60 to $70 per megawatt hour. They produce very little waste, uh, unlike older conventional reactors and intermittent generators, and they occupy far less land. If we look at the new scale small modular reactor, it's the first to receive US Nuclear Regulatory Committee final safety evaluation report. It produces almost 1,000 megawatts continuously on a site the size of 18 hectares. Now, if we compare that to Sun Cable, it produces 14,000 megawatts at full capacity under ideal conditions, occupying 12,000 hectares. Or 47 Order. times the size. Time has expired. Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally? We are not hearing Mr. you. Mr. President. There we go. More than 100,000 Australians have viewed a video online supposedly showing AFP Commissioner Rick Kershaw plan plotting a coup against the Australian government. It's a fake. Commissioner Kershaw is not talking in the video, and there is no effort, of course, by the AFP to overthrow the government. But what isn't fake is the threat posed by the creators of this video. This group had commissioned the creation of hundreds of fake a AFP badges and planned to recruit individuals to arrest the Governor General of Australia and replace him with a far-right extremist. The police have arrested an individual involved, and their investigations are ongoing. But the concern is that some of those 100,000 Australians who saw the fake footage may have been taken in by it. It's further evidence of the disturbing rise of disinformation and the radical far-right extremism in our community. Fascism thrives on the fringes. The anti-vaccine movement, the anti-lockdown movement, the sovereign citizen movement, these ideologies are vehicles for the type of disinformation and conspiracy that fuel anti-government anti-democratic and far-right extremist sentiment. The end goal of right-wing extremists is to spur the downfall of democracy. They benefit from chaos and distrust. And if people think this sounds far-fetched, remember that thousands that gathered to assault the seat of American democracy because they believed an election had been stolen. Remember the thousands that gathered across this country just weeks ago, united in their belief that the pandemic has killed millions is just fake news. It is of great concern that there are members of the current Morrison government who wink and nudge at these elements and attempt to curry their favor. Those who play to this audience threaten to legitimize them. In doing so, they undermine our democracy and they threaten our way of life. Countering this Order. must be Senator a bipartisan Keneally, time effort. has expired. Senator Ban. Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity in this first uh, session of two-minute statements, although it looks like I've got one minute left, just to address the comments of Senator Lambie earlier. 
her histrionics and her ability to throw her hands up and challenge the, those on this side of the benches and the other is just another example of why these two-minute statements are far better than the notices of motion they replace. Her ability to be able to use a, a, an instrument of parliament to show vote, to be able to confect outrage was terrible. Now that the crossbenchers have the ability to say what they want to say, without debate, we are, Parliament is better off, Australians are far better served by being able to uh, not have to vote or see their parliamentarians vote on things that they can't debate. So I celebrate this first opportunity to speak and I look forward to many more opportunities to do so. Thank you. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list. In doing so, I congratulate Senator McKenzie on her reappointment to the ministry. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement, which I just did. Leave granted. Leave is granted. No. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 2 July 2021. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question for Minister Colbeck. Isn't he remoting in for Mr. question Senator time? Colbeck I assume he is. Attending remotely. Yes, I'm here, Senator. Thank you. Yes, Mr. President. Senator Wong. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Why did Mr. Morrison repeatedly tell Australians that getting vaccinated is, and I quote, not a race? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Colbeck, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, giving the opportunity for all Australians to access a vaccin vaccination is extremely important. The Prime Minister has continuously uh, reinforce that, Mr. President. Mr. President, we have, uh, as we said, we would continued to accelerate the vaccine rollout uh, as more vaccines became available, and we've continued to open up the number of uh, uh, access points for vaccine in conjunction with the states, uh, with the growth in vaccine supply, Mr. President. As of uh, the last week, Mr. President, we've vaccinated in excess of. Uh, one million Australians in the last week. Uh, in fact, we've vaccinated more than one million order. Australians over the last three Se weeks. Senator Colbeck, so Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. A point of order is direct relevance. I asked a very simple question of the minister representing the Minister for Health as to why the Prime Minister repeatedly told Australians that getting vaccinated wasn't a race. Let you remind the minister of the question. It was quite specific. As long as the minister is specifically talking about the vaccine rollout, I don't believe I can instruct him how to answer the question. I'm listening carefully, um, and I've reminded the minister of that. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, as I said at the outset in my response to Senator Wong's question, the Prime Minister has repeatedly reinforced the importance of Australians getting vaccinated. That is at the heart of the four-point plan that the government has released in conjunction with the state through National Cabinet to allow Australians to have more access to freedoms as we increase the vaccination rollout. Mr President, the Prime Minister has always, has always reinforced the importance of vaccination order. and will continue to Senator do so. Colbeck, Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, I raise the direct relevance point again. Um, I anticipate what your ruling will be. I will ask you perhaps to go away and get advice on the clerk, for the clerk as to whether simply mentioning vaccinated means that your test of direct relevance being any discussion of vaccine rollout meets the relevant test. I will happily seek advice from the clerk um, on the direct relevance test. Um, I just remind senators and the minister that a narrow question requires a narrow answer, but I do not believe I can instruct him the terms on which. But I'll come back to the chamber. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, the Prime Minister has at all times, has at all times stressed the importance of vaccination. He continues to do so. It is extremely important that as many Australians get vaccinated as possible. The government has worked to continue to increase supply and the number of access points to allow Australians to get vaccinated. And we'll continue to do that. We've released the data to advise Australians 
on the availability of vaccine over the course of this year, and of course the four-point plan that was, re that was uh, worked through through a national cabinet is all about getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible so we can allow more freedoms to Australian people. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. A supplementary question. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said that the vaccine rollout is not a race. And his own backbench has admitted that, and I quote, he shouldn't have said that. With millions of people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland as we speak, and tragically 15 deaths from COVID-19 this year in Sydney, does the government regret Mr Morrison's repeated statements that the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister can and has spoken for himself with respect to this matter. But as I said to the Chamber in relation to uh, this question, the Prime Minister has always reinforced the importance of vaccination. The government has continued to reinforce the importance of vaccination and we will continue to do so. We know that getting a high proportion of Australians vaccinated uh, is one of the paths out of this pandemic. If you look at the circumstances in international uh, uh, jurisdictions, we see that the pandemic is becoming one of those who are not vaccinated. The, the importance of vaccination is clearly, is clearly extremely important. The Prime Minister continues to reinforce the importance of vaccination and getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible, and the government will continue to work uh, to ensure that that's possible. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. With around 10 million people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, can this minister explain why it has taken so long for Mr Morrison to go from it's not a race to we're making a gold medal run? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I think Senator Wong misrepresents the words of the Prime Minister that uh, he put in his opinion piece earlier in the week. He was talking about the spirit of the Australian people working to getting vaccinated and, and understanding what the targets were uh, for Australians to be va vaccinated so that they could enjoy more freedoms. Uh, we make no apology for that. It, it only reinforces the point that Australians need to get vaccinated. Uh, we continue to increase the capacity of the vaccine rollout, and as I said earlier, uh, over, over a million people vaccinated in the last two weeks. The vaccination process is doing what we said it would do. It's continuing to roll to, to increase pace as we increase supply and capacity. Uh, we continue to increase the number of outlets that are available for Australians to access the vaccine. Uh, we pay t particular attention to those areas of the country that are under stress, like New South Wales, and we'll continue order, to Senator do that. Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Back, Senator, order, Senator, Col Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please advise the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is implementing its plan to transition Australia from the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger and more secure nation? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for his question, and I know his enduring uh, work and interest in relation to uh, Australia, seeing through the short-term challenges and immediate challenges our nation faces, uh, but also the importance of continuing to build a stronger and more secure Australia in the long term. Uh, our immediate focus as a government continues to be dealing with the immediate health and economic crises, but also setting out a pathway through that uh, to the return of more normal life. It's built on the clear premise that by getting people vaccinated, and we can make uh, current approaches to lockdowns or border closures and restrictions ultimately a thing of the past, not necessarily eliminating safeguards and precautions that have to be taken in relation to infectious diseases, but being able to move forward. Just last week, the National Cabinet agreed in principle to our updated four-step plan to chart our path out of the pandemic and the targets we need to reach to get there. It is a uniquely Australian plan based on clear medical scientific and economic evidence. Today we have shared that expert advice from the Doherty Institute and the Commonwealth Treasury with Australians. It is a plan that gives every Australian a goal to work towards as a way out of this pandemic. It ensures that as we get through each phase that we need to reach 
the vaccination target on average as a country and for each state and territory. We also know the different steps that can be taken in changed management approaches to COVID-19 while still keeping Australians safe. For example, once we get 70 per cent of eligible Australians vaccinated, we move to the next phase where lockdowns will be less likely, restrictions can be eased and many freedoms returned. Those steps enhance even further at the 80 per cent stage, as the Doherty Institute evidence outlines. Australia is in a unique position amongst many nations of the world, having had the ability to work through such an expert scientific approach that can enable us uh, to work through our vaccine rollout continue to manage the pandemic in ways that can best position our country Order. for the future. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister out, please outline the supports the government has put in place, including with the states and territories, to support Australians and businesses affected by lockdowns? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the immediate challenges remain real for many Australians, particularly those facing lockdowns in Greater Sydney, in South East Queensland and others uh, along the way. Uh, we're directly delivering financial support to impacted individuals and to businesses. Be people who have lost more than 20 hours of work in the previous week during a lockdown can claim $750. People who have lost between eight hours or a full day of work to 20 hours can claim $450. These are equivalent levels of support that we provided with JobKeeper last year, but in a more targeted, tailored program uh, that can effectively reach those who need it most. Uh, in fact, it's a program that Premier Dan Andrews has likened uh, to being uh, an updated version of JobKeeper. Individuals who currently receive an income support payment through our social security safety net will also receive an additional weekly payment of $200 if they have lost more than eight hours of work, whilst we have plans operations in place with states and territories in relation to cost sharing support for small and medium sized businesses, all of it designed to help ensure we get people through these Order. difficult times and they come back strongly Senator afterwards. Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please update the Senate on the progress of the vaccination rollout and the steps the government is taking in cooperation with the states and territories as part of the national roadmap? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, I want to thank uh, the millions of Australians who are turning out to get vaccinated. Uh, with numbers growing each and every day, we now know that around 12.6 million doses have been administered across Australia and more than a million doses a week are being administered. And we've acknowledged there were early challenges to the program in terms of uh, expected deliveries that didn't arrive, uh, in terms of changes in advice from medical experts, uh, but nonetheless we're now seeing a total of 4.5 million vaccinations administered last month, which is more than double what was achieved in May, when 2.1 million doses were administered. This steady increase in supply, coupled with a steady increase in distribution outlets, is ensuring that we have the strongest possible position uh, for Australians to be able to get vaccinated, uh, to know that the supply will be there for them, the outlets for them, and that we can reach the 70 and 80 per cent targets outlined by the Doherty Institute uh, to safely Order. proceed to Senator the next stages Birmingham. of pandemic management. Senator Keneally, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In late June, the Prime Minister said in response to the Delta COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney, and I quote, I commend Premier Berejiklian for resisting going into a full lockdown. Does the Morrison government stand by this commendation? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and can I say I do commend New South Wales for the work that they've done in managing COVID-19. Clearly, throughout the pandemic, they've done an exceptional job. The Delta variant, however, has presented a, a range of new parameters for us to deal with. It moves much more quickly, uh, and as we've learned more, more about it, it's been clear using the health advice and the scientific evidence that we've had to change our approach. The New South Wales government and the Prime Minister have both acknowledged that, uh, and the government will continue to adapt its approach to COVID-19 uh, as we meet all of the challenges that come towards us through the pandemic, as we have done through the pandemic so far. But, as has been said on a number of occasions, there is no rule book to this pandemic. Uh, we know that new variants will come, uh, and they will change the way that we have to approach 
the pandemic. Uh, and we will continue to meet those challenges, Mr. President. Australians can be confident of that. But the thing that we need to concentrate on right now is to continue to increase the pace of the vaccine rollout. That's where the government's focus is. That's why we've released the plan that we have to allow the economy to reopen. That's why we're increasing the number of uh, points where Australians can access uh, vaccine. And that's why we're working with the New South Wales government to increase the capacity in those areas of concern in New South Wales, Mr. President. Uh, we will continue to do that. We will continue to meet the challenges that this pandemic throws up to us all. Uh, we'll continue to support Australians uh, as they need to be supported, Mr President, uh, and we'll continue to increase the capacity of Australians to get um, access to a vaccine because we know that is one of the uh, most important pathways towards a more normal life for all Australians. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As a result, of Mr. Morrison's bungled vaccine rollout, the Business Council of Australia has estimated that the Sydney lockdown is costing the economy $257 million a day. Does the Morrison government regret supporting a delayed lockdown in Sydney? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Morrison government will continue to act on the health advice in support of the management of this pandemic. We will continue to work with the states and territories to support them with their management of the state of the pandemic, as we have done all the way through through the formation of national cabinet and the decisions that have been made there, Mr. President. Uh, the advice that we've received uh, in respect of both the management of the current outbreak in Sydney with the Delta variant is that uh, the lockdown is appropriate. Uh, it needs to be uh, appropriately managed because of the speed at which the Delta variant works. Uh, and of course, having an appropriate management of the uh, local community and the lockdown also brings with it uh, or removes the possibility of longer lockdowns, uh, and which will have a, an even worse economic outcome. So, Mr. President, order. Uh, we will Senator continue Colbeck, to work time in for the Australia answer has expired. Sen order on my left, Senator O'Neill. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Mr. Morrison's mismanaged vaccine rollout has tragically led to the deaths of 15 people from COVID-19 in Sydney. Will the Morrison government apologise for Mr Morrison's wrong advice to the New South Wales Premier and for failing to protect the people of Sydney from this devastating COVID-19 outbreak? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I simply do not accept the allegation that's been put forward by Senator Keneally in her question. The decisions with respect to lockdown in New South Wales are decisions of the New South Wales government. They have responsibility for those matters uh, under their public health responsibilities. It is absolutely tragic that we've lost a further 15 lives to this current outbreak, uh, to this new variant. Uh, and I extend my condolences to every one of those families uh, that, uh, that are involved in that loss of life. But Mr President, the suggestion that the vaccine rollout is responsible for this current outbreak is simply not true. Uh, Mr President, I reject completely the premise of the question that's been put Order, to the Parliament. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. We are going to another question. Senator Seawitt, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister's press conference on the modelling by the Doherty Institute leaves a lot of unanswered questions, showing only a set of slides. Will the government release the modelling for, by the Doherty Institute in its entirety, including any technical papers and reports? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My understanding is, uh, and I don't, I don't have a, a brief on this with me, unfortunately, um, Mr. President, but my understanding is that we, it is our intention to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, so um, I, I can't give any further advice uh, with respect to the technical papers, but my understanding is that it is the government's intention to increase uh, to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute so that Australians can understand the rationale behind the decisions that are being made as a part of the uh, plan to reopen the economy. Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister take that on notice, please, and confirm if the technical reports will also be uh, released? Can I, uh, can I ask also? The government is aiming for 70 per cent of the adult population to be vaccinated for stage B, for phase B, which actually equates to 56 per cent of the entire population. If we start leaving, leaving, lifting restrictions at around that range, the Grattan Institute predicts there could be close to a million cases of COVID. Have you looked at the Grattan Institute's modelling and are you concerned? The time for the question has expired. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to take on notice the part of the question that I wasn't able to answer or send to see what previously with respect to supplementary work. Mr. President, the government has made its decisions based on the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, the, the, that modelling is based on those people who are currently um, part of the recognised vaccine rollout. So, Mr. President, uh, I, I haven't seen the paper that's been done by um, the Grattan Institute, Mr. President, but the government, uh, through National Cabinet, commissioned the Doherty Institute to do the research that was required to um, provide the benchmarks for opening the economy. Uh, I've indicated that uh, it's the government's intention to release that institute, uh, that, in, that information, Mr. President, and. That information is based on the current parameters of the Order, vaccine Senator rollout. Senator Colbeck, time for the answers expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. The TGA has approved the use of Pfizer in children aged 13 and, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 12 and over. Children are essential, an essential part of any vaccine strategy. Why didn't you include children over 12 years of age in your vaccination targets and are you going to? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, that information, from my understanding, will be uh, included in the data from the Doherty Institute that is being released publicly so that Australians can understand uh, what's, uh, what, what, is the, what the basis is for the targets that have been set. Uh, bearing in mind, Mr. President, uh, that it's only in recent times that there has been a, an approved vaccine in Australia uh, for um, children between the age of 12 and 16. Uh, the um, Pfizer uh, vaccine is now approved for children, uh, and my understanding is that the data being submitted to the Australian government for the Moderna vaccine likewise is seeking approval for children um, uh, for those over the age of 12. So, Mr President, uh, all that information will be available once the Doherty information is released, and I understand it's being released Order, very soon. Senator Colbeck. We'll move to Senator Griff remotely. Senator Griff. Oh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Last week, Rosa Mayoni pleaded guilty to killing Anne-Marie Smith. Ms Smith was an NDIS participant in Ms Maloney's care, but suffered extreme neglect. She ultimately died in what South Australian police described as disgusting and degrading circumstances. Ms Smith's death led to an independent review known as the Robertson Review, which reported in August last year and made 10 recommendations. Minister, how many of these recommendations does the government support and how many have been implemented to date? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator very much for his interest in this case. Uh, it is now more than a year since the absolutely tragic death of Anne-Marie Smith, and can I say no Australian, no Australian 
should ever have to die the way this lady did. Uh, and the death does continue to sadden and shock many people across Australia. As the senator has said, in August 2020, the support worker alleged to have been providing support to Ms Smith was arrested by the South Australian police, charged, and has now pleaded guilty. In May 2020, the NDIS Commissioner appointed the Honourable Alan Robertson uh, SC to conduct an independent review into the NDIS Commission's uh, regulation of integrity care, the provider concerned. And the review was publicly made available on the 4th of September 2020. In August 2020, the NDIS Commission revoked the registration and issued a banning order against Integrity Care, the provider of support to Ms Smith. In addition to this, the Commission has taken a number of other regulatory actions in relation to Integrity Care and to Ms Smith's former support worker. In relation to the Robertson Review itself, uh, the government is fully supportive of the review and all its recommendations. And in fact, we have a bill in this place uh, at the moment, which the Community Affairs Committee is currently uh, taking evidence on. So we are absolutely and resolutely committed to delivering quality and safe NDIS services to all participants to meet their needs, but also to support them to live free from violence, from abuse, from neglect and also from uh, exploitation. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. One review recommendation, Minister, was for the NDIS to establish a community visitor scheme. Now, that would allow vulnerable participants to have face-to-face -face contact of an independent person who can ensure that they are being cared for and their rights respected. Now, a similar scheme already exists for older Australians receiving home care packages. When will the government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you again, uh, Senator, for that uh, question. Uh, this is an issue that I'm very familiar with, and the South Australian Minister has also raised this issue directly with me uh, for obvious reasons. It is something that I'm hoping that the Community Affairs Inquiry will also uh, look into, and I understand that they did take evidence in relation to this issue in relation to the balance between the right of privacy versus the right of entry and how to deal with that situation. So I very much look forward to the Community Affairs Report uh, on the legislation. But we clearly have to get the balance right between a, a person's right to privacy uh, in their own home and also how we ensure that they are best protected. Senator Griff, final supplementary question. Minister, the review also recommended each vulnerable participant have an individual within the NDIS who is responsible for their safety and well-being, a single point of contact, if you like, when things go wrong. Will the government implement this recommendation? And I don't think we need to, to wait for any other inquiry or community affairs review of any type. Will government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, and I thank Senator Griff for that uh, question. Uh, in relation to that matter, it is something that I'm seeking further advice from the NDIA on and also the Commission. Because again, it's uh, like many things with the NDIA, you move one lever and it actually impacts other aspects uh, of the implementation of the scheme. So, Senator Griff, I'll take that aspect on notice and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The Prime Minister has announced that Australia will enter its next phase out of the pandemic when 70 per cent of the adult population is vaccinated. On what date will this target be reached? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I'm looking on the screen. Thank you, Mr President. Yep. Well, Mr President, the government deliberately has not establish the date for that to occur because that particular matter is in the hands of Australians. But what we will do is continue to encourage Australians to come out and get vaccinated and, what, and, and we will also continue to increase the number of avenues that they can access a vaccination. Uh, and we have continued to do that, Mr President. Uh, as we've had access to more vaccine, we've increased the number of 
avenues for Australians to get vaccinated, whether that be through state clinics that we're operating, uh, we're supporting the states by provision of, of vaccine, whether it's through the GP respiratory clinics that are now providing uh, vaccination Order. services, whether, whether it's through the GPs who are doing a magnificent job, Mr President, of uh, providing vaccines for Australians, or by growing the number of access points across the country through pharmacy, Mr President. So we will continue to provide access to Australians to the vaccine, and we'll continue to increase the number of uh, outlets available uh, as we continue to Senator grow the supply. Senator O'Neill. Well, Mr President, we haven't uh, deliberately uh, put a date on that. We want Australians to come out and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, and the point of setting the targets, using the advice of the Doherty Institute, is so that Australians understand the thresholds that are required for them to enjoy more freedoms and for the country to continue to work to its way through uh, this pandemic, Mr. President. Uh, it would be, it is not the right thing for us to, to, to attempt to set a date for this, Mr. President. Uh, but we will continue to do everything we can to encourage Australians to access a vaccine. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Don't the 10 million people who are now in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, who have been let down by Mr Bro Morrison's broken promises, deserve to know when this target will be reached? Isn't being up front with 10 million Australians in lockdown the Australian way? Order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I don't accept the characterisation that's been placed on this matter by Senator Watt at all. Australians all understand the importance of beating this pandemic, of beating this virus, but they also understand that they have a choice to come out and get vaccinated. What we will continue to do is to encourage them to do so by providing them with good advice with respect to the vaccines. And what we'll also continue to do is to increase the number of points that are available to them to access the vaccine, Mr President. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. The important thing is to uh, ensure that Australians understand, understand the targets that are there to allow us more freedoms under the transition plan that's been announced uh, and worked on through National Cabinet very cooperatively and to provide opportunity for Australians to both Access Order, Senator and receive. Colbeck. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government's own COVID response plan includes measures, and I quote, encouraging uptake through incentives. Why is the Morrison government prepared to publicly consider discounts and frequent flyer points, but ruled out any other direct financial incentives? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, uh, we've ruled out the plan that's been put in, that's been announced by the leader of Order. the opposition, uh, because it's a bad plan, Mr. President. Order. Um, as it was described to me this morning, Mr. President, all thought and no, uh, all bubble and no thought, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, we will do what we need to do uh, Order. to Sorry, encourage Senator Australians. Colbert, please um, pause for a moment. Pause the clock. I appreciate the chamber is robust. I'm just actually struggling to hear Senator Colbeck. We do need to change our regular behaviour and be a touch more compliant with standing orders about interjections during a remote session. I appreciate the chamber is more quiet than normal, but the chamber needs to be especially quiet because I need to be able to hear the answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, so, Mr. President, we will continue to encourage Australians to come forward and take a vaccine. Uh, part of the reason that we set the four-point plan out was so that Australians understood what the thresholds were to enjoy more freedoms. So we will continue to support them by providing greater access to vaccines through both supply and access points, Mr President, because we know that all Australians understand the importance of uh, getting a vaccine so that we can all enjoy more, more freedoms uh, and, and get on top of this pandemic. Senator Hughes. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. As we continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic, many people are becoming increasingly affected by their inability to work because of lockdown and movement restrictions. Can the minister please outline what financial support the Liberal and Nationals government is providing to people who've lost hours of work in areas who are currently locked down, including Commonwealth hotspots in and around Sydney? The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the senator for her question and her uh, advocacy and passion for her home state of New South Wales. And I think everyone in this chamber uh, stands with those that are experiencing a lockdown in New South Wales right now. Well, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact, not just in Australia, but around the world. More than four million lives have been lost, and we're facing the largest global imp economic impact since the Great Depression. Order. In the face of a once-in-a-century pandemic, the Australian spirit has shone through. Early and decisive actions in 2020 saved lives and livelihoods. We closed our borders. We established the National Cabinet. We invested, as, as a federal government, $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals and businesses to cushion the impact. And we know that these measures have had a significant impact on all Australians and have ensured that we've been able to weather this storm together. And when we look globally, uh, not all countries can say that. The Liberal and Nationals government has stood side by side with all members of the Australian community throughout the pandemic and will continue to do so as the Delta variant wreaks havoc in so many of our states and communities. As the virus evolves, so does our government's response, because there is no guidebook for COVID. And that's why I'm proud to be part of a government that's delivering targeted, localised, individual uh, support payments to those who live or work in a Commonwealth declared hotspot. There are two tiers of payments. If you have lost more than 20 hours of work as a result of the lockdown, you are eligible for a $750 payment. If you've lost between eight and 20 hours uh, as a result of that declaration, you're eligible for $450. And if you're on income support payments and have been working, you are also eligible for a $200 payment if you've lost more than eight hours. I would recommend that those who are in those uh, areas apply online to keep services as Australia's phone Senator lines open for those. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 28th of July, Prime Minister Morrison announced an expansion to the COVID disaster payment. Can the minister provide details on the increased financial assistance being provided through the scheme and how this will affect communities in lockdown? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. If people have lost hours due to the impact of lockdown, I do encourage them to apply, log on to Services Australia or MyGov uh, and actually apply for these income support payments. We've rolled them out in Victoria, we're rolling them out in South Australia. They're helping and assisting uh, people in New South Wales right now and will continue to do so as that lockdown uh, is extended. And they will be available to those Australians in those Commonwealth uh, declared hotspots in South East Queensland. Because we know that this is tough. Being locked down is tough. You have to shut your business. You can't go to work. You have to homeschool your kids. Uh, we actually, and it doesn't just impact your financial situation, it also impacts your mental health situation. So we have a raft of payments in addition to this. The pandemic leave payment assists you so that if you are caring for someone with COVID, or indeed you uh, catch COVID, that we will be standing with you to ensure that you have financial Order, support. Senator McKenzie. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the standard process for the COVID-19 disaster payment that will be undertaken for future lockdowns should these occur? Senator McKenzie. Well, as this pandemic has rolled through the world and indeed our own nation over the last 18 months, state and federal governments have had to adjust their responses accordingly. We've used science, we've used data, we've used evidence, and we've used the advice of our medical officials, which is exactly what we should be doing. We should be taking the politics out of our COVID response. And that's why I look forward to those opposite. Uh, supporting Australians to get vaccinated as fast as possible, because that's how we can actually get out of being locked down, actually stopping those lockdowns, 
by ensuring that Australians aren't just getting Pfizer, aren't Order. just getting Moderna, but are actually Order. lining up to get AstraZeneca. Senator and I look Wong. forward to Labor Party senators tweeting, putting in their newsletters, making sure at their local branch meeting they're encouraging Australians of all ages to adopt the medical advice, get vaccinated and access Order. AstraZeneca. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, Order, Senator Wong. Senator Lambie's on her feet. Senator Lambie. Yeah. Senator Wong. Senator Lambie's on her feet. Order. Order. <laughs> Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Attorney General, Minister Cash. Minister, the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide is underway. People are ready to make a submission. We are waiting further instructions. They want to be called to give evidence at a hearing, but before they can do that, a lot of them need funding for legal advice. It's been three months since the Prime Minister announced the Royal Commission. When will people know what the plan of attack is here? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her question. I also thank Thanks, Senator Lambie, for working constructively with me uh, in the lead-up to the announcement of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide. Uh, and Senator Lambie, you are correct. On 8 July 2021, uh, the Royal Commission, as you know, uh, into Defence and Veterans Suicide was established by letters patent following agreement from the Governor-General and a period of consultation which you and I consulted on in relation to the terms of reference. What we've done as a government is we've provided $145.3 million over two years from 2021-22 for the Royal Commission, including to support families and advocacy organisations to participate in the inquiry. We are committed also, as you know, to establishing an independent national commissioner, and you and I have discussed this, for defence and veteran suicide prevention. In terms of the Royal Commission itself, uh, it will be required to deliver its interim report by the 11th of August 2022 and a final report by the 15th of June 2023. In terms of engagement with the Royal Commission, which is what you have referred to, it will be up to the Royal Commission itself to determine the most appropriate ways to engage with people about their experiences, whilst balancing that with the need to complete the inquiry in a timely manner. I think you and I actually discussed uh, that the letters patent recognised the need to establish accessible and appropriate trauma-informed arrangements for people engaging with the inquiry. The Royal Commission itself is now accepting submissions from all interested people and for organisations. Uh, it is, though, as you know, independent from government, and it itself will actually determine how all hearings uh, should be run. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. So, uh, the tender for the government's legal advice helpline only opened two weeks ago. The Royal Commission was called before Anzac Day. Uh, you know, why didn't, why can't, can't the department or the government walk and chew gum at the same time. Now, you already decided you were having a Royal Commission back in April. Why couldn't you have asked for tenders back then, even before you got anything signed off? Why are we so far behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you and I will have to disagree in relation to why we are so far behind. Um, and again, I thank you for working constructively with me uh, in relation to the terms of reference of the Royal Commission, uh, just in terms of what support will be available uh, for people who want to engage with the Royal Commission. And as I said, it is for the Royal Commission itself to determine uh, how those people will be engaged. Uh, but certainly the government recognised the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and the fact that these people do need to be, as you and I have discussed, professionally supported. Counselling and support services will be available to assist people calling or engaging with the Royal Commission, including counselling support available before, during and after a person participates in a hearing or a private session. A legal financial assistance scheme, and again you and I have discussed this, will also be available to people called as witnesses Order. to Senator the Cash. Royal Commission. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. 
thank you, Mr. President. Um, can you guarantee that the thousands of us who have taken years to fight the department have thousands of pages of documentation? We'll have funding to use our own lawyers if we get called up to by the Royal Commissioner. Can you guarantee me that there will be no more psychological harm done to any of us or our children? Senator Cash. And again, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you raise a very good point in terms of. Uh, as I referred to in my previous question, uh, the fact that support does need to be made available uh, to people who are engaging with the Royal Commission, uh, in particular recognising the types of experiences that these people have had. And that's why, when we set up the Royal Commission, one thing we were very, very clear about is recognising the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and to ensure that there are the mechanisms in place uh, so that they are professionally supported. And again, I've, as I've said to you, if there are any ways that you feel um, order. that these Senator Cash, Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator yeah, thank Lambie. you, Mr. President. Um, I think, you know, to save everybody some hurt here, we just want to know. If we get called up in front of the Royal Commissioner, Senator Lambie, what's your, your point? My of order? point Sorry? of order is: I asked the question, will we have funding to use our own lawyers? That is what I would like answered, please. You, we need to know this now. Senator Lambie, I'm yeah, Lambie, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm, President. There is a lot of people hurting out there Senator, because of this, Senator and I'm going to put it. I'm going to stop it now. Senator Lambie, one question: Senator Can Lambie, we use our own lawyers? Senator Lambie, please resume your seat. I allowed you to restate part of the question. I wasn't sure what you were doing. I allowed you to restate part of your question. Um, you reminded the minister of the question. She has 16 seconds remaining to answer. Uh, as I said, Senator Lambie, legal, uh, a legal financial assistance scheme will be available to people who are called as witnesses. An independent legal advisory service, counselling and support services will also be made available to people engaging with the Royal Commission, and private sessions will also Order. be available Senator for Cash, individuals time for the answer has who wish to share. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister, can the minister confirm the Morrison government's 70 per cent Phase B target only includes Australians aged over 16 and, as a proportion of the population, is only 56 per cent? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, as I indicated to the, to the Chamber earlier, the advice on the targets is based on the modelling of the Doherty Institute. It's not, some, it, it's not a number that's been chosen by the Prime Minister or, for that matter, by any of the state premiers and national cabinet. It's based on research by the Doherty Institute on the thresholds required to start reopening the Australian economy and community during the pandemic, Mr. President. So it's, the, the thresholds that are being put forward are based on the research, Mr. President. As I've indicated to Senator Seaworth earlier, that research is going to be released publicly. Senator so Wong, all Australians I, I, have point access of order. To Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Point of order direct relevance, a very simple question. Uh, which is clear from the Doherty research released, and I assume this minister is aware of it, that the 70 per cent relates to the population over 16, and if they are included, in fact, the threshold is 56 per cent. We're asking the minister to confirm it. Um, Senator Colbeck, on, on this occasion, the question was specific and factual in nature. Um, to be directly relevant, you must address, address the facts in question. Um, so I'm going to remind you of the question. It was a specific question seeing, seeking a fact. You've had 50 seconds, uh, and I'll remind you of the question that was asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the thresholds uh, are based on the Doherty Institute research that has been publicly released. Uh, and, and, and the research is based on the vaccination profile of the population uh, that was assessed by the Doherty Institute, Mr. President. So I am happy to confirm the numbers that are in the Doherty Institute data. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator, Senator Wong. I repeat my previous point of order. Um, and I would have supported that point. The minister, at the last sentence, he said he was confirming numbers contained in the modelling. 
uh, that was referred to in the question. So I'm going to ask the minister to restrain his comments to the facts sought. Um, but at that point, in my view, he was being directly relevant with that phrase being used. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, the reason we're releasing the Doherty Institute data is so that all Australians understand completely the parameters for the opening of the community. That's why I'm very comfortable in confirming that information and that data as presented by the Doherty Institute. It's important that everybody understand, that all Australians understand, that the decisions that we're being made, that, that the government is making in conjunction with the states to open the economy and to open the community is based on research, uh, as has been um, accessed by the government. And so I'm very comfortable in confirming Order, the figures. Colbeck, in the Senator Doherty Chisholm, Institute. a supplementary uh, question. Thanks, Mr. President. Ten of yesterday's 13 new COVID-19 cases in South East Queensland were children under the age of nine. Children under the age of 16 are still not eligible, able to access vaccinations. When will parents be informed about their children's eligibility for the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, in fact, uh, the Minister for Health in the last day or so has actually confirmed access to vaccine for children between the age of 12 and 16 um, based on certain health conditions. So that process is being commenced uh, and is being supported by the advice of a target, Mr. President. Uh, we have one vaccine that currently uh, has approval for use for children between 12 and 16, and that is the Pfizer vaccine, Mr. President. And the Minister for Health yesterday announced a number of parameters where children with certain uh, health indicators can, in fact, start to access uh, a vaccine, Mr President. There are no vaccines at this point in time in Australia that have been for, approved for use for children under the age of 12, Mr President. So we will continue to follow the health advice in the support of Australians. Senator Colbeck, vaccines. time for the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government is confident vaccinating just 56 per cent of the population will protect Australians and allow for reduced restrictions? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, that is the advice from the Doherty Institute. That's why we're following the advice from the Doherty Institute. Uh, and that's, that's why we commissioned the work in the first place so that we would, could understand and make the appropriate decisions on the thresholds that were required for governments through National Cabinet uh, and at a state level to make their decisions in relation to reopening the economy uh, and the community. We all want to see the back of this pandemic as soon as possible, Mr President. That's why we continue to work every day to ensure uh, availability and access to vaccines and to grow that availability and access, Mr. President. So the work that's being, the decisions that are being taken are based on the research that's been commissioned by the government at the request of National Cabinet uh, to support the reopening of the Australian economy. Uh, and we will continue to follow that advice. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small Business and Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. In light of the unprecedented economic situation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and these ensuing waves, can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are securing Australia's recovery by continuing to support small and family businesses right across Australia to get through the current COVID-19 lockdowns. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Uh, Mr. President, as you know, small and family businesses, there is no doubt, they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And since the outset of COVID-19, the Morrison government has backed small and family business with unprecedented levels of support. And of course, we will continue to do so. We also know, and you just look at the numbers in the Senate here today, that there is still a lot more work to do. We've now seen recent COVID outbreaks in Victoria, in New South Wales and in Queensland. And what that says to us is we're not out of the woods yet. In terms of New South Wales, the business support package in New South Wales, which we partnered with the New South Wales government to deliver, provides a template now for further support measures that will help small and family businesses get through the pandemic. In New South Wales, again in partnership with the New South Wales government, we are delivering between $1,500 and $100,000 per week for qualifying businesses that have seen a significant downturn in their revenues. For smaller businesses, and in particular small and micro businesses, those ones that only have a small number of employees, they'll receive a minimum payment of $1,500 per week. And Mr President, as you know, in your home state of Victoria, we also partnered with the Victorian government in business support during their recent lockdown. And we, of course, stand ready now to work with the Queensland government, as we did with the Victorian and the New South Wales governments, to provide the economic support for small businesses to get them through the lockdowns. We've done this before, and we know that businesses will come through this and will get back to doing what they do best, which is, of course, employ Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline to the Senate how the government is supporting our sole traders across Australia throughout these lockdowns? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, what we saw last year with the onset of COVID-19 was the Morrison government providing crucial economic support to sole traders to keep their businesses going. We utilised measures like JobKeeper and, of course, when I was the Employment Minister, allowing owners to meet their mutual obligations by working in their business. That was so important, so they didn't need to close their business down. This helped around 690,000 sole traders around Australia, and it meant that they were able to continue in their business. They could hibernate their business if necessary, and then as restrictions eased, they could get back into business. And of course, this time round, it is no different. For sole traders who are currently affected in Queensland, from Saturday, you now have the ability to apply for the COVID disaster payment. Services Australia will open applications on Saturday the 7th of August and claims will start being processed from Sunday the 8th of August. You just need to go through MyGov. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister also advise what individual Australians can do to support our small and family businesses and sole traders and contribute to our economic recovery. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, across Australia, it doesn't matter where we are, supporting our small and family businesses, and in particular those who are affected by the lockdowns, is just so important. So many businesses are still able to keep their presence going via the internet. And so I'd say to anybody across Australia, if you do know a small business uh, that is affected by the lockdown, but they are still able to keep going, uh, it is just so important that we are out there and we're supporting them. Uh, Australians are obviously doing everything they can to help get through this difficult pandemic. However, what we want in particular for our small and family businesses is for them to be operate freely under circumstances as close as normal to possible. And of course, the best way individual Australians can support our small and family businesses and of course thereby contribute to our economic recovery is to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. Getting vaccinated is our path back to normality and the key to our recovery. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the new Minister for uh, Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for in her new role as the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education? 
The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I do thank the Senator uh, for his interest in how our government is supporting those communities right throughout rural and regional Australia recover from natural disasters, respond to um, what is Senator, often— Senator Farrell, on a point of order. Uh, point of order, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, it was a very simple, straightforward question. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for? Um, you reminded the minister of the question. I will take the opportunity that, while I won't judge direct relevance in 15 seconds when the minister is introducing her answer, um, I will remind the minister it was a very factual question uh, and doesn't provide much room for commentary in order to be directly relevant. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, Senator Farrell. I was through you, Mr. President. Was absolutely going to uh, outline all the grant programs that our government is very proud to be able to deliver to the communities who have been affected by flood, by bushfire, and uh, Senator indeed. Farrell on a, Senator McKenzie, I have Senator Farrell on a point of order. Look, I appreciate. I appreciate, I appreciate that this is the first time the minister has had to answer questions since her uh, coming yes, back Senator to Farrell, the position, the but uh, I don't want to know all of the programs that the government has got in the grant uh, area. I want to know how many okay, so this minister Farrell, is responsible I, I, for. I do allow flexibility in making a point when direct relevance, but I do ask that senators draw it to that. Senator McKenzie, this was a factual question asking about programs, um, not rationale or commentary around the programs. Um, the minister is entitled to list programs and be directly relevant or provide the uh, or answer in a form that Senator Farrell would seek, but it's not a place for commentary around programs. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And so I will go through the disaster recovery funding arrangements, the Disaster Resilience Australia package, where the min minister is responsible uh, for the measure, but the um, decisions are delegated to the NRRA. That's $2.1 million uh, for this fin financial year. The Disaster Risk Reduction Package, which is a package to reduce the risk and impact of disasters on Australians in line with our Disaster ri Risk Reduction Framework, its co-funding obviously with the Australian and state and territory governments. Approval for these reports by the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience Agency will trigger in 2021-22 payments to the states and territories in June 2022. Then we've got the Emergency Response Fund. This funding is actually to fund emergency response, natural disaster recovery and preparedness initiatives. Uh, that is also uh, the purvey of the NRRA. Then we have the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program, a $280 million grant program over the next three years, uh, which is actually to assist those communities who have been impacted by bushfires. The Minister for Emergency Management and Recovery, that would be me, uh, is the decision maker. The local economic uh, Order, recovery Order, Senator McKenzie, program. time for the answer has um, expired. Oh. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, I have a further supplementary uh, question. <laughs> Uh, is the minister responsible for any other grant programs in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communication and uh, Regional Education? Bearing in mind my first question related to discre discretionary grant programs. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Local Economic Recovery Program. Uh, where the Coordinator General, uh, whilst it is in my purvey, he and state governments are the final decision makers on that one. The restocking, replanting and on-farm infrastructure grants. Uh, the minister only involved in funding decision if there's a change in the National Partnership Agreement. The Resilient Kids, what a great program. Senator Macdonald and I were able to announce $2 million to school children who've been in flood-affected uh, communities for mental health support. Um, those decisions are part of a national party, uh, the par national partnership agreement, economic diversification over the next three years. Uh, that's nine million dollars, 
uh, again, is covered by the National Partnership Agreement, as is the telecommunications and energy improvement schemes. Uh, management of disaster risk, again, is under the National uh, Partnership uh, Agreement um, reallocation issues. The recovery and resilience Order, grants, Senator which is $20 McKenzie. million. Dollars Senator over Farrell, four. a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And if there are some others that the minister didn't get to answer, then I'd be happy if she um, tabled the documents. But I have a further question. How much funding uh, or budget allocation has been provided to the minister, discretionary or otherwise, in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management, uh, National Recovery and Resilience, and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and reg Regional Education? Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, I will have to get back to you with the totality of the budget allocations. Obviously, my last uh, three weeks, as you can see from the brief time we've had to spend together outlying the programs that I'm responsible for and who makes decisions, I've got a lot more to go through, which I'm happy to uh, give you a private briefing if, if that would assist you. But I think the heart of your question, Senator, might actually be going to the role of ministerial discretion in a Westminster democracy. Now, I'm actually, as I've said on the public record, Ministerial discretion is absolutely key to how our government functions. Ministers should take the advice uh, and recommendations of departments and agencies and then exercise ministerial discretion appropriately. Um, and my ministerial discretion in other programs I've administered resulted in a fairer Order. outcome Senator for Mackenzie, Australian taxpayers. Senator time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, also, Mr. President, um, uh, for the benefit of the Senate, uh, on behalf of Senator Colbeck, I can provide some further information in response to the questions asked by Senator Seward uh, about the publication of the uh, modelling conducted by the Doherty Institute. Uh, I can advise uh, the Senate and uh, through the Senate, Senator Seward. Um, that that modelling is all published and available uh, on the PMNC website. Uh, three particular documents available there. Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, dated 30 July 2021. Addendum to Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, dated 30 July 2021. Uh, and findings and implications of the Doherty Institute COVID-19 modelling presentation. I've got, I'm going to, I'll come to you next. I understand I had Senator Reynolds was going to seek the call about a matter in question time. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. During question time, I took a question on notice from uh, Senator Griff, and I'd like leave to table the response. I don't think you need leave as oh, a minister, will... Senator Reynolds. I'll take it as table. I table, thank there you. Being no other matters, I'll call Senator McKim seeking the call. Uh, yes, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to tax policy in Australia as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator thank, McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to tax policy in Australia may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Mr President, the Australian Greens are disappointed and saddened in the extreme by the recent policy capitulation of the Australian Labor Party, namely that should they win government at the next election, they would not repeal the stage three income tax cuts, they would not make any changes to the current negative gearing arrangements and they would not repeal the capital gains tax concession. This absolute capitulation means that whether it is the Australian Labor Party uh, McKim, or the Liberal— Senator McKim, I remind you and any other senators who may speak in this debate that uh, you, you, the purpose of you moving the motion and speaking to it is to um, inform the Senate of why the matter is urgent, not going to the subject of your motion. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Deputy President. And this matter is urgent because this is a very recent utter policy capitulation by the Australian Labor Party that will have a massive negative effect on everyone except the absolutely wealthy and super wealthy in this country. And it means 
that whether it is uh, the LNP or the ALP that sits on the government benches after the next election, we will see spiralling economic inequality in this country. The rich will get even more rich, and for everyone else, the task of making a good life will be made even harder. This cave-in sells out working people by putting nurses and teachers on the same income tax rate as Senator managers McKim. and consultants who own up to 200,000. Resume your seat, please. I've already drawn to your attention the purpose of this debate is for you to explain to the Senate why the motion is urgent. That's what you need to go to, not the substantive matter of your motion. Senator Wish Wilson. Court of order, Deputy President. Senator McKim did follow your instructions. Um, and so Senator, Senator Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. It's not a debating point. I am simply explaining the standing orders and that require senators to go to the matter of why it's urgent. Thank you, Senator McKim. It is an urgent matter because the Australian Labor Party's policy capitulation sells out working people by putting nurses and teachers on the same income tax rates as managers and consultants on up to $200,000 a year. It sells out anyone who is struggling with the cost of housing by continuing to allow property investors to rack up their third, fourth, fifth, tenth or twentieth investment property with the help of a massive public subsidy. This is urgent because these decisions mean cuts into Senator the future McKim. on essential Senator services McKim. like health and education. Please resume your seat. Please res the purpose of the standing order that you're using is for you to explain to the Senate not to go to the heart of the motion of why it is the Senate must entertain your urgency motion today. And I would ask you to reflect on that for a moment and to go to that substantive matter, not the matter of the motion. Thank you, Senator McKim. The sentence I was uttering when you interrupted me, President, literally started with the words, this is urgent because. That is exactly what I'm doing. It's urgent because it will mean house prices continue to spiral out of control, making more older women homeless uh, and McKim. forcing young Senator people— Senator McKim, please oh, resume please. your seat. Thank you, um, Minister. Deputy President, point of order, because I am concerned that, uh, that Senator McKim is either acting in defiance of your rulings or is not understanding your rulings. The motion before the chamber is one to suspend standing orders. Uh, the debate that you have been seeking to inform Senator McKim that he should be undertaking uh, is one about why it is that the motion itself needs to be considered now and warrants the suspension of standing orders. Just framing your statements uh, with the words, this is urgent because, and then going on to debate the policy substance of the motion he seeks to have debated uh, is not mounting a case in relation to the suspension of standing orders. Uh, and I would uh, uh, thank you, Senator, Deputy President, for your ruling, uh, but certainly urge all senators to understand the nuance of what the question before the chair is and relevance to that particular question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. On the point of order, Chair, if you were to accept uh, the proposition uh, put to you by Senator Birmingham, you would effectively be saying that in order to stay within the bounds of standing orders, no reference at all can be made to the substantive issue. That is patently a ridiculous proposition that Senator Birmingham is putting and would constitute an unnecessary restraint on this debate, and I urge you to reject his point of order. Uh, Senator McKim, I have ruled. Um, it is a rule and it, it's not a debating point. Um, of course, you can reference your motion, but what I've heard you uh, speak to since you got to your feet is only the motion and you have not referenced why it is that this motion is so urgent that we have to stand aside uh, the business of the Senate for today and deal with this motion. That's the issue at heart. It's not for you to immediately go to the motion, but to explain to the Senate what's urgent about it. And I would ask you uh, to respect my ruling and to explain to the Senate 
without uh, a great reference to the actual motion of why it's urgent that this matter be dealt with now. We need to suspend the standing orders because it is urgent that we bring this motion on for debate because of the impact of the Australian Labor Party's policies, which will mean that young people, whether they be renters or prospective homeowners, will need to spend more and more of their income in putting a roof over their head. So why has Labor caved to give tax cuts and tax breaks to the millionaires uh, and McKean, the billionaires. Resume your seat, uh, Senator Scar. Point of order, Deputy President. I mean, you've been quite clear with respect to the application of the standing order. And Senator McKim, I've been listening very closely. I have not heard him say one point in favour of the matter as to why this must be discussed now as a matter of urgency. It is all about general policy points. Thank you, Senator Scar. Um, Senator McKim, you, you started off well uh, about explaining to the Senate why the matter was urgent, and then you did go back to the substantive motion. I'd ask you to continue in the vein of explaining to the Senate why this motion, this, this, the motion you've moved that the Senate deal with the matter now, is the urgency. It's urgent, and we need to suspend standing orders because the planet is cooking and neoliberalism is taking over in this country because every time the Labor Party caves in, the Liberals take the win, move the ground and the contest further to the right. Climate change is critical. It is an urgent issue and it should be debated as a matter of urgency by the Senate. This kind of approach by the Labor Party is how we've ended up in the neoliberal mess that we're in on tax, on housing, uh, on Senator public McKim, subsidies from Senator fossil McKim. fuels. They're very uncomfortable McKim, about this in the Australian Labor Party. Seat. Thank you. Senator Wong. Um, uh, a point of order of relevance. Um, Senator McKim is now not only um, refusing to debate the reason for suspension, he's actually even gone beyond the substantive motion. So we've gone even further and he's laughing. And, you know, I understand. We all understand why you're doing this. A bit of a stunt. Uh, I have to say, I want to express some of our concerns about the treatment by those two male senators of the deputy president in this discussion. I want to register that. Well, I want to register that. I want to register that. Uh, but, well, here we go again. Here we go again. Here we go again. I am registering. Order. Order. You always interrupt us, don't you? I think Senator Hanson Young could teach you something. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator McKim, I was allowing you some leniency to get back to uh, the urgency of explaining to the Senate the urgency of the, stand the suspension that you've sought. Please continue. The urgency, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, sorry, Madam Deputy President. With the absolute greatest of respect to you and your position, uh, and Senator Wong and hers and anyone else in this chamber, is simply that this debate, relate, the debate that we are seeking to bring on, relates to critical and urgent issues in the Australian public conversation. And the point that whenever Labor adopts a small target strategy, the Liberals take the win and move the goalposts further to the right. That is the urgency of this matter. That is why it should be debated by the Senate today, because the Australian people want the Australian Labor Party to stand for something and to stand up for them on these urgent issues that urgently need debating in the chamber today, which is why we should suspend the standing orders to bring on this debate. The only hope for people who want to address spiralling economic inequality in this place is to vote Green because that is the only language that the Australian Labor Party understands. We will fight economic inequality in this country, in the Australian Greens, and we invite the Australian Labor Party to join us and not Thank you, capitulate. Senator McKim. Your time has expired. Minister. Mr. President, I move the question be put. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The question, the question, the question now be put, uh, 
Okay. The question is the motion was by Senator Birmingham. Do you accept it? Beg your pardon. Uh, my apologies. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order. Stop the bells. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the noes.
order, there being 34 ayes and three noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the question now is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Order. So the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Watt as teller for the noes. Uh, we're still waiting for the teller for the eyes. Order, there being three ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just give senators a few moments to resume their seats and uh, for those not participating in taking note to leave the chamber if they so wish. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the question asked by Senator Wong. Uh, and in doing so, I might just make the point that it's very interesting that uh, after a six-week 
recess, the very first thing the Greens decide to do when they come into the chamber is to attack the Labor Party. Um, they don't worry about attacking this government or the LNP or the, things, the government that is actually doing the terrible things to Australia. No, for the Greens, it's always about political stunts targeted at the Labor Party because we know that it's the Labor Party who they consider to be the real enemy. But unlike the Greens, Labor is actually here to defend Australians, no matter where they live, uh, from the incompetence, the bungling and the shambles uh, that we have seen from this Prime Minister and this government in the management of COVID-19. The Prime Minister, when COVID started, and particularly this year, had two jobs to get the vaccine rollout working and to build purpose-built quarantine. Now, we know that he has grossly failed in those two jobs. When it comes to vaccine rollout, we are the last in the developed world. When it comes to quarantine, it will be months, if not years, before we have purpose-built quarantine stations. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, I can't recollect the word quarantine even being used during the whole of question time that we've just been through. So I query whether or not uh, uh, Mr. Watts, Senator Watts in order in terms of the comments he's making. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. It is a wide-ranging debate, and I think uh, it is order. Um, it is uh, Senator what has referred to the vaccine rollout, and that's been the substantive part of his argument. Um, but I will certainly listen closely, and if he doesn't stick uh, in the rest of his time to the debate, I will call his attention to that matter. Thank you, Senator Watt. Thank you, thank you Madam Deputy President. I can assure Senator Scar that there is plenty to talk about when it comes to this government's vaccine rollout failures, but it is worth mentioning in passing uh, that there will be months, if not years, before they build purpose-built quarantine stations. And as a result, we have seen 27 leaks of hotel quarantine from hotel quarantine. So that is the result of this Prime Minister's failures to do his job. And now, because the Prime Minister failed to do his two jobs, vaccine rollout and quarantine, we now see 10 million Australians in lockdown across Sydney and across South East Queensland. And of course, there are many more Australians who are suffering outside of lockdown areas as well. These are the Australians who are paying the price for this Prime Minister and this government's failures to do their job and get the vaccine rollout working and to build purpose-built quarantine. So why are we here? Why are we now at a point where 10 million Australians are in lockdown, with millions more outside lockdown areas also being impacted by this, this government's failures? If you want one sentence to explain why we are in this situation, it is a sentence that we heard over and over again from this Prime Minister. At that, that sentence is, it's not a race. It's not a race. It's not a competition. How many times did we hear that from this Prime Minister and other ministers in this government as Labor was appealing for the government to do more vaccine deal deals, to get more vaccines out to Australians, to build purpose-built quarantine and to do all of the other things necessary to protect the Australian public from the Delta variant that we have now seen raging across so much of Australia. But no, every time Labor tried to suggest things that the government could be doing, just as we're doing today when it comes to incentives, what were we told by the Prime Minister and his his minions, it's not a race, it's not a competition. Well, how wrong they were. Because I can tell you, it was a race. It was always a race. It was a race for the 10 million Australians who are now in lockdown across Sydney and across South East Queensland. It was a race for the businesses who are losing money as a result of this, these lockdowns. It was a race for the workers who are losing their jobs because of the lockdowns, because this government didn't get vaccines out and didn't do its other jobs. It was a race for the families like mine and millions of others in South East Queensland and Sydney who are now homeschooling, who are now unable to do the various things that they would normally do with their families. It was a race for many other people, millions of other Australians outside the lockdown areas who are also suffering because this Prime Minister and this government didn't do their job and get vaccine deals done and get vaccines into people's arms. Only last week, 
I, before the lockdown started in South East Queensland, I was back up in Cairns and Port Douglas meeting with tourism operators, and they were telling me that after, May, after hitting uh, very high hotel occupancy rates in May uh, of around 85 per cent, as soon as the lockdown started in Melbourne and Sydney, their occupancy rates crashed to 30 per cent. Why? Because we didn't have vaccines in, in arms and we therefore had to have lockdowns the minute uh, that the variant started taking control. It was the same in the Gold Coast and other tourism areas as well. Uh, hundreds and thousands of bookings cancelled uh, and putting pe businesses and jobs on the line because this government couldn't do its job. So it was a race. It was a race for the people in lockdown. It was a race for the businesses and workers outside of lockdown areas who are suffering. It was a race for the aged care workers, the disability workers who can't get vaccinated. And it was pretty interesting that even Minister Colbeck wouldn't uh, associate himself with the Prime Minister's remarks. Imagine Richard Thank Colbeck you, being Senator too Watt, embarrassed to stand with you. Expired. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, Senator Watt asked the question, why are so many people in this country in lockdown? And the reason is because of the Delta variant, the Delta variant of the COVID-19 vaccine, of the COVID-19. That's the reason they're in lockdown, because of the Delta 19 variant of the COVID-19 virus. Not for any other reason, because of that reason. And we're seeing all over the world the devastating impact of the Delta variant. It is easy, easy, Madam Deputy President, to stand on the sidelines and throw bricks at those on the field who are making difficult decisions, taking advice from the people they should be taking advice from, from the independent experts, the scientific experts and others, making calls on the run. It's easy to stand on the sideline and throw bricks at people who are making difficult decisions in difficult timelines. The fact of the matter is that when you look at the results of the vaccine rollout, the most recent results, they are quite staggering, quite incredible actually. When you consider the fact, Madam Deputy President, that one million doses were first issued in 45 days, and we've now reached the position, we've now reached the position where more than a million doses, more than a million doses are being given of the vaccine, whether it be AstraZeneca, whether or not it's Pfizer, more than a million doses are being given every six days, every six days. So it took 45 days for a million doses, and now it's taking six days for a million doses. The rollout has progressively increased. A million doses, 45 days, two million doses, 20 days, three million doses, 17 days. You can see the increase. You can see the increase in the doses which are being provided. And we're now at a situation, thankfully, thankfully, we are now in a situation where almost 80 per cent, probably now over 80 per cent, of over 70s are protected with the first dose of a vaccine. That most vulnerable cohort, that most vulnerable cohort in our community, over 80 per cent are protected with one, at least one dose of the vaccine. 41.98 per cent have received a second dose. More than 65 per cent of my cohort of over 50s are protected with a first dose and 26.67 per cent have received a second dose. So we're actually seeing a, we've seen a phenomenal increase in the rollout of this vaccine in a context, in a context where this is a global pandemic, a one in 100 years global pandemic, with different variations, variants of the virus developing over time, posing new challenges, and the Delta variant has pr proposed has presented a number of unique challenges in terms of how quickly it spreads. And can I say to those opposite, not only shouldn't you be throwing bricks at our Prime Minister, but you shouldn't be throwing bricks at the Premier of New South Wales either. Again, again, that Premier is on the field, making decisions in real time, taking advice from everyone who she considers is appropriate to give her advice, and sometimes the result's not perfect. Sometimes the result's not perfect. And it wouldn't be perfect no matter who was in the position of Premier of New South Wales or Prime Minister of Australia. It wouldn't be perfect no matter who was in that position. And that's a factor, that's a factor of the actual situation which we're facing at the moment. It's a dynamic situation, a one in 100 year situation, a global pandemic. And the best, the most reasonable, the most reasonable way of assessing the success or otherwise of the federal government is to compare the situation in Australia to that overseas. And who can legitimately say, who can reasonably say in this place that Australia hasn't 
done better than any other country in the world in terms of those two key measurements, protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. We've done better than any other country on the face of the earth. And if those opposite can think of somewhere else that's done better in terms of protecting lives and protecting livelihoods, then tell us who it is, because I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is. Protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. This country has done an exceeding job, and I pay tribute to all of our decision makers. And I don't care which party they come from. The people who are on the field making decisions in real time in, challenging, in a challenging situation a one in 100 years global pandemic, different variations of the virus developing all the time and making the best decisions they can in good faith in, in confronted in those circumstances. And I think, uh, I think as Australians get more confidence with the vaccine, I was so pleased today the Chief Health Officer of Queensland has, issued, uh, has reflected on her opinion with respect to AstraZeneca and hopefully we'll have more Thank and more you, vaccines Scar, your issued. Time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. Well, let's compare ourselves to overseas. What Senator Scar didn't do was compare ourselves to overseas when it comes to vaccine rollout. Uh, we're actually 36 out of 38 on the OECD. So we're actually coming almost last when it comes to our vaccine rollout. And there's two things we learned in question time today, and that is that they still won't set a deadline on vaccine rollout. They still won't set a deadline on vaccine rollout. And we know why because every time they have set one, they've missed it. So they've actually given up on it and they won't provide those incentives. And we've seen a pitiful uh, display from uh, the senior levels of this government today um, when Labor put forward a really practical solution and they're happy to take pot shots at it without putting forward any sort of practical solutions themselves. But they won't set a deadline and we saw that in question time today with the answers given. But we know why they won't set a deadline, because they originally said four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, and they failed to meet that. Uh, Mr Morrison previously said all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October. Obviously, we're going to miss that. He said they would vaccinate the first priority group by Easter, and they've missed that deadline. And they would vaccinate six million Australians by the 10th of May. So when it comes to vaccines, they've actually given up. They actually aren't setting any deadlines because they know they can't meet them and they're not creating the incentives for Australians to go out and get vaccinated. And even when uh, the Labor leader put forward a substantial suggestion today, the government have done nothing but take pot shots at that, which is so disappointing. They show uh, no um, ability to adapt or be nimble uh, and actually deliver for the Australian people. And they still won't accept the second thing that we learned from Question Time is they still won't accept responsibility. Uh, and anyone who would have seen Four Corners last night laid out uh, how responsible the government are for the failure to deliver. And as uh, Kevin Rudd said, they wouldn't pick up the Graham Alexander Bell and talk to the head of Pfizer to try and get more vaccines delivered to this country. So it is uh, having a devastating impact on. Uh, South East Queensland at the moment, we've seen what's happening in New South Wales, 10 million Australians locked down. Um, the damage this does economically as well, I think the RBA estimated there's about $300 million a day that is being taken away from these economies because of what is going on in these communities. Uh, and it is absolutely the failure of the vaccine rollout that is going to deliver. And we saw that with the release of the Doherty report today. It says uh, what we can achieve um, if we actually had the vaccine rollout as compared to what is happening in other countries. But it also goes to, and as Senator Watts said, it also goes to the quarantine, faci quarantine facilities, because they did have two responsibilities. Uh, one was around vaccines, the second one was around quarantine facilities. And they haven't delivered on those as well. And about a month ago, the federal Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, and myself went to Toowoomba and we met with the proponents of the WellCamp proposal around quarantine facilities. They said they could be operating within 12 weeks, set up a purpose-built quarantine facility within 12 weeks. Yet the government keep moving the goalposts, changing the rules to rule out doing some sort of uh, deal with uh, proponents in Toowoomba. And what they've instead said is that they would look at doing something at Damascus, uh, near, Pink near the Brisbane airport. But that isn't going to be operating till next year. Uh, we've seen all these leaks—I think we're up to 28 now—leaks out of hotel quarantine, quarantine facilities, yet we haven't had one leak out of Howard Springs in the Northern Territory. 
and the Toowoomba proposal would be similar to that Howard Springs proposal. So it shows you that these facilities that are purpose-built can work and deliver. And who knows, if we actually had that facility, we might be having the lockdown that we've had in South East Queensland this week. So this question time, again, it's the first question time we've had for about six weeks, but it's still the same old excuses from the government. Uh, they won't set a deadline on getting Australians vaccinated. They still won't set, accept responsibility for the failure of the, quarant of the vaccine rollout. And when you look at the devastation that this is causing across Australia, uh, it is the Australian families, Australian workers, uh, indeed those kids that are now doing homeschooling that are paying the price for the incompetence of this government. Um, so I'd say to the government they need to get their act together, they need to start setting deadlines that they will stick to, and they need to ensure that the Australian people have confidence that the vaccine rollout uh, is going to be available, that people will be able to get their shots, um, that they will then be able to avoid lockdowns so that the economy can return to normal as much as possible. Um, again, it was a failure from this government to answer any of those questions today. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I rise to uh, respond to some of these extraordinary comments made by those on the other side, but I do reflect on how incredibly fortunate we are that we are going through a global pandemic and not a war, because Australians expect their leadership, their politicians, their representatives to stand together to find solutions to difficult times. And yet, once again, we have listened to uh, the opposition describe a complete lack of understanding to the reality of the world, an inability to stand shoulder to shoulder in difficult times and instead take every opportunity to throw stones because there has been no manual, no manual to the COVID pandemic. And instead, we find uh, the opposition trying to find ways of demonstrating how clever they would be now that they have the benefit of hindsight. Just brilliant. Uh, one of the senators just spoke about the 27 leaks from hotel quarantine, but no leaks from the federally operated Howard Springs. They also mentioned that there has not been a, a uh, fast enough rollout of the vaccine. So I would like to speak about what's been happening in my state, in the great state of Queensland, because the greatest impediment to vaccinating Queenslanders has been our own Labor state government. In fact, Queensland Health did not order any AstraZeneca vaccines in July and only 1,000 doses in May. How extraordinary is that? Because despite the chief health officer making uh, extraordinary pronouncements about AstraZeneca in the face of uh, worldwide recommendations to take advice from your medical practitioner. We have had uh, no, case, no AstraZeneca ordered in July. So Queenslanders are not being given the opportunity to consult with their doctor on what decision is best for them. Uh, in fact, I think the vaccine hesitancy in Queensland can be, can be sheeted back to some of this messaging. Queensland has the second lowest rate of fully vaccinated people at just over 18 per cent and the lowest rate of people who have had one dose at just under 37 per cent. Anecdotally, in my home city of Townsville, some young people say they have tried six times to be vaccinated and been turned away due to a lack of supply of Pfizer, even when they were happy and had, been consulted, and had consulted and were able to have AstraZeneca. Queensland Health stats as of yesterday, Monday, 591 people received a dose at the new Townsville vaccination station, but not one person received the vaccination from hospitals and health centres across the entire Townsville region. Not one person. The air population, 8,700 8, people, but just 796 shots provided in total, none yesterday. And Ingham, 4,300 people, just 677 shots provided, zero yesterday. 
Chartist Towers, population of 8,100, just 627 total do doses administered, but none yesterday. The opposition is also going to talk about consulting with tourism operators in Cairns and Townsville, the very areas that were on their knees because the state government refused to reduce or increase the number of people allowed into the space from four per, one person for, per four square metres to one person per two square metres, as it was on the mainland if you were going out on cruise boats and other charter vessels. Uh, these meant that these businesses were unviable far longer than they were in other states. Uh, they also talked about homeschooling and how difficult that is for parents, and it is. And the reason why we know that is because we have geographically isolated children right across this nation, which Labor never ever seems to reflect on or remember. But what has Labor come up with is a cash for jabs program. Now this is our latest version of pink bats, of school halls, and another example of Labor taking Australian taxpayers' money, but not, but not improving the safety or the position for Australian people. Senator, oh, the question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate take note of responses to the question asked by Senator Seward. You can speak to that, Senator McKim. I think Senator Seward is seeking the call. Oh, sorry. Senator Seward is on the call. Sorry. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take note sorry, I, I, I didn't. So I'll, I'll just pause. It's not your fault, Senator Seward. Um, yeah, I didn't have a list, so I didn't see anyone seeking the call. With the leave of the Senate, can I reverse the motion I put the, uh, of Senator Watt and call Senator Sheldon to speak to that motion, and then I'll go to Senator McKim and Senator Seward. Yeah. Senator Sheldon. I, I, we skipped one. But thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Let's go. I move that the Senate take note of answers provided by the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I just want to, before I make a few comments, more comments about um, what has happened during this debate today, it just seems absolutely outrageous that we've got people not being vaccinated. We've got people in Sydney and Melbourne, the country's highest vaccination rates are the wealthiest pockets while poorer parts of Sydney's west and south, hit hardest by the latest outbreak, have been among the lowest coverage in New South Wales. Of course, let's just go a little bit further too, because while well, parts of outbreak Australia are also lagging behind with fewer than 10% of the population in some regional areas being fully vaccinated, more than five months into the rollout. Has there ever been a more damaging display of negligence in Australian history than the Prime Minister's vaccine stroll out? More than 10 million Australians are in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland. Lockdowns are costing the Australian economy nearly $300 million each day. While countries around the world are opening up, Australia is shutting down. This is because of the Prime Minister's insistence that vaccine rollout is not a race. Well, Prime Minister Morrison had two jobs this year, a speedy and effective rollout of the vaccine and quarantine, and he has monumentally failed both. Having failed, the Morrison government must now ensure it does not also fail to support Australian workers, with, uh, people without work, particularly those in sectors which have been hardest hit, such as aviation. Unfortunately, this is precisely what is happening. Aviation workers have been through 18 months of hell, and today they have received the latest kick in the guts. Australia's highest paid CEO, Alan Joyce, has announced he'll be standing down 2,500 Qantas and Jetstar workers without pay. The Morrison government has had more than 18 months to come up with a plan for the survival and recovery of Australian aviation keeping the skill sets there that are so vital. The Qantas announcement came also just hours after the government had announced a program to provide COVID support payments to some aviation workers. The payments will only go to 50% of stood down pilots and crew. There are no payments for any other aviation workers. And our Prime Minister may not be aware. 
but there are thousands of other aviation workers who keep our planes in the air, including many of them that live in your electorate, raising their families and supporting their community. How about you start listening to those people from your own electorate, Prime Minister? There are thousands of ground crew who have been carved out of uh, Mr Morrison's aviation support, many of whom will now be stood down by Qantas without pay, without any plan from the government, and has held and any plan on how to put food on the table. It just happens that the same workers that have been abandoned by the Morrison government have also been illegally abandoned by Qantas. The federal court on Friday found that the Qantas had broken the law when it outsourced 2,000 ground handling jobs last year. It was a massive victory for those 2,000 essential workers and the transport workers union. But how does the Morrison respond to the decision? turns around and cuts ground staff out of the aviation support package. So who is really calling the shots in this country when it comes to aviation? Alan Joyce received $2 billion from the Prime Minister. We asked for it, he gets it. Alan Joyce asked for that money not to be no strings attached so that he can outsource 2,500 jobs. And the Prime Minister gives that to him. The vindictive Alan Joyce wants to take revenge on those workers for beating him in court, and the Prime Minister cuts them out of the aviation support package. How's that for the spirit of Australia? Quite clearly, we've seen a number of examples of the horrific nature of uh, what's been happening with this rollout. We see less than 5% of home care workers now covered by, um, by uh, vaccinations. And of course, the government's response is, it's not a focus. Well, 85% of our aged are supported by home care workers. It's another failing by this government because it has not got the vaccinations in place. It's not a race. Order, Senator I'll put difference. the motion moved by Senator Watt. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll take it. Senator McKim, you have moved the motion to take note of the answer to the question asked by Senator Seawitt and call Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I take note of the answer from the Minister, from Minister Colbeck to my questions around the Doherty modelling around vaccinations uh, rates and the transition, the, uh, how it relates to the phases of transition out of um, the current situation. I was extremely disappointed in the Minister's answer for a number of reasons. He, the government clearly, or he himself, had not him, equated himself with uh, the Grattan Institute report, which is uh, very important to this discussion. We know that shifting from an effective strategy of zero community transmission to one of removing restrictions and opening up our borders are based on high levels of vaccination. It has to be one of the most important and is one of the most important decisions that this country will make. To set too low targets which risks surging hospitalisations and deaths of thousands of people will, is deeply concerning. And we need to make sure that we are properly basing our decisions on scientific modelling that needs to be used to inform our target decisions. And what the government's done and what the minister was basically saying in answer to uh, my questions was the Doherty Institute has done the modelling and that's it. Well, the Grattan Institute has done some modelling too, and I'm sure other institutes have as well. How about we look at that? The Doherty Institute uh, modelling is based on ages above the, those that are currently um, eligible for vaccinations, above the ages of 16, for example. Now, if you look at, compare the, compare the two uh, predict, uh, models, Grattan suggests that a vaccination target of 80% of the whole population, in other words, from children 12 up, is necessary to avoid overwhelming the health system and also uh, stopping infections and uh, deaths. Now, if you look at their modelling, the 80% the government's now using, or National Cabinet's decided on, based on over 16, is actually a population target of 65%. If you then go to looking at the 70%, as I said in my, or asked in my question to the minister, it, that actually relates to 
56% of the pop of the entire population if you include children over the age of 12. So my question then to the minister was, well, why aren't you including them? His answer was, we're including the some that are children that are now vulnerable, uh, eligible, which is good, but it's not that population, not just the uh, vulnerable children that need to be vaccinated to make sure that we are not opening Australia up to uh, wildly uh, optimistic targets, which uh, will then risk our health system and most importantly, risk people's lives, increase the number of deaths that occur, but also we need to remember the issue around long COVID. So even if you, some people thought we should accept some people catching COVID, nearly a million people under a 50% scenario are predicted to catch COVID, you've got, not only does that have a very uh, large impact, obviously on our health system, but it risks a lot of people having long COVID. We've seen from the outbreaks in New South Wales and in Queensland, the children who are now catching the Delta variant. They are transmitting the Delta variant. It is very important that we are vaccinating and ensuring that we have targets that are actually will ensure that we can get to the point where we can safely transition out. The Doherty Institute uh, modelling also does not talk about issues around getting to the point where we uh, fully open our international borders, which the Grattan Institute does. Now, I think the government needs to be ensuring that they are fully taking into consideration all of the modelling that is occurring. Have a good look at the Grattan Institute uh, modelling. I can't believe that the minister had not looked at alternative modelling to ensure that we are making sure that these decisions, which I think we all agree, are some of the most important that, that a government and a parliament will make in terms of how we transition out of uh, both lockdowns, but how we transition to what people um, regard as normal. Order, More Senator Seward. I'll put the motion now by Senator McKim. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted, Senator Urquhart. <clears throat> I'm, oh, sorry, I've jumped there, jumped it, haven't I? Leave's been granted, Senator. Urquhart. I actually do, do have it, some yeah. notices of motion to withdraw. So, would you prefer me to do that now, or do the leave and then I'll we'll just come do to the, the leave. Notices. Okay. Um, I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senators Keneally, Shikoni, Kitching, Green, Billick, McAllister, Sheldon, Ayres, Dodson, McCarthy, Gallacher, Marielle Smith, Walsh and Polly for 3rd to the 5th of August for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, I'll go to Senator Urquhart for notices and then I'll come to you, Senator McKim. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I withdraw business of the Senate number one in the name of Senator Kitching and uh, General Business 1169 in the name of Senator McAllister. Thank you. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absences. Leave is granted. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators, Senators Waters, Seward, Rice, Thorpe, Steelejohn and Faruqi for 3rd to 5th of August for COVID-related reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators also. Leave granted. It is Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 3rd to 5th of August 2021. Senator Colbeck for returned international traveller quarantine compliance. Senators Bragg for Avanti Wells and Stoker for COVID-19 travel restrictions. Senator Molan for medical reasons and Senators Abet, Antic, Fawcett, Griff, Hanson, Henderson, McLaughlin for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business and call. Oh, sorry, Senator McKim. I, my bad. Are we on uh, general business? Not yet. Oh, my we'll bad. be there sorry. soon. Thank you. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business and I'll call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. 
Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Waters from 4 August to 25 August. Business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Rice from today to 5 August. Business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Patrick from today to 4 August. Business of the Senate number six, standing in the name of Senator Waters from today to 4 August. Uh, and general business notice of motion number 1185, standing in the name of Senator Rice from today to 9 August. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I now come to the discovery of formal business. The clerk would like to read out one more. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 on today's order of business. I repeat, the, um, remind senators the question may be put on any of those proposals at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall move on to the discovery of formal business. I understand the business of the Senate 4 and 5 are to be debated later. So that leaves two matters. I have general business mo notice of motion number 361 in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. Um, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 361, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to enable Australia to impose sanctions to promote compliance with international human rights law and respect for human rights or to deter significant corruption and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. I present the bill and move that this bill uh, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator. Oh, sorry, the clerk. A bill for an act to enable Australia to impose sanctions to promote compliance with international human rights law and respect for human rights or to deter significant corruption and for related purposes. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Urquhart. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1186 in the name of Senator Rice be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Um, a very different Tuesday. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 12 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator O'Neill. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Prime Minister's failure to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, meaning Australians remain dangerously exposed to the highly infectious Delta variant with the lowest vaccination rate in the developed world. I under, um, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, Australians are paying the price for Mr. Morrison's complacency. And today, as we meet here in the Senate, millions of, of Australians, those in New South Wales, in Queensland, are in lockdown. And there are two reasons why. Mr Morrison failed to listen to warnings to establish safe, fit-for-purpose national quarantine, just like he failed to listen to bushfire warnings two years ago. And the other reason is he completely failed to deliver a plan to get us out of the pandemic. Whilst governments around the world raced to secure supplies of vaccines to inoculate their populations, Mr Morrison's government had a wait-and-see approach. Reports from industry publication by Pharma Dispatch have indicated that last year it was an open secret in the pharmaceutical industry that there was exasperation over the government's lack of urgency, the Morrison government's lack of urgency in securing vaccine supplies for Australians. 
They reported that whilst other countries to do, rushed to do deals, the industry was constantly told that the Morrison government is not ready to procure or engage in discussions about procuring the vaccine. Can you believe that? Other countries are off doing deals, and our government is telling the pharmaceutical industry constantly end quote, that they are not ready to procure or engage in discussions about procuring the vaccine. It was, it was a wait-and-see approach. A wait and see approach, business as usual. I mean, even under President Trump, the American vaccine was called Operation Warp Speed. Well, no Operation Warp Speed for this Prime Minister. He preferred wait and see because remember, it's not a race. It's not a race. It's not a race. Of course, he only said it's not a race as an excuse for his, the growing de delays in his vaccine rollout. And he needed that excuse. He needed that excuse because, la because last year he said Australia would be at the front of the international queue. Do you remember that? I promise Australians they'll be at the front of the queue. We're at the front of the queue. And when he said to Australians that we were at the front of the queue, he knew that other countries, many other countries, had ordered their vaccines months ahead of us. Months ahead of us. He said Australians would be at the front of the queue even though he only got around to ordering Pfizer in November, months later, months after other countries had ordered theirs, and then he only ordered enough for five million Australians. This Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has made so many excuses, but all roads lead back to him. He put all his eggs in one basket, the AstraZeneca basket, and he did that despite it being well established that best practice is to have a range of options. And really, it's more than that, isn't it? It's common sense. Mr Bowen, who was then the Shadow Health Minister, was saying in the middle of last year that world's best practice was to have four to six vaccine deals. But as per normal, Mr Morrison was too arrogant to listen, always insisting he knows best. Too arrogant to listen, always insisting he knows best. And when it became clear to everyone he had once again dropped the ball and failed to deliver, he said, oh, no, but it's not a race. It's not a competition. But Australians know, and Australians knew, it's always been a race to beat this virus. Because until we have Australians vaccinated, lives, jobs, the economy and the recovery are at risk. And while Australians ran the ever greater risk of infection with COVID-19, the government's response to that risk was infected by the Mr Morrison's complacency. Now lockdowns are being made necessary by his failures. And they are costing the economy around $300 million a day. And this is the price that small business and working Australians are paying for Mr Morrison's incompetence. And his competence hasn't been limited to the vaccine rollout and to quarantine. He's pressured premiers not to go into lockdown when clearly they needed to. As recently as June, Mr Morrison publicly pressured the Premier of New South Wales not to go into lockdown at the start of this outbreak, even though at the time he said this, there was already ample evidence from around the world of the dangers of the Delta variant, which was also the reason for the outbreak, the driver of the outbreak in New South Wales. And remember what he said. I commend the Premier of New South Wales. I commend the New South Wales Premier for the fact that she hasn't gone to lock down Australia's biggest city. Then yesterday he said, oh, the only way to get on top of these things and ensure, ensure you don't have longer lockdowns is to move quickly. As always with Mr Morrison, his story changes from week to week. You can't rely on him. He just blows with the political wind. He was dead against locking down Bondi and now the rest of Sydney and beyond are paying the price. Now we know there are chronic supplies of the supply of vaccines under this government. But there is more we can do to encourage all Australians to sign up to get vaccinated. And today, continuing his approach of offering constructive solutions to the COVID crisis, Mr Albanese put forward another positive proposal, a $300 one-off payment for all Australians to, who are fully vaccinated by December 1st. And it's a good idea, not just because it provides an incentive to get vaccinated, but it also delivers a critical shot in the arm for businesses and workers who are struggling from ongoing lockdowns—$300 million a day. A simple, practical idea that can make a big difference. And you know what? We actually know this government's already been considering what incentives they can offer. You know, this was indicated in their own COVID response plan when their chief medical officer has said, and I'll quote, 
We really do need to look for. Oh, I've lost the page. Sorry, we really do need to look for incentives. This is from Mr. Mr. Kelly. We really do need to look for incentives, as many incentives as we can, for people to become vaccinated. There was obviously a little footnote. Unless Anthony Albanese supports it, unless he proposes it. So the medical advice is we really do need to look for incentives, as many incentives as we can, for people to become vaccinated. And that's based on the simple reality of how hard it is to get that last surge of vaccines that we will need if we are to avoid or minimise the risk of future lockdowns. And we know from the government's own backgrounding of the media they were considering giving people frequent flyer points and discount vouchers. So you'd think they'd have little to quibble about with Mr Albanese's proposal. And yet, just as he dismissed arrogantly Labor's proposal for wage subsidies before he finally introduced JobKeeper, and just as he arrogantly dismissed Labor's call for more vaccine deals, which he clearly should have done, Mr Morrison has arrogantly dismissed this idea today. You see, with this bloke, it's always politics first. He's much more interested in scoring political points than doing the right thing. See, the core proposition he seems to be putting forward is financial incentives don't work. That's big news to everybody here and big news to anyone who has ever had a job. It's an extraordinary and a bizarre claim. And it is so because what he says changes depending on his political circumstances. Because can anyone imagine the leader of the party that claims to be about enterprise saying that financial reward is bad? You see, people understand incentives do work. Mr Morrison knows incentives work. And there are two possible explanations for him being so arrogantly dismissive of the idea to give financial incentives for Australians to be all vaccinated by December the 1st. Is it just that they're so stubborn about playing politics that if Mr Albanese says it, they dismiss it? Or is it they don't have enough vaccine supply to get Australians fully vaccinated by December the 1st? Today, Mr Morrison claimed he wasn't going to offer financial reward. He said that's not the Australian way. Well, this bloke is in no place to define the Australian way. Because I tell you what, most Australians think our way is to be straight with people, to own up to your mistakes, to put the country's interests ahead of your own personal political interests. So just for once, just for once, could Mr Morrison put politics aside? Because yet again, what we see, he is still more interested in his short-term political interests than the national interests, more interested in scoring political points than helping people, more interested in making excuses for his own failures than winning for Australia. And the result is nearly half our country in lockdown. And the result is that in the race to be vaccinated against this deadly virus, Australia is last in the developed world. Uh, thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I mean, those opposite, you guys like seriously must be hating on the Olympics. You must be hating the fact that we're doing so well and that Australians are being represented by these fantastic athletes that are continuing to do our country proud because there is seriously nothing. You guys can't knock down discredit and quite plainly misrepresent when it comes to our great nation. I mean, this persistent cry, I mean, why do you hate Australia? Seriously, this persistent cry from those opposite about the vaccine rollout, all whilst out there contributing, contributing and aiding and abetting and pushing Order, it along, sir. vaccine Order. hesitancy, confusion, Order. misinformation. Order continuing to spread Order. that, you guys need to have a really, really good hard look at yourselves and start to get on board with Team Australia. Because quite Order frankly, you're left. just making it up. Making it up. And you know, this claim that we're at the bottom, the world ranking when it comes to the vaccination rate is actually wrong. But I mean, I understand for those of you opposite that maths isn't exactly your strong suit. So perhaps that lesson when they taught you how to read graphs, you might have been absent or chatting away or looking at what the big government and the unions were supposed to tell you to do and what you needed to think. 
Because when you see countries like New Zealand underneath our vaccination rate, that means that Australia is not at the bottom. But perhaps it's this inability to read graphs and interpret data is why you guys are unable to recognise a really important graph, a really important graph that continues to show Australia at the bottom, but in this instance, it's in the, at, at the bottom of rates of death by COVID. Now, I would have thought that was a pretty good graph to be at the bottom of, but I'm not sure you guys have even seen it, let alone can understand it. But can you imagine had we not had the failure of the Andrews government last year? where he absolutely was culpable for multiple and hundreds, hundreds of deaths. Imagine without his failed effort where we would be. I mean, just unbelievable success when it comes to COVID death rates across Australia. But of course, you guys aren't interested in any of that, aren't interested in any of the economic success, aren't interested in any of the lives and livelihoods that were saved. For you, there's never been a scare campaign you don't like. But back to the vaccine rollout, the ALP, if they have any integrity, but I guess I need to spell that word for you, you need to stop this disgraceful misinformation campaign around AstraZeneca. If it wasn't so serious, it would be entertaining. I mean, the member for Maribyrnong, the member for Maribyrnong, order, a man please. whose leadership order aspirations remain strong, remain strong. The order beating of the drum left, for Senator Albanese, Neil. the beating of Senator the drum. Neil, please. But as order. the member for Maribyrnong proudly tweeted a photo of his second AZ shot before question time today, showing his support for this effective Australian-made vaccine confirming that the Doherty Institute today has confirmed that, in fact, AstraZeneca is just as effective as Pfizer. So I asked the opposition leader, is it purely in a bid to create a point of difference between you and the member of Maribyrnong that you continue to withhold support for AstraZeneca? Is that why, when you're asked to support this Australian-made vaccine, you avoid responding, you worm and weasel your way around the question? But if this is not bad enough, not irresponsible enough behaviour from the man who apparently aspires to put himself forward as the alternative Prime Minister of, of this fantastic nation. He's not just happy feeding into this vaccine misinformation campaign. He's now out there ensuring that the ALP goes to the next election with as many vaccine scaremongers, misinformation merchants and, quite frankly, fantasists as candidates. So we've seen with the pre-selection of Dr Michelle Ananda Raja in the seat of Higgins, the ALPs now confirmed, well, we all knew, we all knew it already, that they are more interested in political point scoring, in driving division and wedges between Australians, scaring vulnerable cohorts. Shame on all of you. But of course, the absolute worst of these scaremongers and spreaders of misinformation is none other than the Queensland Chief Health Officer, now rebuked by pretty much every epidemiologist in the country, in fact, pretty much anyone with a medical degree. So that wouldn't include uh, some of the commentators that we regularly see on the ABC. But, you know, if the Queensland Premier is so wedded to reward this woman, who has com shown complete lack of compassion at every opportunity, who's divided and destroyed families and kept them apart, who's spread misinformation, but's never seen a film star or a footballer she won't give a special exemption for at the first opportunity. Let's just make her governor now. Get her in there. Get her out of the public view. Get her out of giving information to Queenslanders about what vaccine they should get, because she clearly doesn't know what she's talking about, and making ridiculous and, quite frankly, stupid claims. But unlike those opposite, with all of this in mind, the grown-ups are actually here working towards increasing vaccination rates because we know that's how the country will open back up. And perhaps Senator O'Neill would be better spending her time on her internal pre-selection rather than bothering to spread this pathetic propaganda. But for those that are actually interested in the reality of the vaccine rollout, 
how many jabs have actually been given to Australians, we know that now more than 12 million jabs have been administered. But we also know now that more than one million jabs are being delivered and administered into the arms of Australians every single week. So we've done 12 million today. We're doing over one million per week going forward, but not happy over there. Now, like every country around the world, there has been some bumps along the way because this is unprecedented times. And I know those opposite have perfect hindsight, 2020 vision, and of course, have we all listened to them when they had nothing to say, but of course, then have every criticism in the world after, everything would be great. Imagine how good things would be with $387 billion worth of new taxes they wanted to introduce. Thank God they didn't get the opportunity after the last election. But every country around the world experienced a couple of bumps, experienced a, a, the, the vaccine rollouts. The pace picked up as it was rolled out. It was slower at the beginning, and then it continued to exponentially grow. And there were some issues. The PMs acknowledged this. Doesn't hide, doesn't weasel his way around why he won't support AstraZeneca. PMs actually acknowledged that there were some issues at the beginning. And some were well and truly out of our control. I realise you don't acknowledge that. Like, you know, when Victoria had problems, that was the PM's issue, or there was no issue because it was Dan Andrews, but now it's in New South Wales, it's all Gladys's fault, and what's not Gladys's fault, Scott's fault. And, you know, you guys just can't quite get it together. But we've seen these issues resolved. We've seen supply increase. There's actually, you know, an excess supply of AstraZeneca to the point that we're sending it overseas. To the point that the Queensland Chief Health Commissioner decided, to, Chief Health Officer decided she didn't even want them. They've kind of changed that position now. But you know, there's AstraZeneca available. And so now we have seen over four and a half million vaccinations given in July. Now, for those of you that don't understand how the rollout has exponentially increased, the four and a half million vaccines that were delivered in July was more than double than what was delivered in May. So May, and then we have June, and then we have July, for those of you not paying attention in school. And so within those couple of months, we saw an over-doubling of the number of vaccines being delivered from 2.1 million to 4.5 million. So when those opposite like to talk about supply issues, when they're talking about stagnation in the vaccine rollout, aside from the fact they're fundamentally living in the past, but let's face it, they always pretty much do cling to those old days. But aside from everything I said earlier and the disgraceful behaviour of your chief health officers in Queensland, when you've got all your little cash for comment epidemiologists popping up on the ABC, half of them without even relevant qualifications, they're not even epidemiologists out there talking down AstraZeneca and then you guys racing out to make sure that they're your candidates. There is no supply issue. You need to stop scaring people about AstraZeneca. There's plenty available. We make it here. Why don't you support Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, we have Senator Seawert on, on the big screen. Order, please, Senator Seawert. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Yes, please proceed. I uh, wish to contribute to the, to the debate on the Prime Minister's failure to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID of COVID-19 vaccines, meaning Australians remain dangerously exposed today to the highly infectious Delta variant with the lowest vaccination, vaccination rate in the developed world. As people have called it, this is definitely a stroll out of our vaccine rollout across this country. We were in an excellent position before, just before the rollout occurred. We could be so much further ahead if the government had not squandered our advantage in this stroll out of a vaccination process. Billions have been spent on trying to get this rollout fixed, contract after contract, and yet we are still seeing the lowest vaccination uh, rates in the developed world. The Morrison government's rollout today has been characterised by chaos and incompetence. We've witnessed a rollout that has been plagued by constant supply issues, poor messaging and a lack of transparency. Try to get the information 
that Australians want and we can't. We've seen that through the COVID committee time and again. Every step of the way, we have had to beg for data, information and action from this government. Across Australia, people have been left confused, angry and disappointed. The vaccination targets that were released last, last Friday raise even more questions. If we are going to get 80% coverage by March 2022, we need to include children over 12 years. The TGA has already approved the use of, the, of Pfizer in four kids over 12. So why weren't kids over 12 included in the vaccination <laughs> targets? It just, it just boggles my mind that we have not included children over 12 in those targets. The government is aiming for 70% of people aged 16 and over to get vaccinated. But this only equates to 56% of the entire population. The Grant Institute, Institute predicts if we reopen at 50% vaccination coverage, then we will see nearly 900,000 cases of COVID. Our hospitals, our ICU wards will be overwhelmed. We can't afford to play these sorts of politics with people's lives. As the government fails to meet its own targets around vaccinating vulnerable populations, we've also seen vaccine inequity emerging. As of the 1st of August 2021, only 24% of First Nations peoples have received <laughs> at least one dose of their vaccine. This is unacceptable when every, everybody agrees that First Nations communities are particularly vulnerable and they were supposed to be prioritised. I'd hate to see the situation if in fact they weren't prioritised, if this is what the government calls prioritising things. Scientists have been warning us for a long time about the emergence of variants, yet we seemed unprepared when Delta hit us in this country. We still haven't adapted. We don't have fit for purpose quarantine facilities or the ability to produce M mRNA vaccines here yet. We need to be doing better. We need to be ensuring that we are in a race, a very fierce race to ensure that we get 80% of our entire population vaccinated as soon as possible. We have no dates, we have no proper dates, no proper timeline for when the government's new approach and new plan is going to be is going Your to target to that plan. Your time has expired, Senator Seward. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I think the Australian people are now very well aware that Mr. Morrison had two critical jobs. Mr. Morrison and his government, and all the people who were sitting on the Treasury benches, had two critical jobs, and that was to deliver both vaccination for Australians and quarantine that didn't leak. And they failed absolutely on both fronts. And today I'm really pleased that we can actually put on record in this place the facts of what the Australian community have been experiencing, suffering, worrying about in the period since we last sat in this parliament, particularly, particularly the people from the great state of New South Wales that I'm so proud to represent here in this parliament. So many, so many in my community, so many across Sydney, locked down, businesses gone, never to come back. A total failure of governing this country because they forgot to do two critical things, get the vaccine and sort out quarantine. They failed on both. Today's matter of public importance, though, is a particular focus on the impact of the government's failure, the Prime Minister's failure, to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19. And I have to wonder what on earth Mr Morrison was doing in June last year, June 2020, when Pfizer came knocking on the door of Australia and the man who was supposed to be in charge, the man who will be in front of a microphone again tomorrow, delighted by the sound of his own voice, Mr Morrison was probably standing up in front of a microphone back then, like he will be again, instead of doing his real job, his day job, the job of actually doing the work of government 
considering carefully what needs to be undertaken for the people of Australia. Instead of somebody thinking about the future, taking seriously the responsibility of getting vaccinations for a one hundred year a, a, a one in one hundred year event such as this COVID nineteen outbreak across the world. What's happening now is wholly attributable to this glorified ad man who, with his team, didn't take note of the advice that he was given. He, he talks about health professionals and follow the health advice, but he didn't take the right advice at the right time, and every single one of us is paying for that now. And the consequence, in quite a different reality from the world that Senator Hughes seems to uh, reside in, is people who have had good faith in the Australian government to date have lost that faith, have lost that hope. And they're all over Facebook on the Central Coast, where I wish I could go home to, but I can't because we're in lockdown. And I've had to do 14 days ISO just to come here and do my job, and that's nothing by comparison to the imposition and the suffering that's going on right across Sydney right now. People have lost hope. People are despairing. Mental health crises are on the rise. And it's because of people like Nadine Morris, who wrote today on the Facebook page of the member for Robertson, Lucy Wicks, your assurance, she wrote, doesn't mean much when so many people have booked through the federal system. What a joke. I'm beyond furious. This whole situation is a big, fat joke. How are we so far behind in this country? I'm embarrassed to be Australian right now. Still in hard lockdown a year and a half into this pandemic with no end in sight. That's what Australians are thinking about this government and its failures to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccination. What double standards, writes Valerie Dressler. One day they're telling people to get out and book for their vaccine. The next day, they cancel your appointment. This sends a really bad message, says Daddy Long. Basically, you don't matter. There's a few people I know who've been cancelled because of this. All of them have said they won't be trying again. And there, in microcosm, is exactly described the chaos, the chaos of this government's attempt at a vaccination rollout. Don't buy the vaccines. Don't get in a race to deliver them. Don't tell people the truth about what's going on. Stand in front of a microphone every day and pretend that you're governing the country when you're not really doing your job. And watch the whole thing go to hell in a handbasket. Watch businesses go down the drain. Watch families lose their housing because they can't pay their rent. Watch kids who can't go to school. Watch mental health crises emerging up and down the streets on which we live. That is what is happening because the vaccines were not purchased when they should have been and because there has been such terrible messaging in, this, in the way that this government has gone out to the community. Surely this is not OK says Julie Redfern. We're being told we're in a government-enforced lockdown until people are vaccinated, but now the government is cancelling our appointments of people booked for vaccination. What a mess. Julie Holman calls it like it is. That's BS, Lucy Wicks MP. I had a booking for my vaccination at Gosford Hospital. I was cancelled today. There's a history of blood clots in my family, and I'll be supervising HSC students in Sydney. We're all interconnected. There are people who need Pfizer. They can't take AstraZeneca. And every time the government says, sign up, get ready, get your jab, people are taking the government at their word and finding the whole system is failing them. Failing them. Gemma Hall, I'm so tired of our so-called ministers who don't fight for us at all. Why are we continually sold out as a region? People are sick and tired 
of not being able to get access to a vaccine that the government keeps saying is available. It's not available. There are a number of GPs, very few, on the Central Coast who are able to deliver it. And the ones who had Pfizer have had it removed. So many people are so anxious about this. And it's because of this constant failure to do the right thing by this government, failure to own up to the problems that they themselves created, failure to give the Australian people an even chance. And how bad is Australia's record internationally? The Grattan Institute uh, has been very, very clear over many years in giving frank and fearless health advice to governments of all persuasions. They do their research and they put their reputation on the line every time they put out a report about health. And this is what Stephen Duckett has said, that the government's vaccine strategy is amongst the worst in the world. There are a lot of people in the Australian community who do not listen to politics. They say it doesn't matter, but they're figuring out it matters. I've read from people who said they're embarrassed about Australia's stance on this because we are, in fact, the worst in the world. The numbers don't lie. Because at the end of last week, Australia had inoculated the third lowest proportion of its population in any OECD nation. We are falling far behind countries like Costa Rica, Mexico, Colombia and almost all of Europe. And we have contributions like that of Senator Hughes, who tries to indicate that Labor politicians like myself, on this side of the chamber, standing up for our communities, holding the government to account, telling it like it really is. And Senator Hughes dares to say that we haven't got pride in this nation. Well, I've got pride in this nation. I've got pride in the people who want to do the right thing. I've got pride in all the people who want to sign up and get their AstraZeneca or their Pfizer. I've got pride in the doctors who are helping them make the decision about which vaccine is best for them. I've got pride in all those people who've already gone and got the jab. I've got pride in my own family and my own kids who could see the writing on the wall, who knew that they could not take a chance and wait for this government to deliver Pfizer into our community. And in their 20s, they went and got the AstraZeneca jab. They waited up, they spoke to a good doctor and they went ahead. But they shouldn't be in that position. They wouldn't be in that position if this government had actually delivered an effective and timely rollout. It's a disaster. Mr Morrison should be ashamed Senator of himself. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what a dismal, disappointing afternoon we are having here. Because at Australia's greatest time of need, what do we hear but negative rock-throwing? What do we hear but an opposition who is very, very happy to be in a nation that has had the lowest infection rates, the lowest death rates, the most extraordinary financial uh, response to this pandemic of any in the world, who has managed to save lives and save jobs with their programs? And yet now, what we're going to listen to is an opposition who, with the benefit of hindsight, could tell you exactly what was going to happen, who, with the benefit of hindsight and without having any manual, as wasn't provided to any government in the world, are going to tell you exactly what they would have done and, uh, and how the government, without any of the benefits of hindsight and this uh, mythical manual, uh, could have done so much better. But can I tell you what's happened in my state of Queensland? When the Pfizer vaccine started arriving earlier this year, they were so poorly administered by Queensland Health, there were so many that were going out of date, they had to start throwing up tents and hoping people would walk in off the street to commence their vaccinations, despite the federal government providing the vaccines and the ammunition to inform people. I was aware of people who walked in, having seen it on the street, and got their vaccination within 30 minutes. 
How many of those vaccines were destroyed for going out of date? How many people in Queensland were not encouraged to be vaccinated early? How much vaccine hesitancy was the result of the words of the Queensland government, who was only keen in being a roadblock in the way of the federal government's successful rollout? Let me tell you about what happened in Burketown, in the far north of the state, when I arrived and the public health system was there with six people. Six people flew up to vaccinate a community of 300 people. And in the two days they were there, they vaccinated 50. And in that time, uh, they, uh, we have left communities uh, un uh, have left communities exposed because of the lack of practical administrative uh, processing. We had Queensland Health admin officers in Townsville being vaccinated, but not the doctors and nurses at the hospital. These are the kind of practical implementations that Queensland Health failed on, because the greatest impediment to vaccinating Queenslanders is our own Labor state government. Queensland Health did not order any AstraZeneca in July, any, and only ordered 1,000 doses in May. Queensland has the second lowest rate of fully vaccinated people at just over 18 per cent and the lowest rate of people who have had just one do dose at under 37 per cent. Uh, it, it is extraordinary that the opposition would continue to lay all this blame at the federal government's feet despite the millions of doses that are being provided to state governments to get into the arms of its population. And of course, the latest, the latest thought bubble that's come from Mr Albanese is this cash for jabs. The best incentive that we can be providing to get the vaccination is the fact that it could save your life and the lives of your, of your loved ones. It's not something that people put a price on. Australians know that. And that they know their taxpayer dollars are best spent supporting those who are doing it tough, who have lost their jobs or lost work due to another round of current lockdowns. Instead, Labor is proposing payments to people who have already been vaccinated or have already decided to get their vaccinations. Research has highlighted that financial incentives have had little to no impact on vaccination rates, and suggesting that people be paid to get vaccinated will again alter their risk perception on what decision they should be making. It also removes the personal responsibility from Australians to understand what is the right thing to be doing. At some point as a nation, we have to make the decision of what actions we personally are going to take. Senator O'Neill was talking about her pride in this nation, but I can't help but notice if she spent more time picking up the phone and helping people to understand how to book a vaccination, what options they had to go and make that decision for them and for their families, and less time on Facebook reading Lucy Wicks's Facebook page, how much further ahead the, the people of New South Wales might be. Because I put that to so many people. Have you been able to get the vaccine? And so often the answer is, well, yes. I rang the hospital, but I couldn't get an appointment. I rang my GP and I got one. I went to see my pharmacist and I got one. Many examples of people taking their own personal responsibility to go ahead and take the actions to become vaccinated because they know that that is the right thing to do. Senator Seawitt was raising questions about children over the age of 12 being vaccinated. And from the 9th of August this year, around 220,000 children aged between 12 and 15 who are at a higher risk of illness if they contract COVID-19, will be able to receive 
a COVID vaccination. This includes children with a specified medical condition that increases their risk of severe COVID-19, including severe asthma, diabetes, obesity, cardiac and circulatory congenital abnormalities, neurodevelopment disorders, epilepsy, immunocompromised and trisomy 21, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, all children aged 12 to 15 in remote communities as part of broader community outreach vaccination programs that provide vaccines for all ages over 12. And this provides a review of the Pfizer vaccine for use in children aged 12 to 15 by the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. One of the things that Australia has done very well is not rush. We have not rushed decision-making and approvals because Australians are telling us they don't want that to happen. Australians are telling us that they have questions about the vaccination and they want to feel confident. And so this rollout has allowed people to know that for those people uh, who, are, who want the vaccination, that the vaccination is available to them. We cannot put a price on Australian safety, and we know that we have a plan to get back to normal life and a target of getting 70 per cent of eligible Australians vaccinated so lockdowns are less likely, restrictions are easy, easing and many freedoms are returned. This plan is working. Already more than 12 million doses have been given, and that's ramped up to more than a million doses per week. So regardless of what rocks the, the opposition is going to continue to throw, what criticisms they have, what benefit of 2020 hindsight vision they have, what secret manual that apparently they have that nobody else in the world has, in Australia the plan is working. Australians are able to get access to vaccinations. They are able to consult with their doctor and they are able to visit a range of different sites, where it be hospitals, GPs, community pharmacies and other primary, hair, primary care providers. So I beg the opposition not to continue this horrible, negative, anti-Australian, anti-safety messaging, but to stand shoulder to shoulder with the government to stand shoulder to shoulder with the communities of Australia, particularly those regional and rural Australians, and to support this incredibly successful vaccination rollout that is speeding up with every day that goes past and is ensuring that Australians will be safe, will continue the extraordinary economic recovery that we are having. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this important debate. We've known since the start of the pandemic that First Nations people have an increased risk of adverse effects from COVID-19. We've known since the start of the pandemic that we're, we're walking into a crisis. We are no strangers to dealing with deadly infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. We survived disease brought by the colonisers, like smallpox, which killed hundreds of thousands of my people. Our people, communities and organisations mobilised our COVID-19 responses early and effectively. Remote communities organised big return to country reparation efforts to keep people well on country. Our self-determined organisations produce health promotion materials in language to keep our communities safe and healthy. The botched vaccine rollout, and yes, it's botched and it still is botched by Mr Morrison, the so-called Prime Minister, has been marred by inconsistent messaging and inadequate vaccine numbers. Mr Morrison's failure to secure enough vaccines has led to serious and valid concerns about how low rates of immunity are affecting Western Australians, Queensland and South Australia. As I mentioned, our people know how to keep our communities healthy, 
In Victoria, my home state, Aboriginal health services have helped get 58% of First Nations people vaccinated. This confirms that we've always known self-determination works. When First People are in the driver's seat, we achieve great things. And yet, just last month, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation was excluded from a meeting of the National COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. So if that's not telling you that First Nations don't matter to the Morrison government, then I don't know what is. First Nations health services need to be included in the conversation. We have solutions and resourced properly. We can keep our communities safe. We can look after one another. We just need the vaccines to be able to do it. The Morrison government has said since the start of this pandemic that vaccinating First Nations communities was a priority. Well, start acting like we are the priority and get everyone vaccinated and get your plan sorted out to save people's lives. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, as this parliament meets again, Australia's largest city is in lockdown, uh, and most of the eastern seaboard has, over the last few weeks, uh, been in lockdown. It's an anxious time for millions of Australians, including millions of Sydney siders, uh, who are either stuck in their homes, where they risk uh, the virus when they travel. Uh, to the supermarket or working in essential jobs around the city uh, where they are uh, doing the right thing for the country and the right thing uh, by Sydney, but facing uh, the constant risk, uh, the escalating risk of the coronavirus pandemic. It is clear to the people of Sydney and it's clear to the people of Australia that the Morrison government's vaccine rollout has been an abject failure. And it's that failure that is the reason that we have the lockdown. But plenty of people on the other side of the Senate have criticised the state governments for the lockdowns, but the lockdowns are a necessary public health response when the, vaccine, when the vaccination rate is so low. Without vaccination, there is no other measure that's available um, other, than, uh, other than the lockdowns. This is Scott Morrison's lockdown. It was his hubris his utter failure of leadership that has created this crisis. All of his press conferences look like a list of things that he should have done in 2020. Only this Prime Minister would so abjectly shrink from the work required to solve this national crisis. Because it, it, for him, it requires three things. It requires grasping complexity. It requires casting aside ideology in favour of pragmatic solutions. And it requires being honest with the Australian people in the national interest. No wonder he is so uniquely unsuited to this work. Just when we needed it most, we have a Prime Minister who is utterly incapable of doing his job. Nowhere was this failure more apparent than his consistent refusal to condemn members of his own backbench for undermining public health measures. The soon-to-be former member for Dawson endorsed the selfish, dangerous, anti-lockdown protests in Sydney and Melbourne on his social media pages and hosted his own protest in Mackay. He claimed that the coronavirus is no more dangerous than the flu and it only kills the elderly. He even went so far as to tell the small crowd, at some point in this fight, Civil disobedience is going to have to be done. We're going to have to prepare for that at some stage. Self-indulgent, extreme narcissism. And yet, neither the Prime Minister nor the Deputy Prime Minister have taken a single step to condemn him. Nor did they condemn Senator Rennick when he attacked public health measures, saying, you can't protect the weak by destroying the strong. Senator Canavan also joined in. He told ABC, I don't think these lockdowns are the right response. They're causing untold damage to people's mental health, to their business, their employment situations, their marriage, their marriages. Not content at pretending to be a coal miner, now he's an epidemiologist. He's a one-man careers fair. He's had more imaginary 
more imaginary careers than Paul Hogan had real ones. This week, or last week, I think, Senator Canavan made the bizarre decision to appear on Steve Bannon's podcast, which has been furiously pumping out vaccine and COVID misinformation to the far right internet, probably sourced uh, from, uh, from Russia somewhere, but damaging to our democracy and damaging to the public health effort. Senator Canavan and Mr. Christensen and Senator Rennick, they show everything that's wrong with the modern National Party, more concerned with prosecuting culture wars than representing the people who they should be representing. The saddest part of Senator Canavan's uh, appearance was when at the end of his uh, podcast, I couldn't bear to watch it, uh, on his way out of talking about his big role in the international resistance to communism and whatever other garbage it was he was going through, given the opportunity, he spelled out his Twitter account and asked people to follow him. He literally spelled it out. I mean, for goodness sake, instead of protecting the health and livelihoods of regional Australia, he's begging for followers on far-right podcasts. We need a serious effort from this Prime Minister. We need serious accountability. We need serious answers. Australians have done their job. Victorians have done their job. New South Wales people have done Senator their job. Senator Ayres, your time Prime Minister has to do expired. His. Senator Bain. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'd like to thank Senator O'Neill for, for this MPI. I always love it when Labor get their MPIs up in the ballot. It's like they're delivering us a Dorothy Dixer every single time. And this is just another example. What rot in this MPI? How she could possibly write that down is, is beyond anyone. But let's have a look at why. The vaccine rollout is continuing to gain momentum. More than 12 million doses have been administered, and we're now hitting more than a million doses administered each week. If you look at the starting point from when we started rolling out this vaccine 160 days ago, Australia is actually ranked around 14th from that time of thing. Now, why was it late? Because we built in that safety factor of seeing how it affected other countries. And why could we do that? Because we didn't have COVID at the time. So we built in extra, safe, extra safety measures. Now we're rolling it out and we have 80 per cent of over 70s had their first jab. We've had 65 per cent of over 50 year olds um, have had their first. And if we look at the whole eligible population, 40 per cent have had their first and 19 have had their second. And the rollout continues apace and it will continue to do so. Now, as the Prime Minister had said, Madam Acting Deputy President, there have been a number of setbacks in the vaccine program. And as a government, we've taken responsibility for this. No one could have foreseen the challenges that AstraZeneca has brought, but uh, it has saved countless lives nonetheless. The UQ vaccine fell out. It was a very good candidate, but had positive, false positives, so we had to take that out of the list. Now we have other vaccines, and the amount of vaccines is growing every week. And the government has taken responsibility, as I said, for, for th these steps, but we also take responsibility for a number of other things. And as some of my, uh, my colleagues previously have said, we have the second lowest death rate in the OECD. We have protected jobs of over three million Australians on JobKeeper and have got more people back into work than were out of work before COVID hit. Now, all these facts are lost on those on the other side. They, they don't seem to grasp what's important to Australians, and that is protecting their lives and protecting their livelihoods. Currently, we have two vaccines on offer that we know are safe and provide effective protection against COVID-19 and its subsequent variants. To ensure Australians are protected against the Delta variant, we all have a responsibility to promote the vaccines and reduce vaccine hesitancy. What doesn't help in delivering a speedy and effective rollout is when Labor's candidate in the seat of Higgins spreads mistrust around the Astra AstraZeneca vaccine and promotes vaccine hesitancy even further. What doesn't help the rollout is when the Queensland Labor government's chief health officer 
continues to criticise the AstraZeneca vaccine when we know it is safe. It has been approved for use by the TGA, and we know it will help keep Australians safe. You only need to look at the UK's rollout. They've, their effective uh, population, of, uh, the effective rate of their population vaccinated is 57 per cent, and their death rates have dropped from over 1,000 a day to uh, the last number I saw was 24 a day. So the AstraZeneca is very effective in protecting life. So what we need to do is have the Labor Party stop doing everything possible to undermine the rollout and promoting vaccine hesitancy. You know, even just today, the leader of the uh, opposition party, Mr Albanese, explicitly refuses to uh, in endorse the AstraZeneca vaccine. His thought bubble of $300 a day, now what's that going to do in people's minds and make them going to think, oh, I'll just wait a while until I get uh, you know, my vaccine because, yeah, I'll get 300 bu bucks if I wait. We want people to go and get vaccinated now. So these little thought bubbles that wander out from those opposite need to stop. They need to get behind our vaccine <coughs> rollout. They need to roll up their sleeves and do the work that parliamentarians should. So in answer to those questions, is that they just don't care. They're very happy to play politics with the, uh, the vaccine rollout. And I think Australians Senator are seeing Bain, through their political time aims. Your has expired. Senator Stilljohn. Are you on mute, Senator Stilljohn? Is this I'm sorry, we're not able to hear you, Senator Steele John. Is there an issue that Hansard can help us with? So um oh. can you hear me, Senator Seaward? I can hear you, Senator Seaward. Okay, so we can hear online. We can hear Senator Steele John, if that helps the technicians. We'll just wait for a moment if I can get some indication whether that does help. Are we able to fix this issue? We'll just wait for, for a few more seconds to see if the technicians can fix this issue, but otherwise we will have to uh, move on to the next agenda item. I'm sorry, Senator Still John. I think we'll have to move on. I'm not getting any indication from the technicians that they are able to correct the issue. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. Um, look, I think given uh, the fact that we can't hear Senator Still John. Can, can someone turn Senator Hanson Young's mic on, please? Continue. Thank you. Uh, given we can't hear Senator or see Senator Steele John um, here in the chamber, I think um, it's only right that uh, we we now do move on. But just to be clear, uh, we've already had a number of Green senators speak to this topic, and I uh, know full well that Senator Steele John would have been uh, highly critical of the government's rollout of the vaccine uh, to date, critical of their lack of support to people. And I'm sure in his three minutes that he was going to put uh, the case very eloquently that uh, we need to do better to keep Australians safe. Thank you, uh, Senator Hanson-Young, and I apologise to Senator Seal John. The time for the discussion has expired and we'll now move on to Proceed to the consideration of documents. Now, the documents are listed 
on pages four to six of today's order of business. <coughs> Senator Urquhart. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I take note. Uh, do you want to do page by page, or I would you like me to? Uh, I'll, yes, thank you, Senator okay. Urquhart. So, so I I'll just, can I just indicate apologies. to the Senate that we are now on uh, page four of the Senate Order of Business, um, item 13. So we're on documents one to eight. Senator Urquhart. Um, I take note of document uh, seven on page four and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, just noting that uh, Senator Rice would like to speak to uh, report seven, um, so I'm just not uh, sure at what point you want to go to her. We can go proceed uh, to. Uh, document seven now. If Senator Rice is uh, Senator, Rice. Senator Rice is there, she would like to yes. speak to this report. Sure, Senator Rice. Um, yes. So we this the um, ANAO report. Yes, well, it's um, number forty-seven, performance audit, audit administra administration of the computer car park projects. Great. Okay. I'm speaking speaking to that. Um, look. Hold on, let's be us fine. Okay. So this is the report that the ANAO have done with regards to the car park, um, commuter car parks, um, and the spending of money on the urban congestion fund. And look, before I speak about the political corruption involved in this rort, I wanted to start by the, the basically, which was laid very clear in this report, I want to start by talking about the appalling waste of public funds that we're talking about overall, spending hundreds of millions of dollars building car parks on the total pretense that this will address urban congestion. And urban congestion is a real problem, and for the sake of livable cities it needs to be addressed. But there are so many flaws in the government's approach to tackling it. So this is the first layer of corruption that this government has presided over. Now I want to cover this in some detail because most of the commentary so far on the rorting of this program and how it's been pork barrelling focused on marginal and targeted seats has just accepted that building car parks is a valuable way of tackling urban congestion. But the only tangible evidence that the Department of Infrastructure was able to provide to us as to why they thought building car parks would address urban congestion was an Infrastructure Australia paper from 2018. And even though they referenced that paper, the analysis in it did not give them the justification that was they needed. I mean, they basically, Infrastructure Australia said that building car parks at outer suburban stations, um, which serve low density regions, could be useful, but also we should be improving other public transport access to stations commuter bus services, walking and cycling, making it easy for people to drop people off rather than building expensive car parks as the first option. I mean, there are huge problems in getting people, more people on trains by building more car parks. Station parking very often gets filled very quickly by about seven o'clock in the morning. And often it's local workers and tradies who fill the spaces rather than people catching the trains. Parking is horrendously expensive to build and a massive way, waste of valuable space close to, close to stations. You just cannot provide enough car parking for the thousands of people or tens of thousands of people that would be catching trains from a railway station each day. Feed the bus services, I mentioned, are much more effective. And in Victoria, where the majority of these car parks are proposed to be built, Car parking is not discussed by the Victorian government's strategic transport planning. The 2012 Rail Development Plan Melbourne or the Department of Transport's 2019 strategic plan. So basically, this federal government ignored state priorities in creating this rort. So, I mean, other options that should be considered are active transport, improving public transport, more bike paths, more walking paths, more end of trip facilities for bikes. We need to make it genuinely easy for people to be getting to the station in ways that are non-polluting and that don't require 
massive, hundreds of thousands of dollars to be building, or millions of dollars to be building these car parks. And, but they, the Department of Infrastructure justified um, building these car parks and say, oh, we did a benefit cost ratio analysis and it was all positive. But if you look at that benefit cost ratio they did, it was absolutely dodgy. It was an absolutely appallingly weak piece of analysis. And the entire basis of their analysis was that there's a broad brush generic assumption that removing vehicles will have an incredibly high value per kilometre for other cars travelling on the roads. If you have awful assumptions, you end up with awful analysis. Garbage in, garbage out. The benefit cost ratio is wildly inadequate for a program worth $650 million. I mean, I undertook much better transport planning work when I was a strategic planner at the city of Hume before I was in the Senate. So that's the first fraud. But rather than doing good, good policy, they insisted, this government insisted on building car parks that are hugely problematic, ineffective and wasteful. And now let me just quickly address, of course, the second layer of corruption, that this whole program started with a wish list of 20 electorates, and then the, the list expanded. So right from the start, the rot was baked in that this was pork barrelling. This was determining where money was being spent on the basis of buying votes rather than good public policy. It was purely about putting projects in marginal electorates, run out of the minister's office with the... Or, the knowledge and the cooperation of the Prime Minister's office. The sheer outrageous audacity of this corruption, it is incredible. This isn't just a sort of small bit of corruption, this is corruption. This is an appalling waste of public money and Senator the Senate Rice, needs to continue your time its consideration. expired. Would you like to seek leave to continue your remarks? And I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. Is Thank leave, you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. I, um, I just want to uh, I give uh, Senator Seawood an opportunity to uh, speak to number 15. Okay. So we're not at that uh, document yet, uh, Senator Hanson Young, but we would like to, with, um, with leave of. Sorry, Senator Hanson Young. That um, uh, there is a request to seek leave to allow Senator Steele John to speak. Uh, ha however, I haven't had a response from him as yet, so I don't. He's know. on. He's appeared. Okay, on great. The screen. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So, with leave of the Senate, we would like to go back to the MPI and um, for the last contribution by Senator Steelejohn. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steele, John. I'm. Uh, it doesn't look like the um, issue has been resolved, and I have. Do we have any indication from Hansard, the technicians, whether they're able to? Resolve the issue quickly. I'm sorry, Senator Steele John. I think um, maybe this time the. Um... It's being seen and not heard. Oh. Was that. No. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry. We will have to um, definitely say that the time for the discussion has expired and proceed back to documents. Um, we will, of course, uh, look into that issue to try to rectify it um, so you are able to make uh, contributions. So documents on page five, documents um, numbers nine to 23. Senator Urquhart. Deputy Pre uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I take note of documents 10, 14, <coughs> And 23 on page 5, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, just uh, reiterating that Senator Seawood would like to speak to document 15. Senator Seawood? 
Uh, thank you. Yes, I would. This is the Community Affairs Reference Committee report, the number of women in Australia who have had transvaginal mesh implants and related matters, and the final report on the government response um, that yes, was uh, had by the government in um, July. And first off, I would like to um, say thank you to the government for coming back to us with uh, doc with. Uh, reporting on how these recommendations have been implemented. I'm not quite sure if it's a, a first, but it is it's certainly um, very much appreciated because this was in a very important inquiry. This relates to the 2017 uh, Senate inquiry into transvaginal mesh implants. And we heard from so many women who had been living with significant <laughs> negative consequences of having these implants. It's estimated that between 10,000 and 15,000 women may have suffered side effects from mesh devices. Many women who had transvaginal mesh implants have had devastating complications resulting in ongoing emotional trauma, embarrassment, shame, <laughs> depression, depression um, debilitating pain, reoccurring um, infection, loss of employment and uh, poor quality of life. The women we heard from during the inquiry process experienced starkly different outcomes. Not only have these outcomes been severely adverse, but most of the women who gave the evidence have experienced great difficulty finding medical practitioners who would accept that the symptoms they were experiencing were as severe as they claimed and said, or that they were uh, mesh related. Their struggles to cope with their symptoms and to find support and treatment had so far gone unrecognised in many occasions and they had far-reaching and devastating impacts on their lives and the lives of their families. Many women who received mesh implants suffered for an extremely long time. Others continue to be in constant pain. It was absolutely heartbreaking that to hear the experiences of so many women and the fact that these had been ignored for so long. These women were let down by the system, the system failed them. The way many women have been treated when trying to get treatment and support when they had such bad outcomes is absolutely appalling and an indictment on the medical practitioners and the system that were involved in that treatment. We heard a lot of harrowing evidence during the inquiry. So many women have been so adversely impacted. There was a clear pattern of poor process and advice which led women to having severely impacted lives. The class action against Johnson & Johnson has resulted in compensation for some women, but the suffering continues. I've been contacted by so many women who are suffering debilitating and long-term injuries who cannot even access the disability support pension. The committee made um, 13 recommendations that aimed to, aimed to address the needs of women with related complications and also to improve the regulation process so that this sort of system never happens again. I'm very pleased that the government has progressed uh, 11 out of the 13 recommendations. Recommendation 11, which the government has not accepted, needs attention. The committee recommended that the Commonwealth, State and Territory Governments commission the Australian Commission of Safety on Safety and Quality in Healthcare um, undertake an audit of transvaginal mesh procedures undertaken and their outcomes since the introduction of the devices for use in the Australian market. We need this data collection. We need an audit of the procedures that have been undertaken. It is appalling that this hasn't happened. The federal government needs to continue their leadership on this issue because they have reported on the implementation of so many of the, our recommendations. They need to show leadership and ensure that this audit can take place. It is absolutely essential that the women that have been impacted by transvaginal mesh are continued to be supported and helped in whatever way possible. I'm very pleased, as I said, that the government has reported on the implementation of these recommendations. I wish they would do the same with so many other the community affairs reports. Um, and um, I look forward to the implementation of Recommendation 11 and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Seward.
We will now move to page six, numbers 24 to 30. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I take note of document 25 on page six and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. My um, understanding is Senator, Senator Stilljohn is now good to go, so I ask um, by leave whether he would be able to make his uh, multiply delayed three-minute contribution okay. on the matter of public okay. importance. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. Is leave granted to return to um, the MPI to hear Senator Stilljohn's contribution? Leave is granted. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, there is a lot of talk in this place and in the media about what it will take to change the way that we manage COVID-19 in the community, to open up. And I've got to say right now, I am furious. Young people are at risk. Disabled people are at risk, all because the Morrison government has failed, failed and failed again. This is not good enough. Only a fraction of disabled people are currently vaccinated. It is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking, hearing of COVID-19 cases making their way into group homes with individuals who are not fully vaccinated, and even for those who are in the front of the queue for the vaccine. There is the struggle to find somewhere accessible uh, where it can be administered. We as disabled feeling, people are feeling scared. We are feeling isolated. We are terrified that as corporations push to open up our country, we are the ones who will be left behind to die. It is outrageous that young people do not have a time frame to receive a vaccination. This slow, delayed rollout is causing longer and longer disruptions to our lives. We do not have access to the mental health supports that we need. All the while, house prices go up and the climate crisis continues to loom over our generation. This government's failures are stealing some of the best moments of our youth while at the same time their failures in relation to climate change steal our future. Well, the Greens will not risk the lives of young people, of disabled people, of the immunocompromised. As we move to change our response to the pandemic, we will ensure that the voices of at-risk community members are centred and that their well-being, their safety is and continues always to be at the centre of everything we do. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. We'll now go back to documents. We've just completed 24 to 30. I'm just making sure there is nobody in the Chamber that wishes to speak. Okay, so we'll now move to item 14 the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. <laughs> whip. Government whip. Thank you very much. Court on the hop. On behalf of the Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Henderson, I present additional information received by the committee as listed at item 14 on today's order of business. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents. Oh, that, we'll, oh sorry. So, sorry. To, so we now go to the reports and government responses listed on page six, seven, and eight on the order of business. And I'll call Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents 34 and 37. Oh, sorry, sorry, if we can just stay on six. Is there uh, anyone, any, any senator wanting to sp uh, speak on items 31, 32 and 33? Okay, page seven, 
Senator Erkin. Thank you. I take note of document 34 and 37 on page 7 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I will now proceed to page 8. Is it no interest. Is there any uh, ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you. I table documents relating to the order for production of documents concerning the Leppington Triangle. Um, is there any committee memberships? Are there any messages from the House of Representatives? The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Standards and Assurance Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Clark. Oh, oh. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Minister. I take a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move. That this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The okay. question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 31 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Clark. Business of the Senate notice of motion number four standing in the name of Senator Rice relating to disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Boosting Australia's Diesel Storage Program Instrument 2021. Um. Sorry, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move business of the Senate notices of motion numbers four and five together, and for colleagues, I understand this has been agreed through the WHIPS process. Uh, is leave granted? I understand Senator McKim is seeking to move Sen um, number four and five in the name of Senator Rice together, disallowance. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move business of the Senate notices of motion numbers four and five, and I indicate that I believe Senator Rice is now seeking the call. Senator Rice. The Acting Deputy President. And look, I want to start by reiterating the urgency of what we are debating here tonight and reiterating the context that we are facing a climate emergency. And I, we are moving to disallow these two regulations because the last thing that we should be doing in a climate emergency is handing over, 300, over $300 million in subsidies to fossil fuel companies, to the oil industry. That handing over subsidies to fossil fuel companies is the exact opposite of what we should be doing in a climate emergency. The Liberal government's refusal to act on climate is horrifying. When we are on a trajectory that is currently taking us above one and a half degrees of global heating, the science tells us we need to go further, we need to go faster, because even an increase of one and a half degrees could have devastating impacts, and we are almost certainly likely to go past that threshold. The context that we're in we are, as well as seeing the start of the, pandem the global pandemic that we're in, 2020 was the equal hottest year on record. The planet is now more than a degree hotter than it was in 1821. And at over a degree's warming, we have likely passed crucial tipping points 
for our coral reefs. They are going to die, including the Great Barrier Reef. We've likely to pass, have passed crucial thresholds for Arctic sea ice and the West Antarctic glaciers and the Amazon rainforests. The context of this disallowance is summed up from a quote in the piece, from a piece in Nature in 2019 entitled Climate Tipping Points, Too Risky to Bet Against. If damaging tipping cascades can occur and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilization. No amount of economic cost benefit analysis is going to help us. We need to change our approach to the climate problem. In our view, the authors of this paper said, the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. Both the risk and urgency of the situation are acute. So we are facing a climate emergency. We must act. We must act now. But in the face of this emergency, what is our government doing? Who should be keeping us safe? It's the same thing they've tried doing with the pandemic. They are putting their heads in the sand. They are complaining about the economic cost and pretending that we can just live with it. And that's why they're still doing the same thing that they have always done, which is handing out taxpayer funds, the money for, from you and I to their fossil fuel donors. Let me remind those listening of a bill that the Senate debated in its last sitting in June 2021, the Fuel Security Bill 2021. That bill created a program that would pay up to $2 billion to fossil fuel refineries, subsidising the production of polluting petrol and diesel. $2 billion with no guarantees that a single cent of it would go to workers. $2 billion without an actual plan for, for fuel security. And in fact, the Liberal Party even imposed an inquiry into this bill, something as simple as hearing from witnesses and providing just a bit more detail about their massive cash splurge and why they thought that it was appropriate. But then again, this government is particularly averse to transparency. Let's be clear. We want and need meaningful, genuine action on fuel security. Imagine a country that was so fuel secure that we could be powering new jobs in green manufacturing and exporting energy to other countries. But what we should not be doing is shoveling money out the door to fossil fuel companies while the government refuses to take meaningful action. I mean, the government could have introduced an electric vehicle strategy that would have given us genuine fuel security by fast tracking the shift from polluting petrol and diesel vehicles to abundant renewable and electricity powered vehicles. Instead, what we have got over and over again is a blank check for oil refineries. And the government's inaction is even more horrifying when you look at it in an international context. As the Australia Institute recently summarised, Australia has the highest, the highest per capita pollution in the OECD. And it emits more greenhouse gases than 40 countries with bigger populations, including the UK, Italy and France. It's the largest exporter of coal and of liquefied natural gas. And according to Australia Institute research, it's the third largest exporter of fossil fuels, only behind Russia and Saudi Arabia. But rather than plan a just transition from these industries, the Australian government continue to expand fossil fuel extraction and exports. In the most recent financial year, Australia's federal and state, dish, state governments dished out a staggering 10.3% billion Australian dollars to subsidise fossil fuel use and production. It's therefore unsurprising, the Australia Institute continue, when Australia was ranked last for climate action out of 193 United Nations member countries in the Sustainable Development Report 2021. It ranked second last on climate policy in the most recent Climate Change Performance Index, beaten only by President Trump's USA. So that's the context that we are considering these two regulations that we are moving to disallow today. The actions of the Australian government are appalling and they are even worse when they're seen in the international context. Rather than taking genuine action to address the climate emergency, they are expanding subsidies to make the situation worse. Which brings me to the disallowance motion before the Senate. 
We are voting on two regulations today. The first of these, boosting Australia's diesel storage program, it provides funding of up to $260 million over three years. The second one, the Temporary Refinement Production Payments Program, this has already shovelled out $83.5 million in the run-up to the passage of the Fuel Security Bill 2021. So we are today retrospectively saying that this was OK. We opposed both of these measures. This is over $300 million being handed to some of the biggest polluters in the Australian economy, just at a time when there is not money being spent. We have not got the equivalent money being spent on how we shift our transport systems, how we shift our fuels to renewable fuels, to clean green fuels. That's what we should be spending money on. So we, as Greens, are absolutely opposed to both of these measures. This is not what a government that is concerned about keeping the community safe, that is concerned about our future, should be proposing. It is yet more funding for polluting fossil fuels, yet more funding for fossil fuel producers being shoveled out the door. We've got a situation now with this global pandemic where people do not feel safe and they want their government to be taking action to make them safe, to make us as safe as possible. Our safety is not being guaranteed in this pandemic, but the safety of the future, the future is not being guaranteed either. We have got a Morrison government that is risking people's current situation and it is risking the future. And I just feel particularly for young people, people who know, who are looking down the barrel of what's the world going to look like in their future, who are looking at such an uncertain future, who are looking at the, the most dire consequences of the level of global heating that we are currently facing. You look at the fires that are being experienced in the Northern Hemisphere in their current summer. You look at the fires that we experienced in the summer of 2019-20. You look at the sea level rise that is being baked in. You look at the impact on Australian agriculture, the fact that the areas where we now grow most of our wheat, under four degrees of global heating, which is what we are headed for, we won't be able to grow any food there at all. This is not fanciful. This is not extreme. This is what the science is telling us now what the situation is with our climate crisis. And what people of Australia and people of the world want is that they want their governments to be taking action. They want their governments to be facing up to the problems that we are facing and to say, OK, this is pretty disastrous circumstances that we're looking at, so what are we going to do about it? What action can we take so that we can all be working together to be slashing our carbon pollution as quickly as possible? And the good news is there is so much that we can be doing. There is so much positive news about the actions that we can be taking to be reducing our carbon pollution. And I only wish that our government could, be, could see that, to see the potential opportunities, to see that Australia could be a green industry powerhouse, that we could be exporting renewable electricity, we could be supporting 100% clean green fuels to the rest of the world, as well as fueling our transport and our industry here in Australia. But instead of taking these opportunities, of acknowledging that, that uh, the climate emergency, that global heating is a huge problem that needs us all to be working together to address, we have got these backwards measures. We have got this continuation of just shelling out the money supporting the government, supporting its billionaires, supporting its corporate mates, supporting the vested interests, supporting those the oil, coal and gas companies, and spending our money, not just allowing them to continue, but actually spending, subsidising their operations. As, and with the dis disallowances that we are debating tonight, subsidising the operations of the oil industry by over $300 million. So it is just the most wrong thing to be doing because meanwhile the seas are warming and rising, the ice caps are melting, the forests are burning, but this Liberal government is just keeping shoveling money out the door, 
to fossil fuel companies, like deckhands on the Titanic, because of sheer greed and the refusal to act in the national interests. I hope that the Senate will support this disallowance and take action to say, no, this is not an appropriate way to spend over $300 million. Instead, we should be taking this money, if it's on offer, offer and spending this money wisely, taking, spending this money to be helping us shift as rapidly as possible to a clean, green future, spending this money as part of Australia facing up to its responsibilities and taking real action on our climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the motions moved by Senator McKim um, in the name of Senator Rice. The disallowance of the industry research and development boosting Australia's diesel storage program instrument 2021 and the disallowance of the industry research and development temporary refinery production payment program instrument 2021. Uh, uh, and it is the government's neglect of the fuel security over the past eight years that has made these programs very necessary. Yet that is what, um, and that is what we're saying on on this side. That it's the government's neglect, and these programs are uh, very necessary. Labor has welcomed the, the these recent necessary programs targeted at fuel security in domestic refineries and will vote against this disallowance motion. While the Greens' decision to move these disallowances reflects their ideological position on fuel security, Labor understands how critical having a domestic refining capability and fuel storage is, both for local industry and jobs and for managing against security risks and fuel shocks. It is for this reason Labor will vote against these motions to disallow. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the government obviously will be voting against this disallowance motion. Both of these disallowance motions moved by uh, Senator McKim on behalf of Senator Rice. Uh, uh, through boosting Australia's diesel storage program, the government is backing 10 projects across regional Australia that will support around 1,000 new jobs and support a 40 per cent increase in Australia's diesel stock stock holdings. Diesel is, of course, vital to Australia's energy security as it keeps our economy running. These projects will help minimise shortages of diesel during peak usage periods and drive over $636 million of public and private sector investment into these areas, boosting our nation's long-term fuel security and also bolstering our national sovereignty. Uh, on the uh, issue of the disallowance of the industry R&D temporary ref uh, refinery production payment program, um, uh, well, securing the ongoing operations of Australia's refineries, of course, is a key element of the government's long-term fuel security package. The government has very successfully secured the commitment of the refineries due to this grants program and support for the infrastructure upgrades needed to produce better quality fuels and through the passage of the Fuel Security Act of 2021. The temporary payments cover the first half of 2021 before the Fuel Security Act 2021 payments scheme commences. So withdrawing payments would put the refineries' commitments at risk along with the future of the current 1,250 refinery workers and the additional 1,750 construction jobs for the infrastructure upgrades. So clearly the government will be voting against both of the disallowance motions. Thank you. So the question is that the business of the Senate numbers four and five in relation to disallowance motions for the Industry Research and Development Instrument 2021, uh, moved by Senator McKim on behalf of Senator Rice, be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Are those against say no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that the business of the Senate motion numbers four and five in re relation to disallowance of the industry research and development instrument 2021 moved by Senator McKim on behalf of Senator Rice be agreed to. Those in favour will move to the right of the chair, those against to the left, and I appoint tellers, uh, Senator Chisholm for the nose and Senator McKim for the eyes. The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 29. The question is resolved in the negative. Senators, I'll allow you to give you time to either leave the chamber or to return to your seats. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and a related bill, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Faruqi. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I continue my remarks from earlier in the day. Um, as, I, as I was saying earlier, TEXA is focused on quality assurance and student outcomes. They ensure that higher education providers meet minimum standards, promote best practice and improve the quality of, Australian, of the Australian higher education sector. And these bills are to set up a framework to recover the costs of Texas operations. These bills are not a surprise. The intention to cost recovery for Texas was announced in the 2018-19 budget. Understandably and unfortunately, with the effects of COVID, implementing this change was necessarily delayed. But it cannot be delayed indefinitely, and it is now time to look to implement them. I want to reassure people that the cost recovery is not going to recover 100 per cent of Texas costs. As would be expected, certain costs associated with non-regulatory activities will continue to be fully funded by the government. But those costs associated with applications, with risk monitoring and with regulatory oversight will be recovered through application-based fees and through annual charges. Implementation will be phased to increase from the current low 15 per cent cost recovery that we're already at to 20 per cent in the first year, 50 per cent the following year and 100 per cent in the third year. That way, our higher education providers can adjust to the implementation of this cost recovery framework. 
Now, these bills that are before us today establish the legal framework for the cost recovery and charges, but it is, does not set the amount of the annual charge, which will be prescribed by regulation. I did hear today, uh, earlier today Senator Kim Carr's contribution to this debate and his concerns, as well as the concerns of the scrutiny committee um, that both he and I are on, about setting aside <clears throat> the charges in regulations. I accept those concerns. In fact, I do share some of those concerns. And I've heard the same concerns come from the industry. But I also appreciate the need for continuing consultation on the charges model to ensure it is not rushed, that it is well considered, and that the charges are fit for purpose, that they're not just recovering fees that are imagined or not, um, not fair and reasonable. I've also heard the concerns of some in the sector, particularly smaller providers, who are worried about the potential of inequity of the charges model. And this is why I commend the ongoing consultation. In fact, I implore those who are uh, going through the stakeholder feedback at the moment and who are designing the final model to take into account those concerns and the concerns of smaller providers and to consider not only um, a fair and reasonable model but also capacity to pay and capacity of uh, whether what the likelihood is of providers to pass on fees to their students and the capacity to pay of those students. There are many factors that must be considered when developing the right model to set these charges. One component to the cost recovery is the annual charge. And certainly, uh, this has driven the highest level of correspondence to my office. The annual charges will cover the cost of delivering a range of regulatory activities, including student and stakeholder concern management and resolution, stakeholder communications and engagement, provider risk assessment and then administrative support, including responding to inquiries, business support and guidance. Importantly for the first item, student and stakeholder concern and management, the draft cost recovery model uh, indicates it would be divided amongst tertiary provi providers proportional to each provider's size by student enrolments. It will not be applied in a postage stamp model. This means that an institution like the Bachelor Institute of the Northern Territory, the only First Nations dual sector tertiary education provider in Australia with 223 students commencing in 2019, will pay a vastly different rate to that paid by a large university such as the University of New South Wales with 59,000 students. The reason for proportional cost recovery is because activities related to student and stakeholder concern is directly related to the number of students. More students means more issues raised with TEXA and then more work for TEXA. So that, that proportional split is fair. For the remaining regulatory activities, the current proposal, which as I said before is being reviewed, is proposed to be evenly split. split. Arguably, uh, the argument put forward by TEXA is that these um, regulatory activities often provide more support to smaller providers who have less staff and less capacity to do things like risk assessments for themselves. Uh, this is an area I'm confident that those sifting through the stakeholder feedback will consider when designing the final formula. And the final impact on a provider must also consider the changes to application-based fees. As part of the changes facilitated by these bills today, there is capacity for reduced course accreditation fees for smaller providers with less than 500 full-time equivalent students. This means some of our smaller providers, but those with a large number of courses, could save up to $50,000 per year. And this is a crucial point. And this is specifically designed to address the concerns that have been raised with my office by smaller providers about the potential inequity of the uh, cost recovery model, model. At an individual provider level, the percentage change in fees and charges will vary due to the different application-based fees. And it will also vary year to year based on the fact that um, it is dependent on enrolments and students. With, uh, the um, student 
and stakeholder management side of the fees. Some will pay less in accreditation fees, uh, and some of it, as I said, is based on the difference in student numbers. There is absolutely no doubt that our tertiary education sector has a quality assurance system um, that makes us very attractive to international students. We, we want to ensure that our tertiary sector continues to have a strong international reputation so that at the other side of COVID we can bring back those international students to enjoy studying here onshore in Australia. At the same time, I do, however, commend our university sector for being able to pivot, for being agile during COVID and for um, being able to maintain a relationship with their current international students through on online offerings and other mechanisms to ensure that we uh, remain a, a primary um, place of thought for study for international students. As I said at the opening of my remarks today, um, earlier in the day, many of our universities, despite fearing the worst, have actually um, produced financial results this year far greater than they were expecting, um, which is testament to their ability to pivot, testament to, to their ability to respond to the challenges of COVID and to continue to service not only their international students, but more crucially and more importantly, um, our students throughout Australia who have um, been impacted themselves by various lockdowns, um, various impacts in different states. Some of the students who were to commence university this year haven't even set foot on campus, not through any fault of their own, but just the fact that COVID keeps popping its head up uh, left, right and centre. And, um, I, I credit them, I credit our universities and I thank them all for the work they've done to see us through. I thank our university sector for their ongoing and crucial contribution to our economy. There is no doubt our tertiary sector has a quality assurance system that is robust and adds to this attractiveness for international and domestic students. We know the sector greatly contributes to our national economy through both import dollars and domestic activity. It also, and it's very important to re recognise, our higher education providers also attract research dollars, both domestically and internationally, and they have many other um, beneficial community associations through local sponsorship, through local community interactions that cannot be underestimated. So I just want to reassure our community sector that um, these bills are not a negative. In fact, they should be viewed as an opportunity to ensure that our high reputation, international reputation for a high quality tertiary sector will be ongoing, robust into the future in a manner that is fair and equitable so the burden is not met purely by taxpayers, some of whom have never set foot on a university campus. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Polly, remotely. Senator Polly. Uh, Senator Polly, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Senator Polly, Senator Polly, I'll get you to sort your um, IT difficulties out, and I might call Senator Rennick if that's okay. Thanks, Senator Rennick. The President, and uh, I rise in support of the charges and cost recovery bills for the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, TESQA, as the national regulator of our universities, plays a very important role in maintaining the quality of our nation's higher education. Australia has world-class universities, thanks in no small part to the regulating work that TESCA and TES Tech Tech SA does. These bills will continue to support this work by putting in place the legislation needed to charge an annual fee to universities for the work they do. This will take the monetary burden off the taxpayer and create a self-sustaining system between universities and their regulator 
to keep higher education in Australia strong. The importance of having high quality and robust universities cannot be overstated. Higher education shapes the minds of young people and prepares them to be productive and contributing members of society. Students get the opportunity to expand their minds and learn to think critically at university, which is very important to being a good citizen of the world. Education is often the difference between developed and undeveloped countries, and this is why keeping universities operating at a high standard remains a priority for this government. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency is the government's authority for doing this and ensuring continuing high standards at our universities. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency does the work of registering higher education providers, accrediting courses where self-accreditation has not been given and regulating providers to ensure they are delivering best practice. Any new provider of higher education must first register and then renew their registration once every seven years. Throughout that time, TESSA conducts regular compliance and quality assessments and also collects and disseminates information relating to higher education and best practice. Because of the essential work that happens, it's important that it gets money it needs to function. At the moment, this money is coming from the taxpayer. But the purpose of these bills is to transition Texas cost recovery to come from universities as the beneficiaries of their services. At the moment, only 15 per cent of total cost is being recovered from the sector. But over the next three years, this will transition to 100 per cent so that TESQA can become a self-sustaining system. It makes sense for universities to pay for the services that they are benefiting from and which they need from, for their industry to remain strong. In addition, it's government policy that regulators be able to recover the full cost of what it takes to deliver their services, and so these bills will see the higher education sector come into line with this. An example of the important work being done is when uh, they identify and improve the transparency of the admissions process of universities. There was way too much variety and confusion in application pathways which made it difficult and confusing for potential students to apply. TechSA was able to apply the problem by creating an implementation plan that universities adopted, which included standardising admissions information, terminology and threshold that streamlined the process. This means that potential students can now easily see the admission requirements and be able to compare universities in order to make an informed choice about where they go and whether they can get in. This is just one example of the important regulatory work that TechSA does and why it needs adequate funding to be able to fill their fulfil their purpose of protecting student interests and the reputation of Australian higher education. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a difficult time for the higher education sector because of the uh, loss Senator of Senator Rennie, just uh, resume your seat, please. Sorry. Uh, Senator Farrell. Um, point of order. Um, uh, the senator is in breach of uh, Standing Order 187. You're not permitted to read your speeches in this uh, place. <coughs> um, Senator Farrell, uh, I think we're fairly lenient on that standing order, but I do remind Senators, it is, uh, it is a standing order and um, would ask you to um, speak to your speeches. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Please continue. That's fine. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Listen, I don't need to read a speech to talk about education in this country and what the Labor Party did to education in 1990 with the Dawkins plan. So you want me to go off script, Senator Farrell? I'll do that any time. Because I well remember what the hawke government did to education in this country. They have basically commoditise degrees in this country and treat our children like commodities. Treat our children like commodities. They introduce the hex debt. They introduce the hex debt, basically in enslaving our children to debt, just like Paul Keating did when he brought in the foreign banks in this country and let the ABA, RBA off their leash and inflated house prices. And now our students, they go to university, end up with a massive hex debt. They've got ex uh, very little chance of getting jobs because everyone had to get a degree rather than stick with TAFE, and now they're in big trouble. 
because button, the button plan destroyed manufacturing. So that was the perfect combination. Let's destroy manufacturing. Let's prop up the finance industry by giving un unmitigated control to the superannuation industry, letting in the foreign banks, letting in foreign debt. And what have our children got? Nothing. We privatised all the infrastructure in this country. They've got degrees that don't get them jobs. And now they've got, you know, they've got to give up 10 per cent of their incomes, which I spoke about earlier today, and Paul Keating himself admitted that came out of their wages. That came out of their wages. So I don't need a lesson from you, Senator Farrell, as to how destructive your uh, party— Senator Rennick, I remind yep. you not to uh, reference other senators directly. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I don't need a lesson from Senator Farrell, Madam Deputy President, as to the destructive nature of what Labor has done to this country. Of what Labor has done to this country. And there isn't, there isn't an industry in this country that hasn't been destroyed by the Labor Party. You know, it's interesting. They talk about casualisation and how you know, wages are casual. I was just reading about how under the 1983 Income Prices Accord, casualisation went from basically single digits to up to 25 per cent, thanks to the Hawke-Keating government. And they've got a hide to come in here and talk about casualisation rates in this country. There isn't a thing that the Hawke-Keating government didn't destroy it. And a little bit that was left when the uh, Rudd Gillard government got in with the boat people, what a mess they made. What a mess they made. So I'm not going to bother talking about this bill because this bill is all about trying to get education back on track in this country. Um, Senator it's about Rennick. Senator yep. Rennick, please resume your seat. Senator Carr. Madam Deputy President, look, we, we do appreciate that in a second reading debate we do range widely, but th there is no relevance whatsoever. Uh, in this uh, senator's remarks to the terms of this bill, we're on the boat people, we're on the various other measures, which I suggest to you is not contained anywhere in the bill. And I, perhaps he could draw his uh, attention back to the terms of the bill. I thank you, Senator Carr. I have been listening carefully, and I was waiting for Senator Rennick to get back onto the bill. But it is a broad-ranging debate, and he was speaking mostly about education. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. And, and I was actually coming back because this bill is a part of many things that uh, we're doing uh, in, the, in the Morrison government to it's get education yeah. back on track in this country. To get education back on track in this country, so that basically our children, when they finish uh, graduate from tertiary education, whether it be uh, through the university sector or the TAFE sector, that they can get a job that they can get the job. Because at the end of the day, higher education is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. It is not about propping up academics to write research publications that basically create alarmist theories about the Great Barrier Reef and all that sort of stuff. No, 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 no. It is about delivering outcomes. And that is a higher standard of living for our children and to make sure that they can stand on their own two feet. Particularly, particularly, and I want to acknowledge the great work that Senator Cash has been doing in giving a 50 per cent uh, uh, incentive to apprenticeship, that apprenticeship scheme. That's totally been booked out, I understand. It's totally been filled, and I think we're extending that. And it's great to see that the Morrison government is trying to get uh, people back into apprenticeships. Because we openly acknowledge we don't want to rely on too much immigration for the sake of uh, filling jobs. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to commend this bill to the Senate because I know that this bill is one step, one step, another step that the Morrison government has been doing to clean up higher education in this country, to clean up higher education and the mess left behind by prior Labor governments that we're still cleaning up after those horrid neoliberal years under the Hawke-Keating government that basically left our country desolate. You know, a lot of this stuff we're only seeing it now, of course, but you know, it's very important that we stand up to that. So I'll just leave it at that. And Senator Farrell, any time you want me to go off script, you just let me know, because I'm happy to talk to you and hear about this or any topic, any time, any place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, we're now going back to Senator Polly. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm speaking tonight on the Tertiary Education Quality Standard Agency Charges Bill 2021 and the Tertiary Education Quality Standard Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021. 
It's always entertaining to follow on from Senator Rennick, but I'm going to put some facts on the record here tonight. The purpose of these bills is to establish a new charge to recover the costs of tertiary education, quality standards authority, risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities for registered higher education providers. This will transition the authority's operations from partial to full cost recovery over the next three years. The Tertiary Education Quality Standards Authority, TESCA, is Australia's independent national quality assurances and regulatory agency for higher education. All providers that offer higher education qualifications in or from Australia must be registered by TESCA. The bills give TESCA the capacity to collect and administer a new registered higher education provider charge and authorises regulations to be made to prescribe the amount and the method for setting charges. In what is becoming more and more common by this government, they have exceeded the majority of the detail about Sorry, they have excluded the majority of detail about the proposed cost recovery framework from the legislation. Instead, key details will be contained in regulations and a new Tesco charging guideline. With every chance that this Liberal government gets, they want to minimise transparency and accountability. It's the hallmark of the Morrison government. How can we, as senators, perform our job if we cannot properly scrutinise legislation? As such, Labor will be opposing this legislation. Now is not the right time to move to full cost recovery for higher education providers who have had a tumultuous 18 months. Majority of these providers are experiencing major financial difficulties because of COVID-19 pandemic and have been largely excluded from any financial support from the Morrison government and now they want to whack them with more fees. Now it's interesting to listen tonight to the contributions of the Liberal senators in this place. What they've said is that there's been acknowledgement that COVID-19 pandemic uh, has had an impact on tertiary education providers and, in general, university students. But still, they want to push through this legislation. Universities faced revenue losses of around $3 billion last year and laid off more than 17,300 staff. That's 17,300 people who lost their jobs because the Morrison government refuse to help. They're not only the researchers, the academics and tutors, it's the cafeteria workers, it's the librarians, it's the groundskeepers, it's the maintenance staff, it's the admin staff, it's cleaners. These are the jobs are not only in our cities but also in regional areas where our, some of our universities are based. That has a direct impact into those regional communities and there is a flow-on effect, a negative one throughout our economy. Worse still, higher revenue losses are expected this year as the pipeline of international students dwindles and uncertainty about our borders reopening remains very relevant here today. Because of the completely bungled vaccination rollout by those on the government benches and their refusal to implement a nationally coordinated quarantine system, these uncertainties are likely to remain for some considerable time. This is all in the context of the Morrison government's providing little, if any, support to this sector. We must not forget that the government changed the rules three times to exclude our public universities from JobKeeper. Education is our fourth largest export industry and it has been completely neglected by the Liberal government. Now they want to add greater costs to higher education, costs which will more than likely obviously flow on to students. Like with the Medicare and with superannuation, the Morrison Liberal government will take 
every chance they get to cut from our universities. They have really taken it in their stride, doubling costs for students, cutting government support to education, and in the middle of a pandemic when one of the main streams of income for universities effectively went to zero, they have nothing, nada. Our universities are engines for innovation and we rely on them to overcome problems into the future. We just need to look at our responses to COVID-19 and how important our researchers and academics have been in informing our response to this virus. But right now, they feel abandoned and kicked to the curb by the Morrison government. The government's proposal to move to an annual levy contradicts Tesco's guiding regulatory principles to take a risk, if reflective and variable touch approach. University peaks argue that an annual levy means the burden of regulatory costs will be carried by the lowest risk providers, which are large public universities. Haven't they endured enough? At the same time, private providers are concerned that increased application-based fees, which will rise by a whopping 700% in some cases, will threaten their financial viability entirely. For smaller providers, it could be their undoing. These institutions have flagged that providers' closure at a time when financial viability of many providers is already threatened by this pandemic will lead to higher costs to the government through reliance on the uh, transition, transition pr protection scheme. The Liberals are just seizing this as a cost recovery exercise, but what they don't realise is the impact that they will have. They don't care about the students that will have to face US-style debts or that they will threaten with the viability of their providers. Let's face it, the Morrison government has no plan for higher education. The Morrison government doesn't care about this sector as they have so ably demonstrated during this pandemic. Labor has a plan to boost the skills of our nation. Our $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund can help translate innovation into Australian businesses and into jobs. Labor also understands and appreciates the importance of commercialisation of research, and that is why we will also introduce a startup year, which will offer income contingent loans to 2,000 final year students or recent graduates to support their participation in exhilarated programs. This will help drive innovation and grow much needed links between universities and the startup community. In contrast, in their latest budget, the Liberals cut a further 10% from university funding. The government did bring forward some emergency research funding last year, but that has now stopped. In their biggest attack on universities and students to date, the Morrison government has made the cost of university degrees for thousands of students up to $60,000 for a bachelor degree with honours. Now, that is in stark contrast to the nonsense that Senator Reddick put forward in his speech tonight, because he is going to support this legislation. He has supported $60,000 bachelor degrees with honours being implemented in this country by this government. At the same time, these students are worrying about trying to save for a deposit for a home, looking for a job, and maybe even starting a family. And also, this is going to have an impact on mature age students who are considering going back and furthering their education. This will place an absolute unfair burden on young people trying to get a leg up. That's the result of this legislation if it is passed. What is also implicable in this is there will be actually less funding for the courses which the Morrison government is trying to promote. Universities receive 32% less to teach medical students, 17% less to teach maths to students. And Madam Deputy President, 
they will receive 16% less to teach engineering. How can they spin that? How can Mr Morrison spin that, that extra burden on students, the burden that is being placed on Australian universities? The cuts to funding to universities have meant that it is harder for poorer Tasmanian students to go to university. Over half of Tasmanian school leavers are not in work, training or further education. And our youth unemployment rate is the worst in the country. And what do we see from the Morrison government? Nothing to support Tasmanian young people and mature age students from going to university. In fact, they're adding to the burden. But at the same time, the most common feedback we receive from employers is that they can't find the right school leavers to fill jobs because they simply lack the skills. Now, nothing that the Liberals are doing is going to boost the skills of young Tasmanians. We have a potential to be world leaders in renewable energy export and manufacturing. But the lack of solid plan for jobs and training means that Tasmanians will be left behind by this government. At the very same time, here in Tasmania, the state government are now debating within the Tasmanian economy uh, and the Tasmanian community as to whether or not TAFE should stay in public hands. Combined with the state Liberal government and the Morrison government, what they are doing is disincentivising young Tasmanians from going on to university. So if they can't afford to go on to university and pay these exorbitant new costs, then they need to be able to have access to TAFE so that we can skill up young people in this state because after all we really do need to have the TAFEs and the universities working together with the business uh, sector to ensure we have the highly skilled workforce that is needed for our uh, industries going forward to strengthen our local economies because if we don't have young people in either TAFE, universities, or some sort of traineeship or having a job, then they end up being idle and getting into mischief. They need to have a future. That future, the door is always opened when people have the opportunity to pursue their educational goals. That is fulfilling for them as individuals and it is fulfilling for our economy for the health and well-being, for the social cohesion of our communities, that is what's needed. For people to be able to invest in a home, to be able to be a full participant in our community, in our economy, then we need to have our community as well educated as we possibly can. That's the strength of a nation. When they invest in education, more money should be going into um, education. We should be encouraging more people to study maths, the sciences and engineering. That's what should happen in this country. But what do we see from the Morrison government? We have a lot of spin. That's what we have. Smoke and mirrors trying to pretend they're all things to all people. But when you scratch the surface, like with this legislation, you see that this is not in the interest of the Australian community. It's certainly not in the interest of my community here in Tasmania. I oppose it and I implore the crossbench and the minor parties to vote this legislation down. This is not in our long-term interest. This is bad legislation. It is doing what the Morrison government always wants to do, and that is tear down our universities. We cannot allow this to happen. Labor would not allow this to happen. And I ask the crossbench to join with us in voting this legislation down. It is too important to our economy. We need to have highly educated people to bring us out of this pandemic because we have never relied on them more than Thank we you, do. Thank you, Senator right Polly. Now. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak uh, in support of the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 
2021 and the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021. Madam Deputy President, these bills which we are debating here this <coughs> evening will give effect to the Morrison Coalition's government's decision to implement increased cost recovery for the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, which was announced in the 2018-19 budget. As many of my colleagues have mentioned here this evening, the government has delayed the introduction of increased cost recovery for the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency on several occasions due to external factors, including the COVID-19 pandemic. At present, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standard Agency's cost recovery levels are very low, uh, at around 15 per cent of total costs, and the taxpayer currently bears the burden of funding the vast majority of Texas regulatory activities. I should say here, Madam Deputy President, I will be referring to the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency as TEXA from here on in. The increased cost recovery for TEXA will involve increasing TEXA's application-based fees to recover the true cost of these activities, um, and the increase to application-based fees will be enabled by a new fees determination to be issued by TEXA itself um, and will introduce a new annual charge on higher education providers to recover the cost of TEXA's risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities. And uh, As I say, the new charge is the subject of these bills. And later in my contribution uh, this evening, Madam Deputy President, I will go into uh, some of those regulatory activities that TEXA undertakes. Um, it is incredibly important work that TEXA does regulating our higher education sector in this country. They should be appropriately resourced to do that work. Uh, I have some concerns about how universities are complying with the legislative framework with which they should comply, um, and I certainly have views on TEXA's role in ensuring compliance. Um, it should also be noted that TEXA uh, will seek stakeholder feedback on a draft cost recovery implementation statement consistent with the Australian Government Cost Recovery Guidelines, and uh, this will be phased in over three years to moderate the immediate financial impact. Uh, there are obviously, Madam Deputy President, two bills that we are debating here uh, concurrently tonight. The charges bill will enable a new annual charge to be collected from registered higher education providers uh, to those listening along at home that most usually refers to our universities to recover the costs of Texas risk monitoring, compliance monitoring and investigations, complaint management, stakeholder engagement and other regulatory oversight activities. Um, these costs are not currently recovered by uh, Texas, as I've said, and are borne by the taxpayer. And the cost recovery bill will amend the Texa Act to enable Texa to levy, levy the annual charge created by the charges bill, which I just mentioned. Madam Deputy President, Texa has an incredibly important role to play in ensuring our education system, our higher education system in Australia, is of an internationally high standard. Universities play an increasingly influential role in Australia, and certainly listening to contributions from uh, across the chamber and on my own side this evening, I think we can all agree that um, universities play an important role. Since the early 1990s, the number of students in higher education has more than doubled. Around 40 per cent of Australians now have a bachelor's degree or higher. And with the influx of international students coming to Australia to study on our shores in recent decades, higher education has also become one of our biggest exports. Undoubtedly, that industry and the business model universities have developed as a result of its growth are under pressure due to the impact of COVID-19 and the inability of international students to come to Australia since the beginning of the year 2020. But it's critical that Australian universities maintain strong standards of academic rigour, and TEXA has a significant role to play here in regulating our universities so that they do maintain those very strong standards. Australian taxpayers invest a huge amount of money into our universities and to support Australians to undertake higher education. In return for that investment, the core duty of universities is to provide a relevant, rigorous and challenging education to anyone who wants or chooses to go to university. For some, uh, they may go to university to pursue uh, higher learning based on an interest um, for personal growth, some, some sort of passion. Um, but in the main, 
Most people do go to university to learn and train for a career. Those students need our universities to be delivering the highest quality education, and our nation needs those students to be coming out of university well equipped to join the workforce, fill skills gaps, and hopefully create and build businesses and job opportunities for others. And I've been a little disappointed by some of the rhetoric uh, on the opposition benches tonight, trying to say that this bill is about undermining uh, the quality of, of what universities are providing to students. As I said, I think we can all agree that universities have an important role to play in educating Australians. It puzzles me that those on the opposite side don't understand how these bills that we are debating here tonight in supporting TEXA in undertaking their regulatory activities actually strengthen the quality of an education that our young Australians are, or all Australians are being provided with. One concern, though, Madam Deputy President, that unfortunately continues to arise from our university sector is a worrying lack of commitment to free speech and academic freedom. And again, this is an area where TEXA has a role to play. Indeed, this government has ensured that TEXA has a role to play uh, in developing the French model code and ensuring that universities are complying with that code. Freedom of speech and academic freedom are fundamentally important to the delivery of a quality higher education. Students at universities, particularly uh, but not only in disciplines such as humanities and the law, must be exposed to a range of different perspectives, including those which challenge their preconceived notions. This is something, Madam Deputy President, that I spoke about in my maiden speech to the Senate as a growing issue just over two years ago. Unfortunately, since then, we seem to be hearing more and more stories of university campuses becoming havens to groupthink, authoritarianism and cancel culture. I want to pay credit to the government and the Education Minister, Alan Tudge, for recognising this as a major concern. And I should note, uh, Madam Deputy President, that certainly um, the Education Minister preceding Mr Tudge, Dan Tian, also played a significant role in this um, piece of work as well. Both of those ministers have taken steps to develop and implement a model code for academic freedom and free speech for Australian universities, as I alluded to earlier, the French model code. Unfortunately, though, we've subsequently seen very poor take-up of that code. It seems that while some university leaders get it, there are many others who don't. The most recent example uh, is the Australian Defence Force being prevented from setting up a stall at the market day of the Australian National University just down the road. Certainly, Senator Zazelja, shame. The university has thrown its hands up in the air and claimed that there's nothing that can be done about the ADF being banned from their campus because it was a student union's decision. Yet these student unions are recipients of significant amounts of funding through their universities by virtue of the student services and amenities fee. Now, if students want to protest or make the case against the ADF being able to have a stall at a university, that's perfectly fine. They are more than welcome to do that. But the ADF is a hugely respected institution in Australia. It is highly unlikely that the view that the ADF having a stall at the university equates to supporting militarism, as was claimed by the student union, is shared by all of the students at the university who pay the student services and amenities fee and fund the student union. In fact, I suspect many students would have relatives and family who have served in our defence forces and have the greatest respect for what the ADF and our defence personnel do to maintain peace and security in our region and ensure that we can go to university and have those freedoms that we do in this country. Deferring to the power of the student union is just one way in which many universities seem to lack a commitment to free speech. In June this year, I was shocked to read comments in the paper from the University of Melbourne Vice-Chancellor talking about the university's plan to further water down its free speech policy. In defending this move, the Vice-Chancellor referred to the damage and harm caused by questions being pursued on the topics of sex and gender and claimed that the emotional distress and anguish caused by inappropriate words being spoken and written is very real. 
Madam Deputy President, such arguments are completely incompatible with both free speech and the pursuit of academic learning. If any point of view can be silenced simply by making a claim that the opinion in question causes someone distress and harm, there is no limit to the amount of average people with normal, everyday views that you can silence. All you need to shut down debate is to claim oppression and have a Twitter account. It's a levelling up of the well-known tactic of seeking redress for being offended. These days, you're not just offended, you've been harmed if someone has a different opinion. Due process, proper scrutiny of claims and any concept of open debate go out the window as administrators, bureaucrats and, sadly, Australia's universities rush to protect themselves from claims that they have failed to provide a safe environment. How can a university be committed to free speech and academic freedom while a vice-chancellor is speaking about the damage and harm of questions being pursued and inappropriate words being spoken or written? I raised this question with the Department of Education and Senate Estimates, and I have to say I was amazed to receive from the department a response effectively dismissing my concern about the free speech impacts of those statements by the Vice-Chancellor and the University of Melbourne's policies. And that's why this bill, these bills that we're discussing here this evening are so important, because TEXA does have an incredibly important role to play going forward in the adherence of universities to their free speech obligations. And I certainly hope that TEXA is prepared to look a little more closely than the department has at the obvious threats to free speech like the ones that I have just mentioned here this evening. So in summary, Madam Deputy President, the two bills that we are debating here this evening, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021, are important bills that will give effect to the government's decision to implement increased cost recovery for TEXA. Uh, which was initially delayed due to um, external factors, including the COVID-19 pandemic. It's incredibly important that we have a well-resourced and efficiently resourced regulatory body for our higher education providers in this country. As I said, Madam Deputy President, two years ago, in my first contribution to this place, I raised my concern about the erosion of academic freedom on our university campuses. I mentioned uh, that 10 years ago, when I was studying at university, while my views might have been dismissed by my fellow students, uh, most of them of a different political ilk to me, uh, and they were dismissed on the basis of my own political ilk, at least we were able to have the conversation. I fear that at our university campuses now, the conversations, the debates are not happening. And that results in graduates that are only ever provided with one perspective on the world and isn't the very reason why people go to university to expand their horizons, to expose themselves to new ideas, because it is by exposing yourself to those new ideas and to different points of view that you can develop a better understanding of how you think the world operates. If we want our university graduates coming out of higher education with a sound, robust idea of where their place is in the world, how they are going to impact on their community, then we need bodies like TEXA willing to ensure that our universities are places that encourage free academic inquiry. If that isn't the case, if our university students can't have the debate, if our universities aren't encouraged to provide students with the opportunity and the space to have that debate, then I think that that is a very sorry state of affairs for free speech in this country and on our university campuses. I feel about this very strongly, Madam Deputy President, as I'm sure you can tell. And on that basis, I commend these two bills that we're debating here this evening to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So I rise to speak uh, tonight on the TEXA charges and cost recovery bills. So these bills give effect to the government's decision to implement increased cost recovery for TEXA, 
announced in the 2018-19 budget. They're not new, they're not a surprise, and have actually been paused three times due to the COVID pandemic and its impact on the sector. What these bills give effect to is the government's decision to implement cost recovery arrangements for Texa. So what does this involve? Because listening to this debate throughout today, I'm not quite sure those opposite actually understand that. So what we'll be doing is increasing Texas application-based fees to recover the true cost of these activities. But in respect to some of the smaller the providers with smaller student loads, these fees will be discounted, ensuring that we reduce the financial barriers to course innovation. There'll also be the implementation of per hour charges for compliance assessments. Now, these will be waived if no compliance action is taken. There'll be a new annual charge to recover the cost of Texas risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities, which are not covered by application-based or compliance fees. So the new annual charge is the subject of these bills. So prior to the COVID-19 fee waiver, which is actually in place until the 31st of December this year, Texas cost recovery was incredibly low. In fact, it was around 15 per cent of total costs. So with these changes, Texas' level of cost recovery will increase to around 90 per cent of regulatory costs and 75 per cent of total costs. A small number of non-regulatory activities will continue to be fully funded by the government, which equates to being fully funded by the taxpayer, including those who didn't get the benefit of attending university. And these include actions to deter third-party cheating services and also promote integrity in the face of external threats, including cybersecurity and foreign interference. The cost of these activities, around $3.9 million per year, will not be recovered from higher education providers. So, as I said, the government has delayed the increase uh, of, of cost recovery for Texas on several occasions due to external factors, including the COVID-19 pandemic. And these delays have been occurring, though, at a time when the Morrison government is in fact providing record funding to Australian universities—$20.4 billion in 2021, an increase of 17 per cent, up from $17.3 billion in 2019. This includes an additional billion-dollar boost to support university research, which is flowing to the universities this year. And under our Job Ready Graduate Package, more Australians are studying at our universities than ever before, over 800,000 students this year. It's an increase of 5 per cent of total students since 2019, uh, 2020, but commencements of new students are actually up by 7 per cent. But what's really important here to note is that more Australians are studying the courses that are actually likely to get them a job. Outrageous, I know, that we might want to focus on university degrees that actually ensure that graduates are employable and are educated in fields that the market is actually in search of. So when we look at some of those areas, what are the levels of commencements that are up? So we're looking at 14 per cent in science, 13 per cent in IT, 10 per cent in engineering, 14 per cent in agriculture, 11 per cent in education and 8 per cent in health all significant increases in new commitments, commencements in areas where the jobs of the future will be. And science in particular is particularly well funded under the JRG package. Funding's up by 8 per cent, more than the average cost of delivering a science degree and 10 per cent more than the cost of an engineering degree. And these are some of the most profitable fields under the new arrangements. So on average, base funding across all fields is 5.6 per cent more than the average cost of teaching a bachelor degree. So claims that the job ready package is discouraging enrolments in science and engineering are in fact not correct. What a surprise. As per usual from the opposite side, they haven't quite got those facts correct. And the enrolments show, as I said, that nationally enrolments in science are up and enrolments in engineering are up. 
And thanks to our record investment and reforms, Australian universities are actually in a better financial position than anyone expected. There are a number of indications that 2020 outcomes were better than anticipated 12 months ago. So I'll just put this in actual figures for those opposite. For 2020, a number of universities are reporting surpluses. These include $259 million for Monash University, University of Melbourne $178 million, University of Queensland $83 million, University of WA $58 million, University of Adelaide $41 million, Flinders University $35 million, Edith Cowan University $24 million, University of Southern Queensland $13 million, and Western Sydney University $13 million. All are reporting surpluses, despite claims to the contrary from those opposite and what was originally being proclaimed by the sector. And we've heard during the debate today those opposite raise cuts to the higher education. And as we know, that is simply untrue. They just make it up. Our boost to research funding, which accounts for the decrease in higher education funding as shown in budget paper number one, this was not a bring forward, it was a new one-off stimulation. And the figures in the budget papers exclude the higher education loan program outlays, including help outlays shows the government overall funding to universities is 20, in 2021 is $20.4 billion. As I said, a significant increase, and in fact, it's an increase of 37 per cent since 2013. So at present, TESCA's cost recovery levels are currently very low, at around 15 per cent. The taxpayer currently bears the burden of funding the vast majority of Texas regulatory activities. The taxpayer. So this includes university graduates, but more importantly, the taxpayers include those that never had the benefit of attending a university. So increased cost recovery for TEXA will involve increasing application-based fees to recover the true cost of these activities. And the increase to these application-based fees will be enabled by a new fees determination to be issued by TEXA. We're looking to introduce a new annual charge on higher education providers to recover the costs of Texas risk monitoring and regulatory oversights. And the new annual charge is the subject of these bills. Texas will continue to seek stakeholder feedback on a draft cost recovery implementation statement consistent with the Australian government cost recovery guidelines. And whilst higher education providers are likely to criticise the new annual charge, it's actually going to be phased in over three years to moderate any financial impact. And the charge will be calculated each year for each provider. And the amount charged will change each year and depend on a number of factors, including Tesco's estimated costs for the year in question, the number of registered providers, but also the number of enrolled students each provider actually has. So if the proposal outlined in Texas consultation were to be implemented unamended, it's estimated that the vast majority of providers, around 80 per cent, will pay an annual charge of between $25,000 and $35,000 a year once fully phased in, so from 2024 onwards. The annual charge will be phased in, as I said, over three years, commencing on 1 January 2022. So from 1 January next year, they'll be looking to recover 20 per cent of the costs. This will rise to 50 per cent in 2023 and 100 per cent from 1 January 2024. Having gone through those estimated surpluses of a number of those universities, it's important to know that it's only a small number of very large universities could see an annual charge of up to around $45,000 a year. So the total funds expected to be recovered through the annual charge currently estimated around $5.7 million a year, once fully phased in. So, just so we're clear, with regards to the charges bill, this will enable a new annual charge to be collected from registered higher education providers to recover the costs of Texas risk monitoring, compliance monitoring investigations, complaint management, stakeholder engagement, and other regulatory oversight activities. These costs, again, are currently not being recovered and are borne by the taxpayer. 
The annual charge will be based, phased in over three years. As I just said, 2022 will see 20 per cent, 2023 will see 50 per cent, 2024 will reach the 100 per cent mark. This will be phased in to ensure that the final financial impact is moderated. And the amount of the annual charge will be prescribed by regulation, setting out the formula for the charge, and this will be made through the Governor General through the Executive Council. The second bill, the Cost Recovery Bill, will enable TEXA to levy the annual charge created by the Charges Bill. The amendments will require a higher education provider to pay the annual charge as and when it falls due, including any penalties for late payment, and failure by an education provider to pay the charge will constitute a breach of its conditions of registration. I commend the bills to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards, Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021. I was very pleased to be speaking this evening because the university sector is terrifically important to this nation. Uh, prior to COVID impacts, Australia enjoyed 1.5 million students enrolled, of which 31 per cent were international students. And in the 2017 uh, economy, this accounted for $38 billion. Now, that is a significant uh, sector for the Australian economy. But not only does it bring dollars to Australia, it brings lifelong relationships. In fact, I can tell you a, a, an interesting story of an engineering firm in the Gatton area who creates uh, stock crushers and crates and other agricultural machinery and equipment. And they would get students down from the Gatton University. And these students came from all over the world. And now this engineering firm exports to all over the world, and not coincidentally, but to the very countries where these students came from, who went back to their own nations, their own agricultural industries, and talked about the terrific work that was being done by this business. And so now they export um, to probably every country that you can imagine. And so this relationship of students can't be undervalued. It can't be overvalued. It is terrifically important to the relationships uh, that we have as a small population nation. Uh, those students come here, they learn about us, our culture, our values, and then they take those back to home. And Australia remains uh, somewhere that they speak about as a warm place with great relationships and great businesses. Those opportunities are something that we should value as we uh, export those educational opportunities. We also have uh, six top fields of education in Australia. Uh, management and commerce, 266,989 students were enrolled. Society and culture, 197,988 students. Health, 181,453 students enrolled. Natural and physical sciences, 88,013 students. Education, 86,915 students, and engineering and related technology, 84,875 students. Now, this industry also provides 63,469 jobs in, higher, in the higher education sector. This is a terrifically important sector. I want to congratulate the minister on the changes that were made recently to the structure of fees associated with different university degrees. And we made a very conscious decision to realign uh, uh, the fees against jobs that were needed in Australia. Because we know that the amount of uh, hex debt sitting on the Australian uh, balance sheet, the Australian nation's balance sheet, has been growing. And that's a reflection of the number of students who were finishing but not uh, ensuring a job in that chosen field or generating the income that would allow them to start paying back those fees. So 
If we're going to invest in people and invest in their education, the most important thing that we can do for anybody in their life, then it's important that we match them with an industry that they're going to be able to work in. So I thought that was a terrific, um, a terrific change. And as somebody who has uh, children at, at, of university age uh, and going through that process, it's something that I um, have reflected on and, and watched a great deal. And I'm delighted to see more young people enrolling in degrees uh, that will take them to a purposeful uh, life, because that is what we wish, of course, for all of our children. And, but education provides more than that. It provides the ability for people to transcend wherever they may find themselves in, uh, starting off in life, whatever position their families have, whatever uh, circumstance or geographic location they have, education can provide them with a pathway to transcend their original life and to reach their full potential. And isn't that what we want for every person in Australia? To reach their full potential. And education, whether it be starting out on distance education because you're a geographically isolated student, or ending up at a university somewhere in this nation. Now, in Northern Australia, we are incredibly fortunate to have some terrific universities, and whether it be JCU, uh, USQ, Charles Darwin, Curtin University, these are all incredibly uh, valuable educational institutions. Uh, the JCU Medical School in particular populates not just Northern Australia with medical students and then rural GPs through its training programs, which is recognised as being one of the best in the land, and particularly because it achieves its core purpose, which is to educate and then populate medical practices uh, in northern Australia and regional Australia. So they do a terrific job in that regard. The other thing uh, that JCU does is it is the only university in Australia which can claim to be number one uh, university in the world for uh, a, a training a program, and that is, of course, the Marine Sciences uh, Faculty. Number one in the world, the only Australian university that can make that claim. It's something that I am terrifically proud of and, uh, and one that we have been providing uh, funding and support for over generations. Uh, one of my grandfathers was the first chancellor of James Cook University. But as a mining, uh, a mining engineer, uh, I reflect on the number of uh, mining engineering courses at JCU, and I have made this observation to the, to the faculties there that being so close to the Northwest Minerals Province and all of those terrific uh, uh, rare earths uh, and traditional hard rock mining of, of copper and uh, zinc lead, silver, gold, all of these that are so important in the uh, modern economies that, uh, that we should have more mining degrees at the James Cook University. So Northern Australia is somewhere that has some really unique um, uh, expertise and I certainly look at uh, uh, the, the place Northern Australia holds in the ge geographic a centre of relevance, that being around the tropics, uh, around the world. And we have some of the biggest cities and population densities around the world sit within the same band that Cairns and Townsville and Darwin sit in. And so our expertise, our natural expertise in tropical, tropical medicine, a tropical architecture, uh, mining in the tropics, uh, all of those expertises are ones that I think we should be continuing to invest in uh, and that Northern Australia has a real advantage in. And It would be terrific to, to see us encourage uh, those, those expertise and those universities to see more students come to Australia, a stable nation, a welcoming nation with a real expertise uh, in educating people from around the world. Uh, in fact, we bring around uh, 3,000 overseas students every year to train in medicine uh, in, uh, in J at JCU and other universities uh, in Australia. What a terrific uh, 
education to be providing and skill set to be sending back around the world. Now, listening to some of the debate uh, this afternoon and this evening, uh, I have heard a couple of unusual comments, uh, but of course I'm just putting it down to just another Labor lie. So reducing uni funding I will put in the same bucket as those other uh, uh, Labor lies, the cashless debit pension card, uh, which I found the Senate vote where it was the coalition, it was the coalition that voted against a cashless debit pension card, and it was Labor and the Greens that in fact voted for a cashless debit pension card, and yet that is the current Labor lie that they're spreading on social media at every opportunity. Uh, order, Senator Macdonald. Senator Chisholm is on his feet. Senator Chisholm. Order, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, we're dealing with the uh, legislation at hand. This has got nothing to do with the legislation at all. Um, so I don't know what tangent the senator thinks they're on. Senator Chisholm, I recognise that we do have very wide-ranging debates in this place, but I will point uh, Senator Macdonald to the uh, substance of the bills that we are discussing here this evening in making her remarks. Thank you so much for bringing me back to, uh, back to that uh, piece of legislation, because I was distracted um, by some of the uh, baseless claims that the opposition has made. Um, around university funding. Uh, I put it in the same bucket as the decreased Medicare funding lie that the opposition has also made. But turning back to this particular legislation, I think it would be important that we reflect on why it's important that uh, we should be looking at a, a cost recovery model for Texa. Because we have already, and I have spent some time reflecting on the importance of the university education sector here in Australia and why it's important that we have a body uh, that oversights and holds to high account the standards uh, and the university sector so that it continues to be an important um, uh, education and, and uh, jobs providing and place for our young people to, to be. So this cost recovery uh, legislation will allow the, uh, the nation to have a, a better and more direct collection of these costs, as I say. Currently, they're recouping only around 15 per cent of the total costs of this uh, regulatory activity. And so by having a pathway through to uh, greater cost collection uh, means that uh, it also allows stakeholders to have a greater sense of ownership uh, and consultation in that process. So the stakeholder feedback on the draft cost recovery implementation, implementation statement uh, will provide an avenue for stakeholders to have that. Um, it will take three years to uh, phase that in. But can I tell you in other industries uh, that I'm involved with, this process has allowed uh, industry to come back to government with uh, more modern, innovative and uh, technical ways to be able to uh, assist government with uh, providing a better way to identify the issues that government seeks to regulate uh, and then a, a better and often more cost-effective way in order to make those uh, to achieve those cost recoveries. So, you know, I see this as a very positive step, um, and this, this bill, the Cost Recovery Bill, will amend the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011, the TEXA Act, to enable TEXA to levy the annual charge created by the Charges Bill. And it will require a higher education provider to pay the annual charge as and when it falls due, including any penalties for late payment. Failure by a higher education provider to pay the charge will cons constitute a breach of its conditions of registration. And this is, again, a, an important part of what we're seeking to achieve here, which is to ensure that the Australian education sector, which is so important, not just to Australians, be they young Australians starting out on their career, seeking to commence their 
their professional um, accreditation and, and um, training, or a more mature Australian who's seeking to retrain into a new sector, or those, those uh, non-Australians that I've started my speech talking about, who come to Australia, who may work in an industry while they're doing their studies, but at the very least they will be exposed to the great Australian way of life, the great Australians that they meet, and they will take that back with them, not just with this terrific education, but they will take back the Australian values, the Australian way of doing things and Australian friendships that will ensure that Australia Post continues to send cards and parcels around the world at Christmas and other holiday times. So the regulation and the assurance of these, the quality of the education sector is critical for Australia on so many levels. And it is for that reason that I rec recommend this a bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I couldn't help uh, but reflect on the importance of education as Senator, my good friend, Senator Macdonald, the uh, envoy for Northern Australia, was, uh, was giving her speech. And it actually took me back uh, to uh, some reading I've done recently in relation to Neville Bonner, who was the first Indigenous parliamentarian elected to federal parliament. And uh, this month, this month is in fact the 50th anniversary of Neville Bonner's swearing in as a senator of the federal parliament from my home state of Queensland and from my party, uh, the successor of the Liberal Party the Liberal National Party of Queensland. And when one reads and reflects on Neville Bonner's story, one of the things that leaps out is he managed to obtain his position in this place with the benefit of only one year's formal education. One year's formal education. And he tell, he has told his story of when he was a young boy growing up outside of Lismore and uh, a local police sergeant or detective encouraged his mother to send Neville and his siblings along to the local state school at Lismore. And they got dressed, they went to the school, and immediately the parents of the white children descended on the school to take their kids out, to take their kids out. And Neville Bonner described the indescribable feelings he had when his opportunity for education was denied to him at that point, and that was something he carried with him for the rest of his life. But notwithstanding that, he still managed to achieve election to this place and to serve his party, his country uh, and the people of Queensland. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, we can't have a debate or should not have a debate in this place in relation to higher education, universities, etc., without uh, certainly from my party talking about Sir Robert Gordon Menzies and his role in relation to the university sector. And Menzies said, and I quote, our great function when we approach the problem of education is to equalise opportunity to equalise opportunity, to see that every boy and girl has a chance to develop whatever faculties he or she may have, because this will be a tremendous contribution to the good life of the nation." End quote. And I just want to, before I go into the particulars of the bill, just reflect on that quote and what it means in terms of uh, my party's philosophy with respect to education and the university sector and the philosophy that I subscribe to. And that is first this concept of equalise opportunity. We often talk about providing equal opportunity. We need to strive to provide equal opportunity to everyone in this country, regardless of their background, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their gender, regardless of whether or not they live in the bush or the city, a regional area, the outer suburbs. We need to 
pro provide equal opportunity to everyone in this country. But sometimes we neglect to talk about how we go about equalising opportunity, how we go about actually assisting and helping people, regardless of their background, our young Australians, to make the most of their opportunities, to equalise that opportunities. And, and Menzies hit the nail right on the head when he talked about education, the role education plays in doing that, in terms of equalising opportunity. And then the second limb of that quote that he refers to is for every boy and girl to develop whatever faculties he or she may have. And there's a recognition that there's individual responsibility involved in that. It is up to the individual to make the most of whatever God-given faculties they have, to make the most of those faculties, to work hard, to study hard in whatever field, whatever endeavour, and to progress uh, their life uh, as far as they can using uh, the faculties which uh, they've given to the best of their ability. And then the third element is by doing that, by doing that, by equalising that opportunity, by each boy and girl developing their faculties to the best of their ability, they're contributing a great good to the nation. So there's a contribution to the nation. So there are three elements in terms of, in terms of that philosophy in relation to the role of education. And those uh, elements were invoked um, by Gord, Robert Gordon Menzies in that quote. And let us never forget, let us never forget those on the other side will invoke the spirit of Gough Whitlam and good luck to them, that's fine. Um, but let us never forget that uh, under Sir Robert Gordon Menzies in this country, there was an explosion of the tertiary sector, an absolute explosion of the tertiary sector. The University of New England was established. The Monash University was established. Macquarie University, La Trobe University, Newcastle University, Flinders University. A host of new universities came online. There was also an explosion in the number of university students going from 53,790 to 88,230 in 1966, an increase of 35,000 in just six years. Extraordinary increase in the number of university students and also in terms of female participation. So there was 19.7 per cent of university students in 1952 were women. It, by 1966, that had increased to 25.9 per cent, and of course that was part of the journey of reaching the um, reaching the levels that we see today. And I couldn't also help but reflect, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, upon the speech uh, that Senator Chandler gave uh, in relation to this topic and her great advocacy in favour of freedom of speech on our canvases. And it reminded me of, of a quote which Menzies gave, that the mission of our Sorry, universities— Senator Scar, Senator Scar, 7.20. I propose that the Senate now adjourn and you'll be in adjournment. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Over the last week, we've witnessed many moments which capture the essence of the Olympic spirit. Moments which inspire and bring joy to the world, even during these dark days of pandemics and lockdowns. A 20-year-old Tasmanian talking, taking on the greatest female swimmer ever and winning twice. Dutch world champion Seafan <laughs> Hassan tripping and f falling in her 1,500-metre heat before getting to her feet and miraculously winning the race. Last well night, we should have had the opportunity to witness another of those unique Olympic <laughs> moments. 18-year-old Roviel Detanamu could have become the first woman in 20 years to qualify to represent Nauru at the Olympic Games. She could have been in Tokyo, proving that if you have the talent and the work ethic, even a teenager from a nation of 12,000 people can make the Olympics and compete on the same stage as world champions from China and the USA. But we didn't witness that, because Roviel was denied the opportunity to become an Olympian one of the most celebrated and respected titles in the world. That honour was instead given to a 43-year-old biological male, Laurel Hubbard, who was allowed by the IOC to participate in the women's 87-plus kilogram category. 
Hubbard now has for life the title of being an Olympian, solely due to the extreme advantages Hubbard has as a biological male. Nobody can dispute that Hubbard is male, is miles off Olympic standard for a male, yet somehow qualified for the Olympics for the first time as a 43-year-old. The only explanation for that is that male advantage, which is by definition an unfair advantage in women's competition. Despite the IOC admitting this week that its trans inclusion guidelines are not fit for purpose, they tried to obscure discussion of these facts through a guide given out to journalists at the event, warning them not to use the term biological male or refer to trans athletes being born male, and extraordinarily claim that there is no evidence that trans athletes who are male have an unfair advantage in female sport. Those who claim that Hubbard taking a female athlete's Olympic spot is inclusive conveniently overlook that there is an Olympic event specifically designed for 109 plus kilogram male weightlifters that Hubbard was eligible for if good enough. The only thing stopping Hubbard from being included in the men's 109 plus kilo category was the minor problem of being more than 100, kilo, uh, more than 100 kilograms off the standard required. Competitive sport, let alone the Olympics, is not a participation exercise. Yet what we saw last night was a sub-elite lifter competing in the wrong sex category and the wrong weight category, displacing a female from one of the world's smallest nations so that the IOC could call themselves inclusive. You cannot have a clearer example of why we have separate female and male sporting competition and why it's so unfair to female athletes to allow males into their categories. It's been disturbing to watch activists and sports administrators, including here in Australia, twist and change the very meaning of words to pretend there is no reason why women need or should expect to have competitive single-sex sport. First, they claim without evidence that it's more inclusive to operate women's sport based on gender identity rather than sex. Then they label it offensive to talk about biological males and females, taking away the language needed for women to raise objections. Now we're seeing them claim that there's no unfair advantage to males competing in women's sport, apparently unless they dominate every competition they enter. Well, by that logic, we wouldn't even worry about drug testing anyone unless they win an Olympic medal. Never mind the obvious unfairness of allowing someone to reach a level of sport well beyond what they are capable of in their own sex ca category, displacing high calibre female athletes along the way. This incredible new standard ignores everything we know about fairness in sport. It must come as a shock to the sprinter disqualified for leaving the blocks a millisecond early or the long jumper who oversteps by a centimetre. Those athletes don't gain a fraction of the advantage of a male competing in women's sports. On one hand, the IOC knows that starting a race one hundredth of a second early is an unfair advantage worthy of disqualification, regardless of whether that athlete would have finished first or last. On the other hand, female athletes at every level are being told fairness in their sport, sporting competition is of less importance than being inclusive of males who choose not to play men's sport. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And before I start making my contribution around independent assessment, I just wanted to um, inform the Senate that Laurel Hubbard, a transgender Olympian from New Zealand, is quoted as saying, I just want to be myself. I just want to be me. I think it's important um, that he, here in the Senate that we practice tolerance and understand uh, that people that are transgender are just being themselves. It's not an opportunity to come in and push a, a right-wing agenda without having the decency to reflect on the journey that transgender people make and the courage that they display to be able to become themselves. Yeah. Now, I was, I'm talking about, today I'm talking about independent assessments. And on the 9th of 
That's in de independent assessments under the NDI NDIS. And on the 9th of July, um, from the Disability Reform Minister's meeting, there was a um, communique um, in which the now minister, uh, Senator Reynolds, uh, indicated through that communique and also um, through her own uh, statement that the council's, uh, the, the minister's meeting had agreed not to proceed with independent assessments. Now, as I understand it, it was on the back of the NDIS independent advisory council's advice, and I'm really very um, uh, grateful for the decision of the disability um, council's um, minister's decision on that, because that is a, that was an issue that was really um, causing great angst within the disability community. And I think on that day, and when that announcement came out by the federal minister, Min Senator Reynolds, that the disability community breathed a collective sigh of relief because they were united, united in their opposition to independent assessments. Now, the introduction of the NDIS in March 2013 was the most significant social policy reform of this century. From the very beginning, the scheme has had at its heart the needs and aspirations of people with disability. However, when the federal government decided to go down the path of independent assessments, this represented a dramatic shift away from the core principles of the scheme. The government's proposal was to make every participant of the NDIS undergo an assessment conducted by a stranger for up to three hours. Now, the government gave numerous shifting reasons for this dramatic change in policy. The then Minister for the NDIS, Mr Stuart Robert, cited the need for improved flexibility and equality when he announced the trial of independent assessments in August last year. In May this year, the current minister, Senator Reynolds, then claimed that independent assessments needed to be induced, introduced because the NDIS plans relied too heavy, heavily on empathy from public servants. In the lead-up to the recent meeting of the disability ministers, Senator Reynolds shifted to a new reason, that the changes were needed to make the scheme economically sustainable. I do have to, though, give some credit where credit is due, because when uh, Senator Reynolds took on the portfolio of the NDIS, she did undertake to do something that the previous minister, Mr Robert, failed to do, and that was to do some consultation with the disability sector. She undertook to do that. She halted um, the trials of the independent assessment while she was doing that consultation. But through that period, the NDIS Independent Advisory Council came to the decision and made the recommendation to the disability ministers that the independent assessments would do not proceed. And they will not, as I understand it. But we have to make sure that there is proper co-design in any changes Order, or reform Brown, going forward. Time has expired. Uh, we have Senator Rice remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight on the issue of human rights, as is my habit on Tuesday nights, even when I am here remotely. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. I want to particularly speak tonight about an incredibly concerning development that we've seen in West Papua. A story broke today in The Guardian about an Indonesian police chief, Untung Sangaji, accused of brutal violence against West Papuan people, who received training from the Australian Federal Police at the Jakarta Centre for Law Enforcement Cooperation, or JCLEC. I'd like to quote some of the Guardian's report. When questioned later about the alleged mistreatment, the officer in charge of the operation, the Maralke police chief, Untung Sangaji, reportedly told local media, in future, if there are further acts of treason, I will shoot them in the legs. They have insulted the Indonesian nation. Never mind mistreatment. I will shoot them dead if ordered to shoot them. If necessary, we will chop them up. 
One of the people who was detained by this police chief, a West Papuan activist, died in custody in an operation overseen by Untung Sungaji. And what is very clear from the reporting and should be of concern to all of us here is that this abusive cop maintains a close relationship with the Australian Federal Police. Sangaji told The Guardian, we continue to work really closely with the AFP. We have their phone numbers. If they are following a people smuggling suspect, they call us and know we have to take the call. This makes my blood boil and it should horrify every Australian that our government and our police are funding and training and working hand in hand with human rights abusers. Untung Sangaji has also been associated with attacks on trans people in Aceh. Again, the Guardian article said, in 2018, the Inter Indonesian National Commission on Human Rights condemned the violent and humiliating request, arrests of 12 transgender women in the province of Aceh, saying that Indonesian and Sharia police had acted outside the law and their actions were inhumane. Sangaji was a local police chief at the time and according to reports, police in his team cut the women's hair in public, forced them to wear men's clothes and coached them to behave like real men. I feel so much hurt and sorrow for these women and the attacks they experience. Everyone deserves to be safe and to be able to express they are. No one should face these transgender and transphobic attacks. And I think in particular, Acting Deputy President, we should all remember that trans women are women. So I'll be using every tool under the Senate's authority to scrutinise the information covered in The Guardian this morning and ensure the Parliament brings much needed oversight to the AFP. And tomorrow the Senate's going to vote on my OPD for all records of Untung Sengaji's participation in AFP-sponsored training and to provide all communication between Sengaji and the AFP. And I'll be demanding a clear guarantee from the AFP that they won't be providing any future training to him. If the Morrison government and the AFP do not act swiftly when presented with the clear evidence against this violent cop, it will confirm our government's complete disregard for human rights. But of course, the brutality of this one police chief is just one element of the broader issue of the right of the people of West Papua to self-determination and their ongoing struggle for justice against the oppression of the Indonesian government. The Guardian article this morning summarised, West Papua is at its worst since the Suharto era and somehow the world just doesn't notice, says Veronica Komen, an Indonesian human rights lawyer who lives in exile in Sydney. There are at least 60,000 internally displaced people right now in West Papua, she says. They are mostly undocumented and in the jungle facing malnutrition, hunger and sickness. And just recently, a two-year-old boy died. I want to salute the brave activists who are putting their lives on the line in West Papua and say to you that the Australian Greens see you and we are with you in solidarity. We want to see the Indonesian government withdraw all military troops from West Papua. We want to see full access for UN and other independent human rights observers. And most importantly, we want to see full self-determination for the people of West Papua. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise tonight to speak about something that may seem a little out of place. Uh, in the middle of a cold Canberra winter in my home state of Western Australia. We've just had uh, one of the wettest Julys on record. Uh, we, we're seeing you know, good times out in the agricultural sector, but with good rains over the winter also come the uh, good production, uh, particularly in our bushland and grassland, that leads to potentially high fuel loads come next summer. So I rise tonight to talk about bushfires and the bushfire risk. Um, when my dad was, was um, managing the large coastal leases uh, to, the, to the west of our farm down in Pemberton, they would burn in the spring um, and they would think about what that, uh, sorry, they would burn in the autumn and they would think about what that burning in autumn would do for the next spring uh, in terms of the pasture and the growth and the control of the fire risk in that uh, area. 
So earlier this year, I rose in this place to discuss the devastating bushfires that struck uh, communities in Perth North East uh, earlier this year. In particular, I sought to draw attention to the profound loss and suffering um, un occurring to those people and the bravery of the many firefighters and volunteers who stood on the front line of those bushfires. This was an event that will not and should not be forgotten, just as all the major fires we've endured in this country should not be forgotten. And in that same light, we owe it to those who have suffered this loss and those who have risked their lives to act with an air of preparedness. So now is the right time to think about the future coming summer. I had the pleasure uh, last week to sit down with a former member of this place, uh, a good friend of many in this place, uh, former Senator Chris Back, and with him, uh, a Roger Underwood, uh, someone who has an extraordinary history uh, and track record of land management and fire management, uh, particularly in Western Australia, and talk through some of the issues that do confront uh, Australia. And we know that often the emphasis can be placed on the new equipment, the aerial firefighting techniques. And all these are valuable, all these are positives, they're good to add to the repertoire. But nothing, nothing in the fire mix can do as much as active land management to prevent bushfires and to minimise the damage from bushfires uh, when they occur. Uh, Australia is a continent that must be actively managed. And it is by no means a new concept. Everyone in this place would know that it, um, the continent of Australia was actively managed in terms of fire by Aboriginal Australians and then by farmers and graziers who took up um, the land and um, moved it to a modern agricultural system. These efforts evolved. They changed over time. They were different, but the motivations remained the same. It was about land management, first and foremost, to protect people and to protect the land. Now, Many do not understand the severe risks that often accompany a lack of consistent land management. The doubling of fuel loads within our landscape can double the rate of the spread of fire. This same doubling of fuel quadruples the intensity of that fire. Low intensity fires halt, um, burn, um, sorry, low intensity fires predominantly burn superficial dead layers of fuel whereas high intensity fires destroy everything in their path. That is why, again, we must look to actively manage uh, the, the landscape of Australia. Of all the variables contributing to the fire's ferocity, temperature, wind levels and fuel loads, only one is in our hands at the time of the fire, um, if we have prepared, and that is, of course, fuel loads. The, this risk triangle can be altered by land managers who proactively deal with fuel load um, through things like controlled burning. It must become a much more widely used priority of land managers. Now, state governments are the principal land managers in this country, and they must take this role with increasing, um, uh, must take an increasing focus on this role. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the tragic passing earlier this year of my dear friend and uh, local Central Coast luminary Kevin Parrish OAM at the wonderful age of 89. Kevin was a community activist, a Labor stalwart, beloved father, grandfather and great-grandfather whose love for others covered all and formed the basis of a life given to others. Kevin grew up in the tiny mid-north coast town of Herons Creek, where he first learned um, the difficulties and punishments that many commuters face when he had to catch the train from Herons Creek to Taree for school for a round trip of nearly 120 kilometres each day to get to school. Um, it fostered in him a love of trains, which was later matched by his fierce desire to advocate for other commuters to improve their lives and standard of travel and give them more time at home with their families. 
Kevin learned firsthand what the tyranny of distance really was, and he resolved to do what he could to erase it for as many people as possible all of his life. Following his graduation, he moved to Sydney, where he met his wonderful wife, Mari Day, and completed training as a technician with the Postmaster General, which obviously later became Telstra. Kevin was a very hardworking, charitable and community-minded spirit. He was a tireless volunteer for the Labor Party, and as a man of the Catholic faith, he worked very hard for the St Vincent de Paul and all those he encountered. Kevin embodied the best ideals of both his uh, Catholic faith and the Labor Party. He served faithfully as the president of the ALP's Gosford branch, was a life member of the New South Wales branch and was a delegate to Gosford SEC and its predecessor, Pete's SEC. Kevin was a constant presence in all local Labor campaigns, whether they were state, local or federal, and he was a friend to countless Labor representatives such as myself. We all miss his presence and his advice terribly. It was in his advocacy for commuters through, though, that um, Kevin really made his biggest impact. He was a founding member of the Central Coast Commuters, Commuters Association, later becoming its president, as well as chair of the Commuter Council of New South Wales. Through his advocacy, he was able to push governments to deliver better timetables and services for his fellow Central Coast residents, changing the lives of a huge proportion of Coasties who commute for work and giving them more time with their families and recreation. Kevin was awarded an OAM in 2005 for, and I quote, service to the community through organisations supporting commuters, particularly on the central coast of New South Wales. A well-deserved and long overdue recognition of his constant advocacy. Kevin survived by his six children, 10 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren, a truly amazing legacy. I pass to them my deepest condolences and I hope his memory remains a blessing for years and years to come. I do recall the last occasion on which I met Kevin was a visit to him in the hospital. And in these COVID times, that was no mean feat to be able to organise and have one visitor on the day. So I felt, felt very privileged to be with him. And while I was there, it wasn't surprising that <coughs> Kevin took a call uh, from a community organisation who uh, he was still doing training for from his bed in the hospital. He was just an indomitable force for good, and there was no one who needed assistance that Kevin would turn away. That sort of generosity of spirit is really at the heart of the best things in community. And Australians really warm to that, and we celebrate it. And I think in these COVID times in particular, uh, where our worlds have shrunk way too small, the sense of connection to others is something that we yearn for. Kevin yearned for it, and he sought it out every single day of his life. So, Vale, Kevin Parrish, a great Australian citizen who did his best with what he had for his family and everyone with whom he came in contact. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak tonight on freedom. On many occasions in the last year, I have addressed the Senate regarding freedom as a counterbalance to medical tyranny, and I recently addressed the Canberra Freedom Rally remotely. The side that is locking people up for the crime of being healthy, arresting protesters, pepper spraying kids and beating up grannies, banning books and electronic messages, censoring social media, sending threatening letters, forcing small businesses to close, urging people to do to dob into centres and banning safe drugs that have worked for 60 years are all on the wrong side of history. In a frightening development, New South Wales has called in the troops to keep innocent, healthy citizens locked in their homes in what can only be called martial law. Recent freedom marches showed what happens to citizens who exercise their democratic right to protest. People are demonised, hunted down. The media vilifies to discourage others from questioning the control state. If the government can decide who is free and who is not, then that is not freedom, and no one is free. A crisis will always be found to justify measures designed to protect the government, not the public. A crisis that is as easy to create as turning up the PCR test from 24 cycles up to 42, where a false positive is the most likely outcome, as has occurred. 
Actions such as these have created a crisis of confidence in government. And that, fellow citizens, is on the Senate. We are the House of Review. We're tasked with the duty to ensure honesty, transparency and accountability in the government of the day. We have failed in that solemn duty, our duty to our constituents. We have failed those yet to vote, our children, who are now being injected with a substance that has not undergone meaningful safety testing. The Liberal, National and Labor parties have colluded to waive these measures through this place, reducing the Senate to the status of a dystopian echo chamber. Each new restriction, although met with rightful public opposition, has not led to a re-evaluation, but rather has led the government to crack down even further. The Morrison government is behaving like a gambling addict who loses a hand and instead of admitting error and walking away, it doubles down. With troops now on the streets, it's frightening to contemplate where this will end. Everyday Australians are being deliberately demoralised to extract a, hard, a higher degree of compliance. When COVID first arrived, there were few masks and the experts and authorities told us masks were not necessary. Now those same medically ineffective masks are used to condition people to fear and obedience. Crushing resistance crushes hope, and without hope we have no future. Is it any wonder that small businesses are closing permanently? Every small business closed was a family being provided for from work, hard work and enterprise. Who will look after those families now? The government? With whose money? The Reserve Bank, using electronic journal entries, can only create fiat money out of thin air for so long before it runs down our country. The government can only sell bonds until buyers stop coming forward. Then what happens? We will have no tax base left to pay these government stipends to people who were once able to pay their own way. Since when is a Liberal government, the party supposedly of Menzies, dedicated to making huge sections of the population totally reliant on the government for survival? The bad joke here is that the excuse used to justify this sudden rush to Marxism, public health, is moot. Deaths from all sources, including coronavirus and the flu, are at historic lows. Australia's death rate in 2020 was less than in 2019, and 2021's death rate is lower again. We're strangling Australia's economic life and future for no reason. Power has gone to the heads of our elected leaders and unelected bureaucrats who are exercising powers, yet do not feel the consequences themselves. Never in history has Lord Acton's famous quote rung more true, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's been calculated that the civil disobedience tipping point, which is the maximum capacity of the, pe of the police to arrest people, of the jails to hold people, and of the courts to process people, is, in Australia, around 100,000 people. Anything more than that and the system comes crashing down. Attendance at the Freedom Rallies last month shows we're almost there. No wonder the Morrison government has been scared into resorting to the refuge of tyrants, the military, to intimidate citizens into compliance and to mandating injections threatening to rip away people's livelihoods. Everyday Australians are seeing through the smoke screens of fear and intimidation. People now see the cost of the restrictions to family and community exceeds the medical cost of the virus. Everyday Australians have spoken. We will not be divided. We are united. We are one community. We are one nation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. We have Senator Shikoni remotely. Hopefully. Senator Shikoni, we can't hear you at the moment. I think we can hear you, but they can't. Oh, whoever said that was very helpful. A Senator Thorpe here. Oh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. I can hear you. Yes, we might. Um, sorry, Senator Giacconi, we can't hear you in the chamber. So we might go to Senator Faruqi if that's all right, um, and we'll try and re-establish the connection with Senator Shikoni. Senator Faruqi. And we have the same issue. I can 
can hear you, Maureen, but I have no video. <laughs> um, Senators, I've just received advice from the clerk that uh, if you log off and then log can back on again, it that was that was Senator Chaconi. I just logged off and I logged back in. So, right. Maren, you may want to do that too. So. Wonderful. Um, Senator Faruqi, it might be worth you doing that also in anticipation of your next contribution, but I will go back to Senator Chaconi for his first, and then we will go on in the order as agreed in the document. In All the right. Chamber. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Acting Deputy President, for your patience. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to speak on the current situation in East Gippsland regarding the lack of federal government financial support provided to rebuild crucial infrastructure in the communities, 18 months after the, re the region was ravaged by fires back in the year 2020. As reported in the Herald Sun today, just $4.5 million has been set aside for East Gippsland in the first year of the $276 million three-year grant program to support local projects in bushfire-hit communities. Now, despite East Gippsland being particularly badly affected, with 1.1 million hectares burnt, or more than half the local government area, including 410 homes that were destroyed, it received only a fraction of the $27 million that has been currently made available. This distribution of funds, where they were allocated bluntly by local government area, rather than a more equitable needs basis, means that many many people in East Gippsland are going without assistance that they desperately need and deserve. It beggars belief that the federal, liberal and national government could continue to drag its feet as these communities cry out for help. Programs designed to help small businesses get back on their feet have been painfully slow to roll out money from the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund. So while it's clear Australians in bushfire-affected regions want and need this money, the question needs to be asked, why isn't the Morrison government listening to the needs of East Gippsland residents? This is an insult to hard-working Australians who just want what they were promised. Promised by the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister must explain why several programs he and his ministers, when they announced the package as part of the bushfire uh, package back in 2020 have failed to actively provide funding and fund these projects on the ground. It has now been more than 18 months since the bushfire crisis and those in East Gippsland are rightly angry at the delays in repairing infrastructure in their communities. While I acknowledge that there are many challenges faced with recovery, residents in these regions are experiencing ongoing issues which are being made worse by outdated grant rules based on council areas. In fact, it's been so inadequate that local elected representatives from all levels of government, including representatives from the National Party, have written to the Prime Minister expressing concerns about the simplistic local government area criteria that is used to, de to determine funding and the considerable unmet demand for federal government assistance in the area. Like the local national federal member, Darren Chester, I am bitterly disappointed with this lack of support from the coalition for the people of East Gippsland. I'd also like to echo the comments made by Councillor Yuri, Mayor of East Gippsland Shire, that the $4.5 million allocated is unacceptable. And local national state MP, Tim Bull, who has acknowledged that the Commonwealth has made a clear mistake in its allocation of funding and needs to increase its support for East Gippsland. I urge Senator McKenzie, the minister responsible, the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, to acknowledge the current shortcomings of the program and urgently work towards delivering much needed support for these communities. These communities deserve support from government in their time of need to give them a hand up and allow them to get back on their feet. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Millions of people are in COVID lockdown this week. Many of them are in my home state of New South Wales. Tens of thousands have lost their livelihoods without adequate support from the Morrison government. 
marginalized communities are being over policed and maligned in southwest and western Sydney, while corporations, billionaires, and the wealthiest keep adding to their bottom lines. These are the four lines, the inequalities and injustices exposed and heightened during the last 18 months. Saying we're all in this together again and again doesn't make it true when so many are clearly being left behind and out in the cold. Western Sydney, home to the large number of essential and frontline workers, migrants, refugees, and First Nations people, is one of the most richly diverse areas of this country. And this is precisely why it has been targeted and stigmatized with police operations and military presence. No other communities in the country have been treated this way during the COVID pandemic. The demonization has been palpable in the way they have been spoken about and targeted by the police, when in fact these communities have shown up and have some of the highest rates of testing New South Wales has ever seen. We are also now seeing huge numbers of vaccinations in these areas, uh, where once the vaccine has been made available, and it's happening despite the mixed and ever-changing messages on vaccines by the Prime Minister, who not only failed to acknowledge early on the pandemic, that vaccines would be the one way out of this crisis, but told us it was not a race. Well, it is a race, Prime Minister. It's the race of our lives. When COVID spread to the southwest of Sydney in this outbreak, people had to wait up to six hours in line to get a COVID test because the New South Wales government failed to set up enough test clinics. There weren't enough testing clinics, and yet people still turned up to get tested so they could keep themselves and their communities safe. In early July, when vaccination, public health and community engagement should have been the priorities, the New South Wales government decided to send in the police. This was a terrible turn of events. Over-policing any community, let alone marginalized communities, is a recipe for disaster. And now the military has descended on these communities, creating more fear and anxiety. People are already under immense financial stress, mm -hmm. health stress, separated from their families overseas because of border closures, which allow the rich and the famous, the well-connected, the Hillsong pastors, the far-right trolls to come in and leave, but not ordinary people. Militarizing public health makes zero sense. And this is no accident. This is by design to shift the focus away from the government's failures and all to multicultural communities. With a substantial uptick in police and military presence comes stigma. It would be a devastating result if multicultural communities ended up wearing the blame for this lockdown, when in reality, we are where we are because of Morrison's botched up vaccine rollout. Epidemiologist Nancy Baxter from the University of Melbourne told the ABC that there is clear inequality in how the police treat people in different areas and reminded us that a lot of essential workers live in southwest Sydney who are required to leave home to go to work. The government has ordered people to stay home, but refused to provide them with enough resources to stay healthy and economically secure. This puts people, particularly casual workers, losing shifts and work and people on low incomes in a terrible position. Are they supposed to choose between keeping themselves and their communities safe or paying the rent and putting dinner on the table? What a cruel, inhumane choice. Without sufficient support, proper information and vaccinations, millions will get left behind and the most marginalized in our community are put into further poverty and debt and suffer greater discrimination, anxiety and stress. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I have Senator McCarthy next on the list. No, we will go on to Senator Lambie. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Okay, and I'm sitting at my desk here and see the National Commissioner for Vets and Veteran Suicide Prevention Consequential Amendments Bill. We don't need any consequential amendments because the bill never got up in the first place. So let's have a little chat about that, shall we? Because I don't want to waste any more time this week or next week on the National Commissioner because it is now non existent. So the government wants to go hell for leather with its National Commission legislation in the, over the next few weeks. This is the idea that had, they had when the Prime Minister wanted to black, block the Royal Commission into veteran suicide. You know, the one that he said was bigger and better than a Royal Commission, that one? The one he said couldn't operate side by side with a Royal Commission? You know, that National Commissioner? The one he said was take it or leave it, all or nothing option? That one? You know, you know what I'm talking about out there, you veterans? 
Well, that was then and this is now. Now when we've had a Royal Commission announced and the government's done its backflip finally and actually woken up to itself and its stupidity over veterans and giving it something that would have been second class and finally done the right thing. But here we go. They still want to come back to this National Commissioner hanging around like a bad smell. And I don't mean that personally to the National Commissioner. I'm talking about the National Commission itself. That was a stupid idea in the first place and quite disrespectful. Very disrespectful instead of giving us a Royal Commission. Just couldn't help yourself. And the government won't let this idea die, so it's planning to push it through the Senate this week. And what for? What is the purpose of it? What's the government think that the National Commissioner is going to do that the Royal Commissioner won't be able to do? They say it's so the National Commissioner can look at future suicides. But we've got coroners who do that. They say it's so the National Commissioner can update the parliament on how the recommendations of the Royal Commission are going. But we've got Senate estimates for that, and trust me, you need it. They say it's so we're ready to go when the Royal Commission recommends it. But we've got to get first, we've got to go to the Royal Commission, got to get that going first, don't we? And once that happens, because this is how it works, the Royal Commission's got to recommend it, doesn't it? The Royal Commissioner, Commissioner has to recommend that the National Commissioner put, is put in place and exactly what its job will be. That is the job of the Royal Commissioner. I'll tell you what, go get one of the government's crystal balls because they're beauties and I'll tell you, they must be going cheap as chips. If only we could all have one of those little magic crystal balls, we'd all be rich and none of us would be here, I'm sure. Because apparently the government knows that the Royal Commissioner is going to recommend that we get a National Commissioner. But that's not all. No, 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 that's not all. These crystal balls are great, mate, trust me. The government also knows the Royal Commission is going to recommend a National Commissioner to do what the government wants the National Commissioner to do. But no, 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 it gets better. I'll tell you, these, these crystal balls are worth gold. The government also knows the Royal Commission is going to recommend the National Commissioner be designed exactly the same way the government wants the National Commissioner to be designed. Apparently they know everything the Royal Commission is going to recommend. But don't worry, this is completely independent. I want you to all know that. Don't hit the panic buttons yet. Why else would they be saying to the Senate now, it's completely necessary for us to put through this legislation before the Royal Commission's had time to lace up its boots, let alone put on its socks? But I've got a crazy idea, and I know it's a long shot. I don't have a crystal ball like the coalition's coalition thinks that they do, and I reckon most of the Senate is going to struggle to polish off the crystal ball enough to see what the government's seeing. So why doesn't the government just do what the Royal Commission recommends? Right now we've got this bizarre game of who's on first going on. The government's recommending the Senate pass what it reckons the Royal Commission will recommend in the form it recommends the Royal Commission will recommend before the Royal Commission recommends anything. You're keeping up with me out there? Great. Because we need to be ready for it to recommend what the government recommends it recommends. We all up there yet? Lovely. This is where we're up. It's great up here, isn't it? Isn't it fun and games? This is where we're at. It's an absolute circus up here. I tell you what, they treat us like we're a pack of, pack of donkeys. And what for? What's the point of all this faffing around? It is completely obvious to anyone who looks at this for one second that the only reason we're going through this whole charade is so the Prime Minister can save what face he has left over veterans. And he has none left. I can tell you. You have, you have none left, Prime Minister. We had to drag you kicking and screaming to get veterans and defence personnel what they deserved a Royal Commission. And now that you've lost that fight, he wants a consolidation prize. Well, I'm not interested in helping the Prime Minister. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Save face. What I'm interested in is making sure we give the Royal Commission a clear air to do their job without any influence or interference from this government. And I'm putting it out there now. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I call Senator Steele John remotely. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thousands of people have already shared their experience uh, with our, uh, thousands of disabled people, I should say, have already had the opportunity to share uh, their experience uh, with our Disability Royal Commission. Uh, this is a vital step uh, in the act and process of, of achieving the policy changes uh, that we need to ensure that disabled people uh, are safe uh, to live their lives and no longer experience violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. Many people have told their powerful, uh, shared their powerful experiences already. Uh, but for some, uh, they have not been able to give 
the vital information which they hold to the Commission uh, because confidentiality provisions are currently not strong enough. Now, at the moment, information given confidentially to the Royal Commission will not be confidential when the Commission comes to an end in 2023. And there are limited protections for people who bravely blow the whistle uh, on their workplace. I've been strongly lobbying the government to listen to the demands of our community, uh, our demands that we need a strong, secure confidentiality provisions framework built into the legislation. The Liberal government, I'm sorry to say, say over the past two years, have dragged their feet on this question. They've known about this problem since 2019 uh, and have promised changes over the years. Uh, unfortunately, through all of that process, the answer to when will this be achieved has always been soon. Well, a vague soon is not good enough. With the parliament sitting in August, uh, the government must put this legislation on the legislative agenda and give disabled people and our allies certainty that they'll be able to share their experience without fear of retribution. Now, I have, in the course of my role here, had the opportunity to hear from multiple people who right now uh, would like to share their stories, uh, share their experiences uh, with the Royal Commission, but currently are not able to. Uh, these people are educators, these people have worked alongside disabled people in support organisations. They have been in charge of uh, safeguarding frameworks and mechanisms uh, that have gone wrong and failed people mm -hmm. uh, when they have needed them most. Um, and they have been employed and engaged by state governments to do inquiries into what has gone wrong only to be silenced. All these people and more uh, want to give uh, their evidence, share their experience uh, with their Royal Commission um, and currently are not able to because of the absence uh, of this uh, strong protections framework. Now, to achieve this together, we as a community uh, will need to join together as we have done so, so successfully uh, in recent months of the disability community to ensure that these protections are passed through the parliament this August. Um, and then subsequently to make sure uh, that they pass through the Senate with the support of the Labour Party and members of the crossbench. To this end, uh, myself and my office are putting together a team of people ready to call at a moment's notice uh, to contact their decision makers, their representatives uh, in Parliament uh, to advocate for the support uh, of this legislation, uh, to get it going, to get it done so that these safeguards exist, so that people can share their experiences, give their evidence uh, to their Royal Commission. I say again, the government must put this legislation on uh, the uh, agenda for this August sitting period. We cannot rise uh, and go home in September without having finally got this done. Together uh, with the disability community, I look forward uh, to pursuing this issue through the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, if people wish to, to, to join in the campaign uh, that we are uh, running together, please reach out to my office or click any of the links in the video currently being uh, streamed to my page to be part of that uh, campaign, to get involved, to get this done uh, so that people can have the protections uh, they need to share their experience uh, with this vital investigation into abuse and neglect. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, I call Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, rise tonight to tell a tale of two cities. Um, it's the best of times, the worst of times, but it's a tale of two cities. I want to talk about two towns uh, in North Queensland, uh, the town of Emerald, or, or central North Queensland, and Collinsville. Uh, Around 50 years ago, uh, in uh, 1971, in the 1971 census, Emerald had a population of just 650 people. Collinsville had a population of 2,000. Collinsville uh, has a proud history as a as a coal mining town, and, and most of the uh, the workers in that town would have been employed in the coal mine coal mines 
of that time. Uh, but 50 years ago, Emerald was really just a rural, a rural town servicing uh, the cattle industry. Uh, uh, some mines around there have been built since then, but the big change has been the construction of the Fairburn Dam in 1972. In 1972, the Fairburn Dam was built just outside uh, Emerald uh, in the Fitzroy Basin, and uh, it's uh, uh, a huge body of water, over 1,000 gigalitres, over two Sydney harbours uh, can be stored there. And even though it's a bit low at the moment, it still provides substantial water to the town of Emerald and to cotton, grain, other horticulture, citrus uh, farms, uh, and to the coal mines and power stations in the region as well. Today, so 50 years on, Emerald's population is 13,500 people. It's grown by almost 20 thanks to the construction of that dam and the resulting economic activity that it generated. Collinsville, unfortunately, Collinsville over the last 50 years has had its population halved, halved in the space of 50 years to 1,000 people as efficiencies, particularly in the mining industry, took away jobs there, and there haven't been other industries really built uh, in Collinsville uh, to supply or, or those jobs. There is a big solar farm there, I should say, at Collinsville, but it employs only a few people as security guards. Dams, though, in contrast, dams, dams create thousands of jobs. They create thousands of jobs because what happens when you build a dam, of course, the whole point of building a dam is to store up water behind it, and that means that's like putting money in the bank. That water there behind it gives confidence to investors to come into a town, gives confidence to farmers to put in centre pivots, put in channels, invest money in their farms because they know they're going to have water security in the future to grow food and have an income stream to pay back those high capital costs that come not just from the construction of the dam uh, but the construction of the related infrastructure on farm uh, to take advantage of that water. That's why we've had extra people move to Emerald. That's why we've got a vibrant uh, town there, thanks to that dam. And that's why we want to build a dam at Collinsville too. Uh, we want to build a dam at Collinsville for the people of Collinsville, to give them a brighter future, better opportunity, uh, and to provide a nation-building project for our whole country. Uh, I was up at Collinsville last week with uh, the local member of the area, Michelle Landry, the member for Capricornia, and also the member for Dawson, George Christensen, joined us. The project, uh, the dam we want to build there, the Urana Dam, is in, as I said, uh, the member for Capricornia's seat, but it will also significantly benefit constituents in George Christensen, Mr George Christensen's and the member for Dawson's seat as well. And so we were up there and we went and saw Marissa at the local post office, lovely lady. Uh, it's more than just a post office for Collinsville, it's the, country, it's the general store, uh, meeting place, uh, it's a vibrant hub of the community. And Marissa was over the moon with the announcement we were making uh, to support the Yona Dam project and get that going. Uh, that's going to be great for the town and that's why she's a big fan of it. Uh, they, uh, the, what we announced there last week was a further $12.7 million in funding to help bring the Urana Dam project to a shovel-ready phase. That builds on the $10 million the government has already uh, provided to the project to help finalise its business case, which shows it stacks up. And this additional funding will now help it uh, help help the proponents, Bow and River Utilities, help it uh, to finalise its design, go through the, the rigorous environmental approval processes that we have in place, and make sure that within the next couple of years we can start this project. This is another step in taking this project forward, and I'm confident this is going to happen. There will be more to do here. There is more to do. It's a, it's a billion dollar project. It involves more than just building a dam. It involves a 1,400 megawatt pumped hydro power station. That will help back up the solar power and renewables that are going into the area. As I mentioned, there's a solar farm there at Collinsville, but at night time, of course, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, so having this uh, uh, pumped hydro facility, can, which can back up the power needs of North Queensland for about eight hours, will be very useful uh, overnight. Uh, it's a big, big uh, project, 1,400 megawatts. Uh, there will also be a related uh, irrigation project associated with the dam that will open up 20,000 hectares of new agricultural land. And, and the project also involves the construction of a pipeline to Moranbar, uh, a town that's had intermittent issues uh, with uh, water supply, for town water supply. 
Uh, this dam will provide Moranbar with excellent water security and really help fix those up, their water issues up for the long term. The water will also help underpin supply for coal mines in the area as well, uh, helping to expand that great industry. And there's a lot of confidence. We also went out to the coal mine. I might give another speech about that because Michelle, George, and I were very happy to have our photos taken at the coal mine there at Collinsville. We put them up on social media. We let everybody know we were there. Unlike other Labor leaders of this place, come up to North Queensland, do a secret visit to a coal mine. Uh, no one knows he's there. There's more evidence that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon than there is that Anthony Albanese came to a coal mine in North Queensland the last couple of weeks. Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he put uh, pictures on his social media page? I think it's because he's a little bit embarrassed about workers. Uh, Mr Albanese is a little bit ashamed of being seen next to an actual worker, because that might not go down well in his inner city Sydney electorate. But getting back to the real deal here, the real deal here is how we as a government are getting on with building things that support economic activity, support jobs and support workers in this nation. As I mentioned, to finance this billion dollar project will be a big ask. There is private capital ready to go. I know the proponents will be um, seeking a request from the government's National Water Infrastructure Development Fund, and we've got the money there to help them out. I'm a strong advocate, given that this project stacks up, that we see it funded uh, and build another dam uh, in Australia, another dam in Queensland. Because I want to finish on the fact that this just builds on the government's in initiative to build more dams around Australia and get dams back on the agenda. When we came to government seven years ago, no one was talking about dams. No one was building them. They hadn't, we hadn't built one for, for a generation. Uh, and uh, We are now building projects right across Australia, right across Queensland, to open up new farmlands and create jobs everywhere. It is fantastic to see uh, the Rookwood Weir project just come out of the ground. It took a bit of dragging and kicking and screaming with the Queensland Labor government, but we put money on the table back in 2016, again with Michelle Landry, a tireless advocate for water infrastructure in her region, and Ken O'Dowd down that way, I should mention it, the other Ken O'Dowd, also a big advocate for it. Uh, they tirelessly fought for this, and now this project's happening. There are, there are people there. We know there are people there because, unfortunately, they had a coronavirus case the other day. It stopped the project uh, for 14 days, but it'll get going again. Uh, and the wall is being poured uh, very soon. Next year, we'll have water being stored back up against that on the Fitzroy River, and it's a big river. It's a really, really big river. The, the Aboriginal word toon bar for the Fitzroy River does just mean big water. There's a lot of water. At the height there of the dam, it'll be 20 metres high, the water, uh, uh, and it will back up about 50 kilometres. Uh, so a long, long distance, pretty much from the top of the ACT to the bottom, or at least from the top of, top of Gungahlin to the bottom of Tuggeranong. It'll be, a, it'll be a, probably a little bit further than that. Uh, in terms of water just backed up. That will open up all that country along the Fitzroy River for extra irrigation opportunities, more jobs. A lot of, a lot of macadamia investors already have bought water. It's a very exciting time in central Queensland to be involved in agriculture, to be involved in the development of new farmlands because of all the investment coming from the federal government, from the federal LNP government, in dams and the ability to store more water. That's what I want to see our country do. That's what I get excited about when we build new things. We've built our nation on the back of projects like this, like the Snowy Hydro Mountain Scheme, like the Perth to Kalgoorlie pipeline, major water like the Burdekin Falls Dam in North Queensland, like the Ord, Ord development, uh, like Argyle. Thank you, Senator Smith, over in Western Australia. I don't want to leave them out. Uh, there is so much more going on over there too. I'm sure Senator Smith could let us know all about that. It's fantastic what this government is doing. Uh, to see uh, new economic opportunities being opened up in our nation through dams and thanks to the hard work of the local members pushing these projects, working with proponents, getting it done, we are creating more jobs and more opportunities for all Australians. Uh, thank you. Senator Canavan, uh, I just want to note uh, Standing Order 193, the rules of debate. I just remind you, even though you are an experienced parliamentarian, that it is highly disorderly to um, bring any imputation of improper motive uh, to members of or officials of the House. Well, then could, could I repeat my speech without those imputations? Am I, could I be given that liberty, uh, um, Madam Acting Deputy President? Thank, thank <laughs> I, I ask you to take note of, 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 of that standing order, Senator Canavan, and I call Senator Thought remotely. Thank you, Chair. Last week, on July 31st, it was International Ranger Day, 
a day where we pause and reflect on the work that rangers do, particularly First Nations rangers who protect and care for country. From the mountains and cool rainforests of the south of this continent to the spectacular deserts of the centre and to the plentiful waters of the north, our people have been managing and caring for country, water and sky since time began. First Nations rangers work to protect our plants, animals and sacred totems. They control introduced pests like weeds and feral animals, as well as reducing fire, bushfire risks. First Nations rangers also care and maintain cultural sites like our ancestors have done for millennia. Since Europeans and settlers have completely mismanaged and completely destroyed uh, what we had maintained for thousands and thousands of generations, the care of country, land and waters, many of our native plants and animals require increased ongoing care and protection by all. First Nations rangers are continuing the knowledge, science, art and cultural practices handed down by our old people since time began. A report commissioned by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet found that First Nations rangers deliver up to $3 worth of environmental, social and economic value for every $1 spent. First Nations Rangers are at the front line of protecting country, culture, waters and sky. We need more people working on country to address these threats. Country needs more well-resourced people to care for it as well as strong rules that protect country. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 10, clearly states, and I quote, Indigenous peoples shall not be forcibly removed from their lands or territories. No relocation shall take place without the free, prior and informed consent of the Indigenous peoples concerned and after agreement on just and fair compensation and, where possible, with the option of return." End quote. Let's reflect on those words. Free, prior, and informed consent. Free, prior and informed consent is the highest standard required for the involvement of First Nations people in decision making about anything that happens on or affects country, waters and sky. Not only is it the highest standard required, it should be the only standard required. The oil, gas and mining companies get to do what they want on country because the politicians they have purchased allow it. Free, prior and informed consent means that First Nations people must be informed about mining, fracking, logging, dams and other large projects in a timely manner. First Nations people must be given the opportunity to approve or reject projects happening on country before a project happens. Not during, not after, before. The opportunity to give or withhold free, prior and informed consent is central to the rights of local communities and it's also a distinct right of First Nations people. Participation in decision making and negotiating full, prior and informed consent is central to human rights, including the right of our people to development, including economic development. Free, prior and informed consent involves local communities and First Nations people being informed in the way that is most meaningful to them and in a way that they understand about things happening on country. Free, prior and informed consent means that First Nations people and other affected communities have the opportunity to approve, reject and change a project prior to the commencement of its operations. Free, prior and informed consent means that First Nations people and affected communities participate in setting the terms and conditions that address 
the economic, social and environmental impacts of all phases of whatever happens on country. Free, prior and informed consent is about involving everyone and not picking off traditional owner groups and pitting them against each other. And we know that happens all the time, both Labor and Lib. We know, you know, and it's wrong. It involves not manufacturing consent by handpicking the black fellas that you know you can buy off. It means you have to stop paying the cash and the cars and offering all these other dirty and shoddy policy uh, promises with your gifts to gain consent. It means that we, give, that we give First Nations people the respect they deserve as the original owners and involve them at all stages of a project. Not just the ones that the mining companies have bribed with promises of cars, money or benefits. Because don't get me wrong, as I said, this happens, it's happening right now. The unconscionable conduct of mining companies is truly abhorrent. Unconscionable conduct is a statement or action so unreasonable it defies good conscience. I'm sure all the lawyers know that one. In 2008, the United Nations Human Rights Council recognised that corporations also have a distinct responsibility to respect human rights. Well, they should look at the conduct of mining companies here in this country. The 46,000 year old heritage listed rock shelter was blown up by Rio Tinto against the stated wishes of the traditional owners. Rio Tinto knew Jukan Gorge was irreplaceable. They just didn't care. Rio Tinto isn't the only company acting in truly abhorrent ways out on country. As part of the inquiry looking into the destruction of the Jukan Gorge by Rio Tinto, we've heard how other mining corporations behave on country too. As part of that inquiry, I had the great pleasure of meeting Garawa Elder, Uncle Jack Green. He shared with me his artwork depicting the conduct of these dirty mining corporations on his country. He described one of his paintings called Ice Creams as follows, I quote, the painting is about how Glencore work in Vorolula. Glencore won't let us organise under our own law. Instead, they pick, us, pick off one or two of our people. They say to them, if you can work for us, we'll get you a motor car, we'll give you some taka, you'll be looked after and you'll have money and everything. So if you want this, you help us get an agreement. You talk for us to your family. The ice cream, lollies on a plate and cake in the painting symbolise the absurdity of what's being offered to us. Things that have little long-term value to us. Things that won't last. Here, now, but quickly gone. Just like an ice cream in the sun. Glencore throw down scraps like this while destroying our sacred sites and contaminating our land and water while the government watches. There's no way we should be paid off like this. We want people in the cities to know what's happening to us. They have to know how their governments work with mining companies to do us over and destroy our land, end quote. I, I am honoured to bring Uncle Jack's words to the parliament and into the public record. It's absolutely critical that everyone pays attention and listens to the words of Uncle Jack and the many other elders and First Nations people who are being affected by the destruction of country. This is happening. This is unconscionable conduct of bribing First Nations people, pitting families against one another so that Glencore, Rio Tinto and other dodgy corporations can steal the wealth of our people. It is revolting and it is happening with the consent of the politicians here that the mining companies have purchased and some of these politicians we know come cheap. Protecting country, caring for country is the most important thing that we can do as a nation and as a community. Laws that are meant to protect First Nations heritage are fundamentally broken. Thank you, Senator Thank Thorpe. You. I call Senator Scar. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, uh, let me at the outset note how wonderful it is that Brisbane has secured the Olympic Games for the year 2032. And if I could pay tribute to my great friend Graeme Quirk, ex-Lord Mayor of Brisbane, who was one of the visionaries and probably the leading visionary in terms of identifying this opportunity after Brisbane had staged the G20 conference, to uh, saw this as an opportunity to keep Brisbane on the world map. And I pay tribute to Graeme Quirk. I also pay tribute to the current Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Adrian Trinner, and also to my good friend Ted O'Brien, MP, the member for Fairfax, for all of the great work he's done behind the scenes. And I'm very confident, very confident, Madam Acting Deputy President, as we go through this process, that all three levels of government, whatever their political persuasion at local level, state level and federal level, will work cooperatively together to take advantage of this fantastic opportunity. And someone we're seeing take advantage of a fantastic opportunity is Mr Peter Boll, who is in the 800 metres final tomorrow night at 10.05 p.m. This is the first time since 1968 that Australia has had a finalist in the 800 metres at the Olympics. And Peter Bowles' story is just so Australian. He came to this country as a young man, as a refugee. And like refugees who've come to this country from Vietnam, from Hungary, from the Baltic states, from all parts of the world, he and his family came to Australia to make a life for themselves. As Peter says, we came to Australia for the obvious reason. Australia is one of the best countries in the world. I've been around a few countries and Australia is the best country to be in. So my family definitely made the right choice. Peter's mother is Sudanese background, and his father uh, was also Sudanese background, but came from that part of Sudan which has become South Sudan. And they fled Sudan during the Civil War and found their way to Australia. And I congratulate Peter in terms of his success so far at the Olympics, and we'll certainly be cheering him on tomorrow night. Peter's success made me reflect on an ecumenical service I attended on 10 July earlier this year to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the independence of the Republic of South Sudan. And that ecumenical service took place at St Paul's Catholic Church at Woodridge, south of Brisbane, on the 10th of July. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sure you can remember those scenes in 2011 when thousands, thousands of South Sudanese living in Australia voted in that historical referendum, that historic referendum which gave, ultimately led to the independence for the Republic of South Sudan. And we should remember the efforts that the Australian government went to in order to ensure that those people had an opportunity to vote in that referendum. And in fact, there were almost or even above 10,000 people voted in that referendum in Australia, the greatest number who voted in that referendum outside of Africa, voted in that referendum in Australia. And some of those people were in attendance at the ecumenical service on the 10th of July. And I congratulate firstly Mr Sebet Rambang, who is the acting president of the South Sudanese Community Association of Queensland, Inc., for his efforts in terms of organising that ecumenical service. And can I say, Madam Acting Deputy President, he's one of the new generation of leaders coming up through these communities. And he's a wonderful, confident young man, uh, Mr Sebet Yambang, and I really pay congratulations to him for actually stepping up to lead this association during these difficult times. He'd had a number of events cancelled due to COVID-19 lockdowns, but he persevered. And certainly this event, this ecumenical service commemorating the independence of the Republic of South Sudan was a huge success. So I congratulate him, Mr Sebet Yambang. He's an outstanding young Australian. The service was led by Reverend Andrew Oyet and also contributing during the course of the service were Reverend Kennedy Kenyi of Logan Grace Baptist Church and Father Stephen Kumyangi of the Upper Mount Gravatt Wishart Catholic Parish. And there was great strength and inspiration in each of the sermons given that day, great strength and inspiration in those servings, and it was quite moving. 
Also note that my good friend Pastor Moses Leth was also in attendance, and Pastor Leth is another great community leader in the Australian South Sudanese community, and he teaches language and culture to young girls and boys of South Sudanese ethnicity. Madam Acting Deputy President, after the service, those of us in attendance at the service proceeded outside to gather around a, an olive tree, an olive tree that was planted 10 years ago at the St Paul's Parish to commemorate the independence of the Republic of South Sudan. And I congratulate that initiative undertaken by Mr Gabriel Yukono with the blessing of Woodridge St Paul's Parish priest, Father David Batty. And we stood around that tree and re reflected on the 10 years of independence of the Republic of South Sudan. Madam Acting Deputy President, after that commemoration and, and probably one of, there were many highlights on that day, but one of the highlights was video tributes were given by a lot of the members of the community. And a lot of the young members of the Australian South Sudanese community outlined their aspirations for the independent republic of South Sudan, which has been going through a great period of instability, which is felt keenly by the community here in Australia. And they also outlined their aspirations as young Australians in terms of how they want to commute contribute to our beautiful country and take advantage of all the opportunities which they have by living in our country. And it was quite touching and quite heartwarming to hear their uh, aspirations, their goals, their objectives and how they want to contribute to our society. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, one and all of us, all the members of the Australian South Sudanese community, but also all the members of the greater Australian community, one and all united. We'll all be cheering Peter Bowl when he runs in the 800 metre final tomorrow night, and he'll be running with the best wishes of everyone in our beautiful country. Thank you, Senator Scar. I call Senator Griff remotely. Senator Griff, you may still be muted. I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear anything at this stage. Patrick is ready to make a contribution. We will try to come back to you, Senator Griffith, see if we can fix the technical problem. Okay, so the suggestion from the clerk is to log off and then log on. I'll call Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. In December 2017, I gave a speech to the Senate in which I highlighted Australia's changing strategic circumstances. I argued that we were living in a time of rapid strategic change, characterised by uncertainty, risk and potential danger. I highlighted the observations in the government's 2017 foreign policy white paper that, and I quote, China's power and influence are growing to match and in some cases exceed that of the United States. The White Paper went on to observe that, again quoting, China's modern military, uh, military modernisation is rapidly improving the capability of its armed forces. It has the largest navy and air force in Asia and the largest coast guard in the world. Now that was four years ago. A lot of water has flowed underneath the bridge since then. The broad reality is that Australia's strategic outlook has deteriorated sharply and for the first time since uh, World War II we face a significant risk of high intensity conflict within our region of strategic interest, especially between China, the US and Japan over the island democracy of Taiwan. Tonight, against this background, I want to highlight a major street strategic revelation of the past month that has received little attention in this country and which the Australian government is yet to comment on or to respond to. Over the past month, national security researchers and imagery an analysts in the US have used commercially available satellite imagery to reveal a major expansion of Chinese strategic nuclear arsenal. Satellite pictures have revealed that China is constructing two strategic missile silo, silo fields, uh, one of some 120 silos near the small city of uh, Yumen in Gansu uh, province, and another some 110 silos near the city of Hamai in eastern Xinjiang. 
These new strategic facilities are in addition to approximately one dozen missile silos uh, constructed at a training facility in Inner Mongolia. The silos could be a ruse. The actual number of new missiles may not equal the number of new silos. However, given China's highly secretive strategic posture, it can only be assumed that each of the silos will eventually contain an intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. That would be another 120 ICBMs. Western strategic analysts anticipate these will most likely be solid-fuelled ICBMs, known as the DF-41s, with multiple warheads and a range of 15,000 kilometres, potentially putting the US mainland and, indeed, Australia within reach of China's far west. The Chinese People's Liberation Army Rocket Force has for decades operated about 20 nuclear missile silos to support a small force of ageing liquid-fuelled DF-5 ICBMs. The PLARF has also deployed about 100 road mobile ICBM launchers that operate from a dozen or more bases. In addition, China has also been expanding its force of ballistic missile carrying submarines. The deployment of as many as 240 new ICBMs, each potentially carrying three warheads each, a total of 720, would represent a dramatic shift for China, which up to this time is believed to have possessed a relatively modest stockpile of 250 to 350 nuclear weapons. The scale and speed of the construction underway in China's remote deserts has been described by Western analysts as incredible. Matt Corder and Hans Christensen of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federal um, America, uh, Federation of American Scientists observed that, and I quote, the silo construction at Yumen and Hamai consists of the most significant expansion of the Chinese nuclear arsenal ever. The number of new Chinese silos under construction exceeds the number of silo-based ICBMs offer, operated by Russia and constitutes more than half the size of the entire US ICBM force. The Chinese missile silo program constitutes the most extensive silo construction since the US and Soviet missile silo construction during the Cold War. Of course, these revelations have not been uh, new for the US and Australian governments. Highly classified reconnaissance satellite imageries will have become available before non-government analysts picked up the new developments. In April, Admiral Charles Richard of the US Strategic Command told a US congressional hearing that a breathtaking nuclear uh, expansion was underway and that China's nuclear uh, weapon stockpiles is expected to double, if not triple or quadruple, over the next decade. These are very significant strategic developments. However, the Australian government has had nothing to say. The Defence Minister, Mr Dutton, has been silent. So too has been the Foreign Minister, um, Senator Payne. This is somewhat surprising, given the Chinese government's continued hostility towards Australia and the fact that in May the editor-in-chief of the Chinese Communist Party-controlled news outlet, The Global Times, urged the Chinese military to develop plans for, and I quote, long-range strikes on military facilities and relevant key facilities on Australian soil. When I asked the minister representing the Minister for Defence about that, I got a very dismissive reply for, uh, with Senator Cash saying that, the nu that nuclear threats were nothing new. Some analysts have, have seen the Chinese silo expansion as an effort to upgrade a deterrent force that could survive a hypothetical US first strike in significant numbers to, U uh, to defeat US missile defences. This might be taken as a minimalist interpretation of China's, li China's likely plans. After all, the scale of the prospective ICBM deployments arguably constitutes an abandonment of Beijing's long-standing minimum deterrence posture. However, it may well be the beginning of a concerted movement towards achieving strategic nuclear parity with the US and Russia. President, uh, Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping has made no secret of his, his ambition to place China in a position to challenge and indeed displace the US as the paramount economic and, nuclear and military power. National prestige is probably at play here. China is getting richer and more powerful. Great powers have more missiles, so China wants to have more missiles too in order to underpin its status and ambitions. 
Some decades ago, Australian peace act activist uh, Helen Caldicott coined the phrase missile envy as a factor in the Cold War arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States. President Xi may be suffering a bit of missile envy. That said, the more important question to be asked is what is the strategic significance of the developments? Last month, President Xi uh, de uh, declared that any power that challenged or obstructed China will face, and I quote, broken heads and bloodshed in front of the Iron Great Wall of 1.4 billion Chinese people. In a recent uh, editorial, the Global Times further declared that China will deploy uh, a nuclear missile force, and I quote, strong enough to make the US, from the military to the government, fear. Equilibri equilibrium will be achieved when the US completely uses the courage to even think about using nuclear weapons against China and when the entire US society is fully aware that China is untouchable in terms of military power. The words equilibrium and untouchable are probably key. In some astute strategic commentary, Bates Gill, professor of strategic studies at Macquarie University, has observed that an expanded Chinese nuclear arsenal is probably intended to achieve a strategic equilibrium that will free up China's ability to assert itself through conventional military forces. He said, and I quote, the last thing China wants is a nuclear exchange. This, in China's mind, is a way of stopping others from using nuclear weapons against it. What it means is China feels more confident in engaging in a conventional war because they're not going to be deterred by the possibility of nuclear escalation, and increasingly they believe they can win. That is the real significance of what China, uh, what has been constructed in, in the uh, far west of, uh, of China, is that equilibrium. Last November, I warned about the growing threat to Taiwan, a democratic country of some 24 million people. President Xi has made re reunification with Taiwan an absolute national priority. China's new we uh, nuclear weapons will likely give President Xi increased confidence about making a military move against Taiwan. That is likely to be one of the biggest diplomatic and strategic challenges for the US, Japan and Australia in the next few years. And in concert with our allies, the Australian government needs to define our position and not stand silent on the sidelines, waiting to be overtaken by events. Thank you. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President. A little over two weeks ago, on the morning of July 16, my beautiful wife, Kristen Griff, passed away. Kristen was a special soul who lit up everywhere she went, and her vibrant and caring soul brought clarity, comfort and joy to all that she touched. She was the most beautiful, loving wife and best friend. My family and friends are all richer for having known her and absolutely devastated for having lost her. Cancer slowly took away her life over a four year period after she found a small lump in her right breast. She had thought that she would easily make it into her 90s just like her grandmother did. That hope was soon dashed after a biopsy showed her cancer's KI67 rate, the rate it progresses, was through the roof. Its aggressiveness resulted in her cancer almost tripling in size in just three weeks. In October 2017, surgeon Devendra Sagara operated on, on her at St Vincent's Private Hospital in Sydney. Chemotherapy drugs were administered in Adelaide the following month. But the chemo had to stop after just three sessions. It was impacting her lungs and causing significant scarring. Kristen was in a difficult place. Hemo only kills cancer cells that are dividing at the time. Dormant cells are not killed. But continuing chemo would further impair her general ability to survive. In early 2018, we met in Sydney with Devendra and oncologist Elgene Lim, who recommended specific oral drugs, and Kristen continued to have six monthly scans. We were feeling positive that her cancer had been beaten until a scan in late 2019 raised concerns. Further scans and blood tests in early 2020 show progression that required an urgent mastectomy and removal of more lymph nodes and surrounding tissue. Her KI67 rate was now over six times 
the normal rate. COVID restrictions meant I could not travel to Sydney to be with her for the operation. It was a horribly stressful time for both of us. We then decided to return to Adelaide for the operation, but surgery limitations meant we could only remove the lymph nodes and upper armpit segments. And COVID restrictions meant I couldn't even go to the hospital to be with her. All I could do was find a spot where I could park and look up at a window as we spoke via our mobiles. It was horrible, just horrible. Surgeon Jim Collius operated on her at St Andrews Hospital and Kristen subsequently undertook radiation therapy and oral drugs proposed by her Adelaide oncologist, Ken Pittman. 2020 was a blur of scans, blood tests and drug changes. There was also a close call with a sepsis infection where we didn't think that she was going to pull through. By November last year, the cancer had spread throughout her spine and pelvis, her lumbar, her thoracic system, and suspected incursion in other places. Oral drugs, letrozole, palbocyclin, and pain medication continued, including a period where CBD oil was an absolute lifesaver for her. And like many with aggressive cancers, we went on the lookout for drug trials and found one that was particularly promising. Trial doctor, Mina Okura, arranged for new scans and told Kristen to go off her current drugs, which she did, and she immediately felt the best that she had actually felt for years. She looked great, had vitality again, was smiling, even singing. It was truly beautiful to see, but it didn't last long. Scans showed degree disease progression. This meant she was no longer eligible for the trial. You must be stable or in remission to qualify for trials. Something that I was not aware of until that point. And how wrong and how gut-wrenching was that? This left us with a choice. Stay off everything with Kristen feeling great for the first time in years or go back on drugs that were clearly having no effect. Adelaide oncologist Ken Pittman suggested trying anastrozole instead of letrozole. Immediately after taking anastrozole, Kristen had incredible pain. Hot sweats was the worst she had ever been in her life, all after taking one tiny pill. Did the cancer rebel against this anti-cancer drug and massively fight back? I think it did. From then on, everything went downhill. Her pain medication had to go up and up. Further scans in April this year showed her bone system and liver lit up like a Christmas tree. A liver biopsy took place at Calvary Hospital, North Adelaide, <coughs> but incredibly that was screwed up. They missed getting a sample of what turned out to be a very cancerous liver. This was not the only frustrating part of that experience. Kristen experienced excruciating pain during and after the biopsy, but the nursing staff, those at the St. Helens Ward of Calvary Hospital, North Adelaide on the day, showed a total lack of interest. Kristen was screaming in pain, but the nurse just walked away. Buzzers were continually pressed. No one came. I raced out to the nurse's station and called for help. Not one of the nurses stationed there responded. They were busy chatting amongst themselves while my wife was in agony. The head nurse said our nurse was busy and would just have to wait until she came back. Totally gobsmacking. Someone could have been dying, but nobody would lift a finger because it wasn't part of their patch. What a disgusting culture, if that is the culture. We went back to that hospital on two other occasions, once for a blood transfusion where Kristen was forgotten about for the first hour, and the other for an overnight stay, and we vowed never again to visit that place. Our experience of the emergency department in the new Adelaide Calvary Hospital was, however, very different and excellent. But doctors tell me they just want the easy, profitable business. Cancer doctors do not have admitting rights. Since the botched biopsy, Kristen experienced frequent vomiting and major pain, both continuing for many weeks. She had further scans at Jones and Partners at Corrada Park. One required radioactive dye to be injected. The technician missed and injected the dye into her arm, which caused massive swelling more significant pain over many weeks and poor imaging, another distressing experience. We met with oncologist Ken Pittman to discuss these scans and from that point on, he effectively took us off his books and referred us to a palliative care provider. We were obviously at the end of this journey. 
The palliative care team told us Kristen had, as they say, short weeks to live. That knocked us terribly. Up until then, Kristen was still hoping for a miracle, but it was not to be. But when Kristen arrived at Laurel Palliative Care Hospice, our stress levels dropped by 90%. Warm, welcoming nursing staff, beautiful facilities, doctors and support staff who genuinely cared. We were finally at a place that responded to what the patient needed. Over the next two weeks, Kristen's health improved. She came home for almost three weeks with our DNS support which meant that she could be with me and our youngest daughter who had just returned from Victoria. On July 10, everything went downhill. An ambulance took Kristen back to Laurel Hospice. She was very well cared for for her remaining days and she died holding my hand around 8 a.m. 16 July. Her last 30 minutes of life was a very emotional experience, which I will talk about another time. Kristen was a beautiful soul who went through much unnecessary pain and distress during her four years of living with cancer. Her medical experiences in the main weren't great, which I will outline another time. But her palliative care experience at Laurel Hospice was truly beautiful. She asked me to read her final words at her funeral, and they sum up the type of person she is, and I quote, each of you has gifted my life with love and learning, and I am deeply grateful to you all for including me in your life. It was the greatest privilege to love and be loved. And to be given the gift of raising kids who are wonderful humans doing good things within their own lives. When you leave today, step out and lift your head. Inhale deeply. Love and a good life awaits you. Nourish yourself daily with nature's presence through all the seasons of renewal." End of quote. Beautiful Kristen, thank you for being a part of my life and that of others who are fortunate to have known you. You will remain in our hearts forever. Thank you, Senator Griff. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30am.